Ladies' Day. The colours are more vibrant, the hats are that bit bigger. We can see that Queen Camilla's there, got feathers accessorising her hat. She's gone again for the, I'd say, understated elegance. I think she's making a point there with the pale, with the muted colours that she has been choosing, which, uh, which you know, is stand out in its own way, isn't it? But it's very much a question of I'm here, I'm, t I'm part of it, but I'm not going to be wearing a big, bright, gold colour to gather all the attention. I was lucky enough to meet the Queen yesterday. Sir Francis Brooke called me over. He said we'd like to meet the Queen. I said yes. It was just before Circle of Fire ran. And understandably, she was more interested in speaking to her jockey <laughs> ahead of the race. But she was so involved in the racing and so excited to have a runner. As they come past us now, I'll just remove my hat as I'm meant to do. Big smile on the King's face. Who I'm sure, a smile from Sir Mark to Francesca. Is it? Is it? Listen to these cheers. I feel like the king and queen are allowed to wave, but I think if you're not a royal, you know, it's not allowed, or it's frowned on, I think. Should we see From who memory. we can get waves Yeah, should we see who? Is that, <laughs> who is that the challenge? They really are getting a good reception. And I think it'll mean, as we said yesterday, the world to them with Her Late Majesty's connection with this meeting. This is a new era, and the public have really, here at Ascot over the last two days, it was, it was a little bit subdued on day one, Charlotte. I think because there was that change and people were feeling the loss of the late Queen, weren't they? But I think the thing with King Charles and Queen Camilla is that people feel that greater accessibility for a lot of people. They've known him as Prince Charles for so many years. He's been so prominent at various events. People have been able to get close to him, meet and chat to him, and I think that area of accessibility is, is permeating through this today as well, that people feel that bit less formal about it. Yeah, and I think you make a good point because people know him as Prince Charles and we also know all the different roles he had uh, as the Prince of Wales and his many charitable endeavours uh, amongst other things. And now he's almost got two jobs, he's taken over the role of the monarch while still maintaining a lot of his commitments there and I think he's an exceptionally busy man and, and hugely committed to the role. So, Sir Francis Brooke is there, His Majesty's representative at Ascot, to greet the King and Queen, who will now meet the trustees, and we're ready to go. Royal Party here, and great to have you on board at home as well. With Ascot today, a sea of sunshine, colour and smiles, with the action about to get underway. race and just over 20 minutes away but today being ladies day is also when the colors become that little bit brighter and the hats that little bit bigger as high fashion and millinery masterpieces take center stage and flora mcdonald johnson went to look at some of the outstanding options here we are on St. James's Street at the iconic institution that is Lock & Co Hatters. It's the oldest millinery shop in London. It's where the creme de la creme across the globe go to get their hats for Ascot. So of course, this is my final destination on my shopping tour. <laughs> So here we have the wonderful Michaela, who is our women's wear stylist for all things fabulous hats. And we're gonna talk through and try on a couple of the styles. The first one I really want to point out, which caught my eye, is this gorgeous kind of pillbox shape with this beautiful bow. It's obviously covered in daisies. I mean, it's exquisite. How long, how hard is it to make something of this? Well, to make something of this take a long, long time because all the flower are hand stitch. Before stitching the, the, the flowers, the tool is raped on the pillbox and all the flower are stitched and of course we need to make the bow. The beautiful bows, so bows have been a big theme today. It's a long, long uh, work. Voters are always super popular at Ascot. In 2019, when I last came to Lock & Co, you couldn't get a boater for love nor money. It just adds a little je ne sais quoi. But equally, a boater is a really safe option, whether you're wearing a suit, a two-piece, or a dress. I think it's instant elegance. A 
If you want something that nobody else is going to be wearing, this is why you come to Lock & Co. It's for a beautiful creation like this, a complete one-off, completely made in-house. So the incredible shape, you get it because of the wireframe in this like pyramid kind of shape and then wrap around all the flowers before covering with a tool. This hat has vintage flower and we have only one. Well, thank you for taking the time to come shopping with me today. I hope you got tons of outfit inspiration and I'll see you at Ascot. Thank you very much, Flora. Yes, the hats on display here today are quite simply nothing else. Nowhere else you'd find anywhere else at any other race meeting around the world. But time now to join our ITV colleagues. OK, Jason, it's day three. It's Gold Cup Day, the signature race of the week. You're back with Tim, who's been brilliant all week. I'm back with Flannard. How high are we, Flannard? We've got to go a fair way yet. The Gold Cup itself, no Stradivarius this year. It's Coltrane, the horse to beat. Is it still a good Gold Cup, do you think? I think it's a tremendous Gold Cup. Coltrane is always underestimated. I have no idea why. He turns up, he runs his race, and it's that absolute pinnacle, isn't it? Two and a half miles around Ascot, the best thoroughbreds in the business. It, uh, it's set to be a cracker. And 7,000 feet, I reckon, about now, down there. Car part one, can you see it? Are the team ready for us? The picnic better be ready. We'll be arriving at that very, very quickly. See you shortly, people. Day three, Jase, you looking forward to it? Well, it doesn't get much better than the Gold Cup, Ed, that is for sure. Oh, I can't wait for the Gold Cup. There's lots more to look forward to on Thursday. Car Park 1 for us. We are firmly installed in our parade ring position and down at the start in his customary position is Luke. Thanks very much, Jessica. Yeah, the conditions down here. If you were having your family barbecue, you'll be thinking, this is absolutely pucker. Um, it's officially good to firm. Now, I was talking to Ashley Murphy earlier on. He's actually been on walk the whole course, whereas I'll admit I haven't. And he says on this straight course, it's definitely this afternoon going to be faster up the centre of the track. So yes, with the high numbers having the advantage, the low numbers not so. Today, the low numbers might be able to get in and come up that fastest part of the track. <laughs> I'm not actually sure that was actually anticipated by Luke there. He seemed to give a little jump. Uh, our first race of the day is the 2.30 Norfolk Stakes. The stalls are working perfectly. Five furlongs, Group 2 contest. And uh, as Luke said, there are lots of jockeys out, including Joel Rosario, uh, actually zigzagging up the straight course. Good to firm are going this afternoon. American Rascal Joel Rosario and Wesley Ward head them up then for this uh, five furlong dash. She is out, or he is out of Lady Aurelia, who won the 2016 Queen Mary. Number two is Bahia, Pat Dobbs for Richard Hannon, out Cab Racing. And number three is Devious, Gavin Ryan looking for his first Royal Ascot winner, Donica O'Brien, doing the training. Number four is Elite Status, the market leader, although been a bit weak today. Big impression of Sandown. Clifford Lee and Carl Burke, who's got a good record with his two year olds down the years at Royal Ascot. Five isn't a runner, I ran yesterday. So number six, His Majesty, could be a Royal winner, but in a slightly different guise, Ryan Moore for Aidan O'Brien. 
Number seven is Malk Ushin Orr, riding for Richard Fai, a smooth winner on debut. As was number eight, Mon the Schlieve for Tom Eaves and Kevin Ryan, of course, tasted success in the first race on day one. Number nine is Notcha Magica, drop back to five furlongs should suit Paddy Toomey, trains and Billy Lee is aboard. Number ten, another American raider, George Weaver, who won the first yesterday for Crimson Advocate, teaming up with Frankie Dottori and No Name X. Number eleven is Reveille, Molly Doyle, riding for Archie Watson. They've also combined successfully so far this week. And number 12 is Shayek, lost his debut in the stewards' room, flicks his tail, Kieran O'Neill, riding for Alice Haynes. Number 13, the most experienced is the fixer, having his fifth race course star, Mikel Barcelona, the French trader for Francis Henri Graffard. Uh, number 14 is Thunder Blue for Kevin Stott, Dominic French Davis, in the first of the two Ammo Racing Limited purple and white colours. 15, Toca Madeira, not completely hopeless, saw that horse at debut at Bath, ran well, went one better, big price, probably out of his class, but nice looking horse, Brian Meehan and Sean Levy, and 16, Valiant Force, the second of the Ammo Racing colours, running in the Irish colours, the stars on the cap. Adrian Murray for Ross Ryan, 14, uh, sorry, 15 runners to get us underway for this Norfolk Stakes, down the straight pipe. Oh, one of the special days in flat racing. Wonderful atmosphere here in the Royal Enclosure. You see the rails bookmakers here. And uh, what is favourite, as Richard alluded to, it's elite status. Laws, if you come here, slightly left to see elite status is two to one. Was 15 to eight and seven to four. So bookmakers pushing it out slightly, trying to encourage the punters to part with their cash. American Rascal is seven to two. No name Mets, seven to one. His Majesty is eight to one. Now, the next two are potentially interesting each way. Nosh Majika for a very shrewd trainer, Paddy Toomey, eight to one, and Devious, a son of Star Spangled Banner, trained by Donico O'Brien, eight and son, fourteen to one. That could be the fixer. <laughs> We've got some lovely boys to look out for the Norfolk Stakes, and we're actually going to start off with Aidan O'Brien's horse. This is number six, His Majesty, one of the absolute stands out in the parade ring. He's by no name never. He really is a nice size. You know, as a two-year-old, you want a horse that has got plenty of depth to him, but also very strong with it as well. I like him. Nice size, looks good in his coat, nice and relaxed as well. Just a little bit of a laboured walk for me. I just would like him to see him walk on a little bit. Pull back, and this is number three. This is... Devious, who I really like. Now look at the size of him, he's absolutely huge. And it's funny because Donica said he's the biggest two-year-old he's got. And did you know that when foals are born, they're actually born with their legs 80 to 90% full grown. So that when they're in the wild, they need to be up and walking within one to two hours and be able to run with a herd if danger was to come. So can you imagine the size of him when he was born as a foal? I bet he was absolutely huge. Let's see who's next, AD. Number two is Bahir, just got a little bit warm. He got a ring bit on as well, a, a clavis and nose band. He's quite long in the body, but nice and strong with it. 13 is next. This is the fixer. Really active walk, this horse. Can you see he's taking a little bit of a pull with his grooms? He's got that arch neck because he's actually wanted to walk faster than everyone else. So he just kind of pulls his head in a little bit. But he had to actually have overreach boots on as well while he was getting saddled up because um, that's just to protect his shoes and make sure they don't come off. 11 is next. This is Reveille. He's one of the smallest in the field. And then I really want to show AD number one. Can we pick up Lady Aurelia's son, um, American Rascal? He's actually got more white on him than what she did. He's obviously picked up that gene from his sire curling because he actually had white socks as well. And when foals are born, the only thing they're actually really born with that stays with them for life is their marking. So, i.e. their socks or a little bit of white on his face, which you can't see, but he actually has. And he's actually a little bit uh, lighter than his mum as well. Again, a mixture of his dad's chestnut colour and then her darker bay has then produced this lovely, shiny, bright bay. He's lovely, isn't he? He's not the biggest, but he's all there and looks very, very powerful. It's one of the most anticipated smash-ups in Royal Ascot history. The Americans' Wes Ward with American Rascal. They just say that horse is a champion. And Carl Burke with the elite horse who has the status of a champion. Wes, why is American Rascal so good? Uh, he's bred in the purple. You know, he's by uh, one of the best sires we have in America in Curlin. And don't have to say anything about his mother, Lady Aurelia. She's, she was great here, two-time Royal Ascot winner. And he's uh, out on debut, and he won by an open 10-length margin under wrap. So we're excited to be here. Do you come here thinking to yourself, if anyone beat you, they would have to be really special? You know, you're always thinking and trying and planning and preparing. I got here early right as the horse got off, um, but we've had no hiccups with him. Um, as 
Mr. Burke will tell you with these horses anything can happen at any day. They're like strawberries, they spoil overnight. But this guy this morning was walking around here and jumping around and feeling feeling great. And uh, we just I was just down at the stable, the blacksmith tightened the, the shoes up. We're ready to go. Wes, we love you. We love having you here, but I've got bad news for you. When yeah. Carl says yeah. he has a good I, I one. I heard you earlier. Yeah. When you. he has a good you. one, we he's never guy. he's never wrong. Yeah. And it, Carl, you in America, you know what we call him when the two year olds come out? The cat daddy. <laughs> the cat daddy. There you go. <laughs> There's another side. At least it's cat daddy <laughs> rather than the other one. But anyway, um, Carl, when you say you've got a good one, usually it is an elite status appears to be a monster. He's done everything right, you know, right from when we broke him in and there uh, before Christmas, and uh, he's just he's just got a lot of class about him. Very relaxed horse, big long stride. I mean, I saw Wesley's um, colt jumping around this morning, which um, concerned me a little bit. He looked very fresh and well. I'm sure he's going to be hard to catch, but um, if any horse can. I think elite status can. There they are. Have a look each other in the eye, lads. It's Rascal against Status on ITV. So the two-year-old colts, they do, they come in all shapes and sizes. We've seen the O'Brien horses, and they were very big and strong. And then we've seen Lady O'Reilly's son, American Rascal, who is strong but small. We're going to pick up elite status here. He's kind of between the two. He's not overly big, but quite like that. He's got a really nice, powerful behind, which I'm sure, AD, if you can just uh, zoom in a little bit and see how powerful he is. He's very well put together. I like it when they're not overly big, compact, and that means that they're physically quite developed for their age already. And elite status, we haven't seen him all that much, only raced twice, but both of those were winning efforts, including last time out at Sandown in the national stakes by a whopping five lengths. I feel like he was a little bit under pressure early, but once he hit top gear, he really ran away with it. Yeah, there, there was a collection of juveniles in the national stakes at Sandown that we all thought, right, we'll find out in the pecking order who's going to come out on top. And he, he was very dominant. And I've listened to the, the commentators who were at the track that day. They said they watched it in the flesh and there was just a, a corner shot of all of a sudden he, he was with the pack and then all of a sudden he was away from the field in a very short space of time. So um, He looks strong physically. Yeah. But have you watched back American Rascals with <laughs> yeah. America? Oh, yeah. It looked like a cartoon. I know. Is yeah. it? Well, it was four and a half furlongs at Keeneland. Uh, like Wesley said, he is bred in the purple, no, being by Curlin out of Lady Aurelia. We, we've slowed this down at home so you can see his legs move. <laughs> I mean, he absolutely <laughs> skipped away from the field, didn't he? You in his camp then? Because it's a proper match-up, this. This is brilliant. Well, he, weirdly, he doesn't look like he's doing much, does he? Well, how often do you see them come into the straight? I know it was only four and a half, as you mentioned, Francesca, but American races, they run at a really good tempo and horses grind their way into contention. But he, he, he sort of took aim at the leader the jockey blew on his neck <laughs> and he took off I thought it was super I really did very, really it's yeah. Brits against America what do you make of them down there Luke well it's going to be very easy Ed to tell you how this race is going to be run because American Rascal will definitely bounce out he was very keen coming to post his pony actually was a little bit too far in front of him and he's just getting a bit revved he's, he's, he's everything you want in a sprinter he's small he's compact he's got loads of power across his hind quarters it's just a case he's got a he's got a, a ring bit on him uh, and uh, blinkers but they're not sort of your traditional blinkers we'll wait to see when he comes round obviously they've got that flashy emblem on the front but they're they're, they're what called open blinkers and lots of different types of blinkers that come right the way around someone so you can hardly see out just see just straight in front of them but look at him come down here his jockey's been very relaxed telling him Joel Rosario just giving him a pat look at him look at him he is all speed so he'll make the running but will he last home that's the question Brian here on the betting ring elite status is favourite but he's easy enough to back from 15 to 8 bottle 2 to 1 some bookmakers even calling 9 to 4 but what's fascinating obviously there are 28 betting operators throughout the world betting into the world pool this week and obviously with the American interest American rascal is favourite on the world pool so uh, differences of opinion between people outside of England betting into the Royal Ascot elite status here favourite on track on the world pool it's American rascal good each way support laid on for no name Mets and also devious for Donnick O'Brien at 14 to 1. There's a lovely story in the race with Midland Park with Malk, uh, who part owned by Darren Gill, 
named the horse after his dad who died recently and he had a lucky 63 where he nearly won I mean fortunes five of them won and with the money he gave lots of it to a cancer charity which is a lovely touch and bought into Malk as a tribute really for his dad which is which is lovely so I hope there Malk runs well in memory of Malk interesting the money for the other American horse George Weaver on the board already in the Queen Mary no name Mets being back Jason yeah well you know we, we talk about the pedigrees I'll jump ship briefly before coming back to no name Mets on on Malk the dam is a she's a, a sister to Hearts of Fire who was a brilliant horse for the late great Pat Eddery so um, certainly a wonderful pedigree and no name Mets the sire won this in 2013 um, you know the Gulfstream win was pretty good no surprise to see the Weaver up on the uh, score sheet <laughs> earlier on but, in the meeting but this Weaver you sat on the fence when I asked you what camp are you in in this big yeah. clash oh no I'm with the rascal I'm with the Wesley Ward big time I, I was so taken with his with his run look there has to be others in here that are, are gonna gonna run huge races at prices yeah I mean we're pretty much setting it up as a two horse race aren't we between American rascal and elite status as a result plenty of others are big prices um, um, do you worry that Wesley Wall's run three runners so far that's finished 11th, uh, second last and 22nd? Of Not 20. really, no, because when he ran Lady Aurelia here, she absolutely lit up the place, didn't she? And he's coming back with that wonderful pedigree. It was funny when, when you look at him, Francesca, stocky is how you describe oh, it, wasn't it? Very like chunky, a little bullock, no, really, it? really strong through the body. But So um, if there was one to upset the apple cart at a bigger price? That horse there going forward, Mon the Sleeve, who uh, made all at York for Kevin Ryan, he looked really really good that day and he could be anything so look he's not even on the betting there but he's a he's a big each way shout in here for Kevin Ryan and there's a very well named one there his majesty by no name ever who's had won this race before and in the first year that we have a new king at the royal meeting it's a good name back to Luke just a, a little bit of news down here. Uh, Bobby McEwen, the, the resident vet here, just had a look at American Rascal and actually loosened his, his tongue tie. You might be able to see that the stool sound is just in front of it at the moment. There's tongue sticking out the side and he was just worried it was a bit tight so he's loosened it off. But the, the horse doesn't seem affected at all. He's a very, very laid back character, this lad. It's tricky with tongue ties, isn't it? Often you use a piece of stocking, don't you? And you can keep pulling and pulling and pulling. And occasionally, if you do get a bit tight, the tongue goes a little bit blue. So Dark loose, blue colour, yes. <laughs> loosening it off just helps the, uh, the blood flow to it. And the point is that it just keeps the tongue tied down to the bottom of their mouth so it doesn't obstruct the airway potentially in the running going to be fast and furious for our opener isn't it the Norfolk it's been billed as this wonderful clash between American rascal and the home the home charge if you like elite status oh, is he the bull looks in like we've just seen someone jump out the back of the stalls it looks like Pat Dobbs has jumped off Bahir who's having a second start today Richard Hannon trains Bahir and it sounds a bit like he might have reared up in the stalls and maybe got his leg over so hopefully the handlers will back him out. Pat Dobbs looked to be fine jumping out the back of the stalls. It's never a, a nice moment for a jockey, especially on these inexperienced two-year-olds. Uh, they will trot the horse up, check him over, but unlikely to start considering he has He'll be withdrawn, I'm sure he will. Yeah. No chances will be taken. This American rascal is in. Will he be a lovable rascal in the Norfolk? Let's find out. What a great star this is to day three, Richard. Yeah, it looks like they're going to go out Bahia, who got upset in the stalls. Bahia, not with the field for the Norfolk. Five furlongs, two-year-olds poised to explode out of the gates, which they do so. A little bit slow into stride was His Majesty. Away to the far side, Repay shows up there, also showing good speed. The ammo pair, Thunder Blue and Valiant Force, lead that group far side. Also in that group is American Rascal. Elite status in that far side group with Malcolm Devious. Down the centre, the fixer lead Shayek there with Mon the Toka Madero, and also in that a cluster towards the near side is Notcha Magica and at the back of them His Majesty so over on the far side Thunder Blue has the overall advantage with Reve in the nose band extreme left is American Rascal elite status in the yellow colours and the purple with the white cap of Valiant Force then Malk near side group Shamek is close to the four there Notcha Magica is trying to get a little bit closer and the fixer over on the far side it is still wide open in the lead Valiant Force has the advantage from elite status His Majesty is coming home very strongly on the near side group who still trail however as Valiant Force out in the centre leads elite status and Malk up towards the line Valiant Force has always been in the firing line and will make all to win the Norfolk Valiant
brilliant pause, beat Malk in second. Elite status, His Majesty was next across the line, then Thunder Blue, Devious and Rebea. The near side group never got warm. American Rascal was last over on the far side and we've had a massive price winner. 150 to 1. We had one a couple of years ago in one of the two-year-old races, 150 to 1, and we had another one. Valiant Force right at the middle. Ross Orion, his second winner of the week for Adrian Murray, hasn't actually won a race until today and has taken some massive scalps here. Malk's going to be another relatively big price horse in second. Elite status first of the big guns home. His Majesty fourth home on the near side. And you can see you've got six clear, really. Six of the first seven over on the far side. So you'd say that group was favoured, but right at the back of that group was American Rascal. The near side group never really getting involved, trading all back, way back to the stragglers like Notcha Magica. Well, Valiant Force, 150 to 1 winner. Well done if you managed to find that. I'm not sure how many have got through to the leg two of the ITV7, however. <laughs> Yes, one for the bookmakers, I think, this, Richard. If you think 150 to 1's big, the Betfair SP is 488. So congratulations if you found this horse. Valiant Force for Ammo Racing, Mrs. O'Callaghan, and the D. Aguetas, and Adrian Murray, the trainer. Rosser O'Brien, who won the hunt come yesterday, wins another race at Royal Ascot. And finally, finally, after hitting the bar so many times, Ammo Racing on the board. With a few fancy runners as well, obviously, um, King of Steel, arguably, when they were heading into this particular meeting, was going to be their banker. Um, but um, there was no, no doubt in it. He was made. He made the running elite status after being under pressure. He sort of switched out, got onto the leader's tail. Not good enough. The American challenger, the rascal on the far side, never really going with it. You know, he sort of travelled to the two pole and then quit. Yeah, maybe just he was super speedy. Just didn't quite get home here on the undulations of Ascot. But 150 to one. This horse had finished second on debut to His Majesty. He ended up finishing, I think, third or fourth on the near side here, and then fifth in a Group Three at the current last time out so he had a bit of experience under his belt but we tend to discount the ones that haven't been able to win in favor of the runners that have won so that's why he's gone off at a massive price and Malk in second for Midland Park I mean that is fabulous you mentioned the story didn't you what a wonderful wonderful story to run a huge race there and of course Fahi has won the race twice he finished second this time to that one Ross Orion is back with a big smile on his face. I said, that's caught us by surprise a little bit, Rosser. What about you? Well, to be fair to the lads, they were confident he'd run a big race. If, look, if you took away his last run in the curl when he was on his own, he's run a Stormer first time up in a Lister race. That's how much they thought of him, you know? So he's bred well. He's bred to be a sprinter by Malibu Moon. And you look at him, he's... he's something else to look at you know he's, he was nearly a standout in the paddock yeah. beside Carl's birth and um, he jumped well did everything right I was just in a rhythm and, and when I took the lead off Kevin you know inside the two I was just always in a rhythm and I probably could have won further if I had someone to come at me with, with a run but he's got the job done and it's um, you know like I wasn't you know to still be associated with Ammo is a big big part and to, uh, to get Kia his uh, first Royal Alaska winner, it's kind of a redemption from Persian Force last year, so we'll enjoy this. Well, you will enjoy it. I also suspect Jose yeah. will enjoy it. You seem to <laughs> to run out onto the race course. You must have known that this horse was going to run a big race today. Yeah, yeah, because I ride him every day. He's in great form. He's do everything I ask. So I'm so happy and they like that. Many congratulations. Well done. What a horse. Thank you. 150 to 1 winner in the first. ITV7, I wonder if anyone's left. I wonder if we can track anyone down who backed the winner. Malk in second. How proud Malk would be. That's lovely. It's 66 to 1. I wonder what the forecast will pay. <laughs> Elite status. One of the big guns did make the frame. No show from American Russell. No name Mets. Didn't feature either. Big upset in the first. I wonder what the dividend will be on the totes on the world pool. Because they've been beating the SPs, particularly yesterday. Because when it's not Ryan Moore, when it's not Frankie de Tori, when it's not Coolmore when it's not Holly Doyle. Generally the dividend is bigger, so we'll find out what that is in just a second. Brian, has anyone back this winner? I 
I'm here with James Batterson, who's just backed the winner of the first at 150 to 1. How did you back it? Oh, it was all about skill and knowledge, wasn't it? It was, it was entirely to the fact that Simon had the best odds on the, on the floor, and I came running over and gave him five quid just before they closed it. Uh, so, yeah, there you go. Five, five pounds at 150 to 1. This man is buying the champagne! And our floor manager here, Simon, had 75p each way on the winner. So there, someone has He's backed it. He's a big punter. <laughs> but he uh, likes to have a little bit on the big prices, and it has paid off. And the horse just come back into the winner's enclosure, a little bit fractious on his way back in with the, with the cheering owners. We, we always talk about their, their huge prices. Obviously, he ran in the Marble Hill behind Gibby the Beat Boys, who yeah. changed hands for 1.1 million earlier in the week at the sale. We've had him come out of that race at 150 to one, dropping back down in trip. Remarkable performance. The dividend, a disappointing match of the, the SP ah. on the Whirlpool. And Lee Clayton, who's great mate with Keir Jarabchin from his time really in football with selling Coutinho to Barcelona, etc. He went to, to run Talk Sport, now back at the Daily Mail, just gave it a thumbs up when I said, did you back it? And so he's yeah. another one who's found uh, the winner and will be in there with Keir, who over the last couple of years has walked past this podium on numerous occasions, rolling his eyes, going, oh, never for us at Royal Ascot. At Royal Ascot and other big races as well. Second in the St. Ledger, right? St. Ledger, second in the Derby second in the this Derby. year. Derby, oh my word, yeah, there have been a lot of times where it's been the, the, the nearly sort of performance. Yeah, that'll mean a huge lot because he's, he's pumped an awful lot of money into the, uh, into the game and um, various different trainers, chops and changes his horses, does it his own way. But, but often with owners, you don't want them to have too much big race success too early, do you? Because then they think it's too easy and get disappointed when they don't do it. So keeping him hungry and eventually the Royal Ascot winner has come. I'm so thrilled for Darren Gill, whose story we told before the race about how he bought the horse with his winnings from his, his big bet in memory of his dad. I mean, second in the Norfolk at Royal Ascot for Midland Park. And, and looked to hold every opportunity around about the furlong marker and then it was all a case about holding on for that place position as we had a few closes down the stands rail. Where are you, Matt? I'm in the thick of it with Keir Jarabchim and Adrian Murray. Bobby. Keir's just, well, he's had his photos taken. They're going to take as many as they can, though, because we know what this will mean to you, Keir. As Ed has just said, we've seen you enough times walking to here, rolling your eyes, going seconds, thirds. Now you're a Royal Ascot hero. Well, I don't know about hero, but the heroes are those guys. You know, they work their asses off, really. I'm sorry about that, but Robson, Guerra, Raphael, these guys, they wake up at four in the morning every day. They deserve it. They deserve it. And sport is something that is in your blood. But to see you effectively hyperventilating like this and crying with tears in your eyes just shows you how this sport touches you. You know, we've been trying for a long time. We keep getting beat, but uh, we keep fighting back. Knock down, get up. <laughs> so now we've done it. We've broken the duck. Let's move on from there. You know, I'm grateful to these guys. Honestly, everybody on the team, Tom, Robson, Adrian. I mean, look at him. What does that mean to him? We'll go and speak to Adrian Murray, your trainer, in a moment. This is a big day for Dad, isn't it? It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still in shock. Yeah. And, and we loved him from the morning, you know. We've loved him all the time. Unfortunately, he got on the wrong side um, when Colin rode him in the Curra. Colin fell on the wrong side. He was on his own. So, you know, thankfully, Colin, I think, took care of him. And we knew he could do it. Yeah. And, and you've got King of Steel and the King Edward tomorrow. That horse, this will mean a lot. If, if the Derby runner-up wins tomorrow, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be off the planet. I can't think of anything right now. I can barely speak, <laughs> let alone think of something. But he's obviously a great horse. And, you know, we live to fight now. Yeah. Well, we'll let you go up to the podium. Many apologies there for the uh, excitable language at the top there. You can see the emotion coming out of Keir Jarabchian. I asked him, because he's the man who signed Carlos Tevis. I said, Tevis or winning the Norfolk Stakes? He said, I can't even think about football right now. 
And that's what it means to a winning owner, at Asset, especially when it's been so long sought after. And Kid Rabshan could have an even better week. He's got King of Steel tomorrow, Persian Dreamer as well. I've got the Broly out in the parade ring here, but the sun absolutely beating down. It's been amazing weather all week, but I do feel a little bit for the men in their morning suits. It is rather warm. And uh, down there near the pre-parade ring, we find the social stable team. Brawley's up in the parade ring, hats off in the social stable. We're topping up our tans. And as we know, cricket's been in the news uh, this week. Uh, racing taking centre stage here, but we've combined the two because Craig Kiesretter joins me, former international cricketer and owner of Echoes in Rain, a leading hope in today's Gold Cup. How are the nerves, Craig? I think I was more nervous to do this. It's not very often one gets invited to the social stable with Ollie, so it's, um, it's going to be good fun. Uh, the fact we've got a runner in the Gold Cup is exciting. And uh, there's some quiet confidence from the yard, so hopefully she does uh, gives a good account of herself. That's good to know, the confidence from the stable. Tell us about the operation, because it, it's a credit to you and the operation that you've got a runner in this pinnacle race this week. Yeah, look, you know, we've, we, we've owned, the family's owned Barnan Stud in Ireland for, well, since 2017. Um, and what we really try to do is, is try to have a sort of boutique farm, but quality over quantity. Uh, we've got a fantastic team, um, Patrick and his wife Topsy, who run, who run the, the, the show there. We've got Craig Carey, who's running the show in South Africa. And, and obviously, we, we're very close to Peter Ross and, and Anna Doyle. So um, we've got a great team. It's, it's, it's going to be a good fun day today. Well, there's a, a few former cricketers here, because Owen Morgan's making the presentation to Keir and Connections of Valiant Force, a winner at 150 to 1. Do you play with Owen in your time? It's amazing you win a World Cup and you can give trophies. Surely you should be getting them instead of giving them. <laughs> Let's not talk about the World Cup. I left that match early. I think I was one of only two men in the country to have, to have done that. Um, do you miss the cricket or are now you firmly ensconced in the racing world? I think I'd much rather have a runner in the Gold Cup than Nick off in early days and <laughs> I have to sit yeah. and change them all day. So, um, no, there's parts you miss. Uh, the camaraderie, the fun, the travel. It, it, it can get a bit tiring, but um, the, the, the good days in racing are, are certainly worth... But plenty more bad days, yeah. really. Uh, are you able to give it a kick this week? I know your brother's in, in good spirits. <laughs> I'm on best behaviour. I'm working this your week. Your brother's not. <laughs> Is he ever? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, no, we're having fun. You know, we've, uh, we've got the whole family up here, a lot of friends. No doubt I'll be seeing you later as well for, <laughs> for a catch-up. But... Um, We'll probably be tearing the, this whole stadium down if this filly does well for yeah. us. Yeah, well, listen, we're, we're, we're rooting for you with Echoes in Rain, a big player in today's Gold Cup coming up live with us at 4.20. And let us know first if you backed the winner of the first at 150 to 1. Show us your, your bet slips. I hope you did out there. Congratulations if you found Valiant Force. Um, we have had one tweet in from a key member of the ITV racing team, the ITV Sport family, Vicky Andrews, who's recently given birth to her adorable son, Mason. And she's tweeted us, Mason couldn't wait any longer and wanted to make sure he was here to watch his ITV racing family for Royal Ascot. Vicky is a huge part of the ITV Sport family. We are thrilled that she has welcomed her first son into the world. Watching on, well deserved. Watch it with your feet up, Vicky. We're all thinking of you and we're delighted for you. So thank you for sending that tweet into the social stable. If you're watching at home and you want to get involved, use the hashtag ITV Racing. From myself and Craig Keysretter, hopefully a Gold Cup winning owner later. Uh, bye for now. Oh, that's so good to see Vicky and little Mason. We miss you, Vicky, and hope you're doing really well. Still got the brolly up. I should probably put it down. It's not raining for once. Um, what now? Let's, let's go to Ruby because he's in the analysis hub. I wonder if he found the 150 to 1 winner. Most definitely not. And I even less ro left Ross Ryan off the graphic we did before asking because he would definitely be someone to be following. But look, he did mention in his, in his interview how well his horse jumped from the stalls. He's in stall five, Valiant Force. To keep an eye on him and look how high off the ground he gets. Now, right beside him was your favourite, Elite Status. He gets no elevation to jump from the stalls. But the American American horse in stall one, American Rascal, keep watching him. He's up in the air as the stalls open. His next movement should be to put them down, but he doesn't. He half puts them down and goes back up, and he loses momentum as well. So, Valiant Force, we always say you can't win a race at the start, but you can lose it. And when you jump as well as Valiant Force did, you have a huge advantage. You see from this angle how far he gets in front of both horses in the yellow colours over there on the right. And whilst American Rascal fades, Valiant Force holds that advantage over elite status all the way down on the Ascot Strait. So the Norfolk got us up and running on day three of the Royal Meeting and plenty of ammo to come this afternoon with the King George V to come next, then it's the Ribblesdale, then the big one, the Gold Cup, live with us at 4.20.
to Ascot, there'd always be a sense of, uh, of tension leading up to the big meeting. Um, and I remember clearly the Royal Ascot winners he had watching the, the TV coverage from school. Um, and some very happy memories and some big disappointments. You know, it's, it's an intense meeting where the competition's very high. Uh, everybody trying to get success at Royal Ascot. It's, it's the prime objective of, of flat trainers across Europe. Well, I think the Gold Cup is, you know, to me, is still one of the one of the races you really want to win. You want it on your CV. Uh, race with huge history, and there's been a lot of Gold Cup winners trained out of this yard, but not for not for a long time. And my, my uncle William Huntington trained three Gold Cup winners, and I hear about it every morning when he comes for a coffee. You know, sort of general gloating. Um, so Coltrane's the best chance. We've been had placed horses in the Gold Cup before, but. Uh, Coltrane looks to have a great chance this year. And Coltrane, such an improved stayer last season, is getting better all the time and wins the Cigarro. Coltrane has been a star for this stable and he's progressed year on year. He's owned by fantastic people in the Mariscottis and he approaches this year's Asker Gold Cup as one of the favourites and he's won his trial on Asker Trials Day in impressive fashion. So he's a horse I'm really looking forward to. I watch the Asker Gold Cup every year as a child and it's a race I always uh, look forward to. I remember Yates dominating the race and in recent years Stradivarius. If I could win the Asker Gold Cup it really would be a dream come true. It's one of the pinnacles of staying races and it's very important. Royal Ascot week is the most important week in a jockey's calendar. I was fortunate enough to be leading rider at Royal Ascot in 2021 and I'm really building towards it this year, hoping to find good horses to ride and try and get on the score sheet. Obviously as much as I can, but certainly as early as I can. If you can ride a winner on the Tuesday or Wednesday, it takes the pressure off and you can breed for the next few days. Well, it's an absolutely intriguing feature race. One of the most open gold cups in recent years. We've got the winner from two years ago, Subjectivist. Coltrane, who won at this meeting 12 months ago, as well as Eldar Eldorov, another winner at this meeting last year, who went on to classic glory, took the oldest classic in the UK, the St. Ledger, back in September. He'll be representing Bahrain owners, KHK Racing, and uh, David Egan riding for Roger Varian. Two runners in there for Aidan O'Brien, who's got such a successful record in this this race and at the moment he is leading the trainers award or the top trainers uh, standings at the moment then after two days and one race at Royal Ascot he's had two winners both those on the first day John and Thady Gosden then lying in second uh, thanks to a fewer seconds Rafe Beckett then Archie Watson Willie Mullins had a victory on the opening day and Adrian Murray also in there with one win apiece. But that could very much change after day three. Six races remain. It is Gold Cup Day, colloquially known as Ladies Day here at the Royal Meeting, and we are in for a scorcher. Well, Frankie de Tori then riding Courage Mon Ami in today's big race. He was in the winner's enclosure yesterday on what will be his final Royal Ascot. And I wonder how he's feeling ahead of his final day, which will be Saturday. Walking in now, it will be tough. The last day be sad. I think he's going to hit me the last day. My family's going to be there. Uh, I will know it's the end. For sure, I will cry. I'm not even going to pretend that I'm not going to. My heart doesn't want to stop, but my brain tells me I'm 52 and if I like to finish on the top, I think this is the right time. I've loved it, every second of it. It's very hard to let go when you've been doing this for 30 odd years. I have to pre prepare myself for it. who was on the podium, I think, as well. Well done to them. The owners of Valiant Force and Rosser O'Ryan, a second winner at the meeting. And look, a big racing fan presented the trophies, including to the winning groom there. And Rishi's caught up with him. 
Delighted to catch up with former England captain Owen Morgan, obviously here in an official role making a presentation. Uh, how much are you enjoying your day, Owen? Looking resplendent, I have to say. Oh, thanks. It's It's been quite a stressful week, to be honest, watch, <laughs> sitting back and watching the ashes, but it's, it's nice to get a bit of downtime. I love coming to Royal Ascot. I've done for a number of years now. Um, had a runner, lucky enough to have a runner alongside Stuart Broad and, and Jimmy Anderson back in 2017, so had a day out then. But today's been magnificent. The weather is great. And you know to have a 150 to one winner in the first is, is amazing. Really, yeah. the smiles on their faces it really does ra make racing so special. Do you have any interest in on horses yourself at the moment, as in owning one or two? Yeah, here I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the Albatross Club, and, and you know, famous words pre World Cup 2019 was Morgs, if you you win it, we'll buy a horse, name it after you, um, and they stuck to their word. He's gone okay. We ran it ran Cheltenham this year. He won yeah. pre Christmas at Cheltenham, but um, it's just magnificent magnificent fun he's, he's at Nicky Henderson stable so it's, it's great I'm looking forward to when he goes over fences Captain Morgs I think he might be interesting fingers crossed now obviously Owen at this particular juncture of the year we're talking about cricket as well as racing and we just had the test match at Edgbaston and it produced wonderful cricket England came out on the wrong end but how proud of you about the way they played and their ph philosophy now under McCullum and Stokes yeah unbelievably proud you know pre McCullum and Stokes England's record for 17 test matches was won in 17 so it was sort of difficult to watch at times and when you, you you look at the side they are now they've won 11 in 14 now given they've played an extra test match not only the style the brand the attractive nature in which they play but just the results are in their favour as well so they're playing completely uninhibited cricket that everybody relates to you know every boy and girl up and down the country wants to play the way Ben Stokes and Joe Root now play so to be fair, your name has been mentioned in that as well. When they talk about style of play, the fact that the way England played when you captained the, the white ball team has also been mentioned. Uh, here, I like sitting back and watching. <laughs> um, I just, I do love the game and, and to see just a breath of fresh air in that England test changing room is is incredible. You know, the, 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 the prime example is probably somebody like Joe Root who scored over 11,000 test match runs. He averages 50 in his whole career, but in the last 12 months, has averaged 60 playing in the fashion that he has taking on the level of risk and ultimately putting a team goal before his own personal goal is remarkable so it's it's amazing one down in the ashes at home what will be the final result final result for me is dependent on the next game I think we need to win a Lords a record of Lords isn't great although under McCullum and Stokes they did win that famous chase against New Zealand last year so all eyes are on Lords this week fingers crossed for them thank you so much for your time Time. Good luck with the runner the next time you're here. And watch out for Captain Morgs, eh? Thanks, Rishi. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Sure some of the other cricketers are watching. Johnny Bairstow loves his racing, having played so well at Edgbaston. That man will be looking for a ninth gold cup at 4.20 this afternoon. His final ride in the race. Lots to come between now and then. We've already seen one race in the Norfolk. Remember the controversy of last year? No controversy this time, but a huge price winner at 150 to 1. You can probably see Jason Weaver in conversation over the hedge with Pete Barrell there. Right, Pete? Yeah. You're on telly. You're in my way. Get back there. Right, next up, it's a competitive handicap. <laughs> You can only just see over the hedge, look. Uh, the King George V is a competitive handicap. It's four to one the field. <laughs> After that, it's the Phillies in the Ribblesdale. Alice Sifa, one of the most exciting horses of the entire week, potentially. She's four to five, as you can see there. Big one, one of the big ones of the week, as always. The signature race of the week, the Gold Cup here at Royal Ascot. Seven to two the field it is wide open this year. Up to Richard. So next up, three-year-old handicap. Lots of progressive horses here over a mile and a half. The King George V stakes. Number one is Bertinelli for Ryan Moore. Two, an absentee. Three is Tagabawa, William Buick. And four is Struth for Joe Fanning. Five, Desert Hero, Tom Marquand in the royal colours. Six, Perfuse, Richard Kingscott. And seven, Wonder Legend. First colours of the owner, Daniel Muscat, so white cap. Eight, this is the colour change. David Deo is now in the Al Shakab colours. Silver with the gold braid. Nine is Krakovia, Andrea Adzini. And ten, Burglar, uh, Frank 
Nikki Dottori, Red Cap, again the owner, doubly represented, Anthony Oppenheimer. 11 is Valiant King for Kata Racing in the Claret Colours. 12 is Mr. Mistopheles for Sean Levy. 13, Duke of Oxford, Dylan Brown McMonagall. 14 is Lieber Power for Harry Davis, claiming three, and Andrew Balding. 15, Land Legend, the yellow cap for Land Legend. Holly Doyle is aboard, and a white cap on 16, Inquiring Minds. Benoit de la Sayette is in the saddle. 17, Sisyphus Strength, nose banded. Again, the owner has two. David Egan rides. 18, Cloudbreaker, Chick Beast first time. Kieran Schumacher for Charlie Fellows. 19, Double March. Uh, the armlets, the 18 and, uh, sorry, 17 and 19. Same ownership. Their colours not distinguished by a cap, but by armlets and stripes on the sleeves. David Probert. And 20 is the grey graceful storm for Jason Watson. 19 runners in the Absas number two gallerist. Colour change on number eight, Davideo. Now in the Al Shakab colours of silver with the claret cap. It's a vibrant betting ring, great atmosphere here on Gold Cup. Did a big one is at 20 past four, cold train, just about tops the market at seven to two. Elder Elderov is four to one. More about that on and on because the next race is upcoming. Perfuse is four to one to win. The King George was as big as eight to one this morning. The loop of the Vega, number six, Tagabawa, 13 to two. Bertinelli for Aidan O'Brien is seven to one. Davideo is seven to one. Valiant King for Joseph O'Brien. He was hitting the crossbar yesterday. Can he hit the back of the net with Valiant King? And lots of shrewdies think so. 15 to 2, Wonder Legend, 17 to 2. And I love the name of this horse, Laws. Number 16, Inquiring Minds. But that's a lovely name for a race horse. So, mile and a half we've got to contend with here. And we've got a pretty big field again. And Charlie Fellows, who trains this one, Cloudbreaker, said he's pretty worried about being drawn right on the wide outside. However, middle to high draws historically have been uh, a good place to be. So, potentially, that's not a bad thing. She's one of uh, five fillies in the field here, Cloudbreaker. She was fourth in a listed race. She's due to go up four pounds. It's her first time at the trip. And those cheek pieces she's got, just the she, uh, pieces on the either side of her bridle. That's just to help her concentrate. First time she's got them on today. 15, Land Legend. This is one of two in the race for trainer James Ferguson. Uh, Dover Legend, he trained to finish second in it last year. Good looking Land Legend. Was gelded a couple of starts ago and that's brought about some improvement. He was second last time out to Chesapeake, who was second in the Queen's Bars yesterday. So that form reads well. Number seven's just getting a little bit warm, but I'm not surprised because it is super hot here. It is Wonder Legend. It's the stable mate, uh, also trained by James Ferguson. He's quite long. He's quite, um, <coughs> he's, he's actually got a really good loose walk, but he's not particularly tall, this one. Uh, in the same ownership of the as the horse that came second last year, uh, Bonho. He won a Donkster handicap by five legs impressively. And they haven't run him since because they protected his mark because this was very much the plan to come here. Taller type in behind, this is 12. It's Mr. Mistopheles. I think Jason quite fancies this one at a price at each way. He ran in the London Gold Cup like a lot of these here today. He was seventh that day. It's quite a big, imposing horse. He'll want a, a good, strong gallop, I imagine, coming from the Huey Morrison yard. Bit of a gap here. We could just try and sneak back and find a couple more because it's a big field and tricky to line up the different form lines. I think this is number six. It is Perfuse who goes in the Jabbonk colours. Uh, it's first time for him in a handicap. He's won two novices, one on heavy ground, one on good to firm. So nice and versatile in that regard. He's getting a bit warm, as you can see behind the uh, behind the saddle, uh, but he's holding it together pretty well. Good looking, bright chestnut gelding. Uh, sorry, Colt. Well, Rafe Beckett's got one of the leading contenders here in Davideo, stepping up in trip, Rafe. Is, is that something you think will eke out plenty more improvement? He's bred for it, Matt. You know, I was surprised he had the speed to win over a mile and a quarter. So it was a surprise when he won at Newmarket. I felt that uh, he needed it. And uh, so, I, 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 you know, we thought about the Queen's Vars for him. So this is... This is uh, this is well within his reach, in our opinion. That's interesting, because one might think in a better race, you, you won't try and make all, but if you think he'll stay up to a mile six plus, then he'll be pretty handy again, I guess. Yeah, he will be. Yeah. He'll go forward from that wide draw. Also, you clearly like him. Yeah, very much so. Good luck. Thanks, Matt. He's a smashing looking horse. Anyway, 
listen to Rafe, he sounds pretty hopeful. Um, he's a little bit warm, but everything so it's so hot out here. There's absolutely no wind whatsoever. It's a few different shapes and sizes. 13 just going past there. That's Duke of Oxford, who's won two of his three starts. He, um, he's got a breast girth on. He's a, he's a tall horse. This lad's a big horse. He was winning on the way down. Number six, uh, Perfuse. He's going to be one of the, the market leaders, one of the last couple. Typical Sir Michael Stout horse, looking no nose band. He's got a ring bit on him. He very rarely puts a nose band on them, which to me always points that they're, that they're straightforward. But he's a big, strong lad. I love the look of him, Perfuse. And Luke, Sir Michael has the wonderful record in the King George. He's won the race four times and Perfuse, as you were speaking, did touch five to one along the rails. But as I speak, it's clipped back into four and a half to one again. So call it nine to two Perfuse from eight to one this morning. Six to one Bertinelli, Tagabawa 13 to two. And there is significant each way support for number 11, Valiant King, was 10 to one. Now along the rails, the best I see is seven to one. You won't be surprised to hear Trushan is a non-runner in the Gold Cup later this afternoon. The ground obviously gone against him. 15 races in, punters on the floor, Jason. 13 different winning trainers. Where are you looking here? Could be a new, uh, another winning trainer here or two. Um, Wonder Legend, I think, is a fascinating runner. The, the Doncaster form looks really good. He steps up in trip. There are lots of positives. Well, funny enough, you say that could be a new winning trainer. I think it could be James Ferguson, but I'm not convinced it's Wonder Legend, despite the fact that he carries the first colours, because looking them in the paddock, I actually preferred land legend who's in the second colour. It's just a nicer type of horse for me. And you think Mr. Mistopheles might be magical? I do. I, I, I really was taken with his run in the London Gold Cup. He was flat to the boards from a long way down and for all the world he's going to appreciate stepping up in trip. For the team, for Huey Morrison to run him in the Craven on his first run back, he must have been working the house down at home. You now have him arriving here at the Royal Meeting. We have no idea how good he is Got a jockey on board who was jocked off, Isaac Shelby. He now gets an opportunity to get that first win on the board. He'd be hungry as anything, Sean Levy. And the London Gold Cup form advertised here. It was a bit of a funny race, wasn't it? Because Bertinelli ran over a lot of them towards the end to win, but there was a bunch finish. Oh, yeah, they were all on top of each other. I mean, he, he hit the form represented a little bit later on the card as well. Bertinelli, for all the world, is going to appreciate the mile and a half. This is always such a hard puzzle. Richard. So some aggressive three-year-olds, mile and a half, just less than one complete circuit. Let's see any movement. Flag is raised and they're off. So a mile and a half and slow out was Land Legend who's given them a start by about a length or so as they run downhill towards Swindley Bottom. Out in the league, Krakowia's jumped well in company with a profuse who's also racing front ranks. Struth is another in the front wave and Sisyphus strength and it's Helter Skelter early on. Some of these being taken off their legs. Krakowia can't lie up having wanted to be handy. So as they settle down, it's Sisyphus strength. The colour change, David Deo, who races on the outside. Struth is in the yellow and blue. Mr. Mistopheles is going on with it. And then Wonder Legend in fifth as they already string out. Racing in sixth is Profuse on the inside of Tagabawa. Burglar is next in the red cap on the outside of Krakowia who jumped off prominently and is now back in midfield. Just worse than midfield towards the inside is Double March in the red and white colours on the inside of Valiant King. Then Inquiring Minds white cap on the outside of the grey graceful storm. Bertinelli is towards the back of the pack early on. Desert Hero is another who is towards the tail with also Duke of Oxford as they make the steady climb uphill. Land Legend is yet to recover from that slow start and is last of all. So Davideo has crossed to become another new leader. It was an 11.5 second furlong at one stage in this contest. They have been burning along. In second place, Mr. Mistopheles now taking the trail. Sisyphus strength in third with Wonder Legend in fourth. Struth in the yellow sleeves. Perfuse comes next from Tagabawa who races on the outside of Krakowia. Burglar is next with Double March. Valiant King is on the outside of the grey which is Graceful Storm. Uh, Bertinelli is still quite well back in the field towards the outside of Desert Hero. Towards the rear is Lieber Power. Cloud Breaker is in that rear division as well with Land Legend and also towards the back is Duke of Oxford. A few of these at the front are off the bridle a long way from home. It includes David Deo as Mr. Mistopheles sweeps up on the outside. Behind these Wonder Legend Struth was short of run behind Sisyphus Strength as Profuse begins to improve. Tagabawa travels up. Burglar's going okay. Bertinelli is now given the hurry up as a lot of these will fan out off the home bend. Cloudbreaker comes next with Desert Hero inquiring minds looking for a way out. Another new leader. Wonder Legend strikes and goes to home. Perfuse
Medusa Tagabawa are the next two. Behind these is a Burglar. Right down the outside, Cloudbreaker with Bertinelli. No way through for Desert Hero. Valiant King is staying on as well. Perfuse is yet another new leader from Tagabawa. Bertinelli down the outside with Cloudbreaker. Valiant King towards the inside and Wonder Legend. The race still is in the balance. Cloudbreaker, Bertinelli and the Royal Runner Desert Hero with a chance as well. And Valiant King heads thrusting for the line at Ascot. And it's the Royal Runner on the outside. Valiant King with Desert Hero. Desert Hero has won for His Majesty the King. Beaten in the second, Valiant King. A Royal 1-2. Bertinelli back in third. Then Cloudbreaker in fourth place. And behind those in fifth was Perfuse. The race that kept changing hands. We had so many new leaders, and when the music stopped, Desert Hero has won for His Majesty 18 to 1. Tom Marquand in the saddle, touching off the king, Valiant King, for Rasheen Murphy and Joseph O'Brien on the inside. You can see the heads going for the line. Just on the line, it is Desert Hero, the Royal Runner, Valiant King on the inside. Bertinelli had every chance in third. Cloudbreakers run home fourth. The majority of these came from a long, long way back. They went very hard, too hard. But all smiles as His Majesty wins the King George the V stakes. It goes to the Royal Runner. It's off to the King for the first time at Royal Ascot. Here's conf confirmation. Confirmed. Desert Hero wings for His Majesty the King and the Queen. And look at the excitement in the Royal Box. John Warren with his back to us. You remember those iconic pictures of him watching Estimate win with the late Her Majesty the Queen? This meeting, we said, lacked one thing. It had the Frankie winner, it had the foreign winner. It just needed a first royal winner for the king. And William Haggis, Tom Marquand, and Desert Hero have delivered, Jason. From way, way back. They went so quick in the early stages, Francesco. It was turned into a real battle, wasn't it? And Tom Marquand, well, they call him Aussie Tom down under. They call him Tokyo Tom whenever he's <laughs> over in Japan for the winter. And he has produced. He's that good. Everyone wants to claim him. Yes, he's there in the royal colours and about sixth at the moment on the chestnut horse. He's trying to weave his way through. You'll see Land Force on the rail get checked badly there for a run. But it was a bunch finished despite the strong pace. And he was just able to sneak him through. And he engaged in a late battle with Valiant King and was able to get his nose on the line where it mattered. They did go like the clappers. It was a sub-11 uh, second fraction there early. So... It was a good ride. This is dreamy for the Ascot Authority here. The one horse this week that's been paraded in front of the stands. The king was waving. And the queen clapping their winner. Look at that. And Tom Marquand has just paraded in front of the grandstand here at Royal Ascot. And in front of the king. Tom, what was that like for you? Uh, um... A bit, genuinely, probably one of the proudest moments of being in the saddle so far. Like this is, um, you know, obviously not not to the same level that Estimo was on, but uh, being the Gold Cup, honestly, this is, you know, I grew up watching uh, horses like that go and win for the late Her Majesty the Queen and and, and, and to ride. Uh, to ride His Majesty, <laughs> to ride His Majesty the King's first Royal Ascot was unbelievable. Tom, I do not think, in all the time that you've been riding, that I've ever seen you quite as emotional as this. No, and look, racing has an amazing way of um, things come when they're meant to. And look, yesterday was a tough day. Uh, in racing terms, anyway, look, there's a lot of risk in the world, but um, the Royal Ascot is the pinnacle, and, and riding a Royal winner at the Royal Mean is so, so special. Tell me about the run to the line. Were you always confident you were going to get there? No, uh, not at all. Uh, I tried to spin out of the bottom of the straight onto the back of ones that I thought oh would take God. me there. They didn't. I had to go in and thread the eye of a needle. But um, look, this fellow was supremely game. And uh, look, as the Haggis team shows time and time again, they just get it right. Uh, can I just ask, what's it like to be part of the team to have a royal winner for the king 
at his meeting? Oh, it's everyone's dream to have a win at Royal Ascot, especially for the Majesty, the King and Queen. It's unbelievable, especially to lead up my first winner here. It's, like Tom said, it's quite an emotional day. It's happy to see the team get what they deserve. Well, enjoy it. A day that you, you and we won't forget. A very special moment coming for that young man, Jack Abbey, leading in the King's first winner at Royal Ascot. His mother, the late Her Majesty the Queen, had 24. This is a moment of history as Desert Hero comes in, the winner of the King George V States. And such a proud moment for the Haggises, Maureen and William, who were in the royal procession yesterday. They'll have had lunch at Windsor Castle with the King and Queen, then in the royal procession. And now they are responsible for the first winner for the King and Queen at this meeting. Desert Hero, who went off favourite for the London Gold Cup, was too keen that day, has gone off at 18 to 1 today. Bigger on the tote this time. Valiant King again so close, like yesterday for Sheen Murphy, Sheikh Farhad and Qatar racing. Third was Bertinelli at 6-1. to one. It was a real pace collapse in the race. Cloudbreaker ran a big race in fourth. The favourite in fifth. But everyone's come down from the stands. Look at that, to catch a glimpse of the first winner at Royal Ascot for the King. And we've talked about the connection and the importance of it for the King and Queen with this meeting. Zara's absolutely thrilled. She came over here and said, that is magic. The Princess Royal is there as well. Thank you so much. And I wonder where the King and Queen are. They've got prize to collect as well but we talked about the connection Francesca how important it was yesterday to have those cheers how important for this meeting here they are here they are they're coming into the winners enclosure now with John Warren and now how important they've had this winner yes I think it's one thing to be present to see his late mother the Queen have winners at the royal meeting but it's a bit different when they're your own colours and it's lovely that they're doing it together the King and uh, the Queen Camilla it's very much a joint venture with the racing and here having a good chat to Tom Mark and Smiles all around I imagine the replay will happen quite a few times to see exactly where he came from just getting there on the line super exciting exciting winner as well. And I love the moment when he's waving at the winner as Tom on the left there, parade in front of the stands. John Warren to his left, he'll be thrilled. No one will be happier right now than Sir Francis Brooke, the chairman here, His Majesty's representative. I mean, this is what the meeting wanted more than anything else. Yes, Frankie's important, but the King's first Royal Ascot to have a winner will mean so much. I love the hand gesture there from the King to Tom, you know, that nip and tuck, as if, you know, it was, it was a heads up, heads down moment. For, for one or two strides, but a beautiful piece of jockeyship, and that, that really has capped a, a, a wonderful day already before we get to the Gold Cup. And I was just going to say, I hope Maureen's here, and I'm sure that's her with her back to us. I'm thrilled about that, because she's such a big part of the operation, as we were saying yesterday. William got a handshake from the King, and Maureen now getting congratulations from them as well. It really is a team, as you were describing yesterday, Francesca. When you send a horse to the Haggises, you get two trainers for the price of one. Just watch I think the Queen wants to go and say well done to Desert Hero and maybe the photograph as well. Yeah, she does like on race day to go up to the pre-parade ring and go and see the horses. She's very much the, the hands-on one, um, having ridden lots herself. And I think here she's going to give a well done pat. And, and this, I reckon, will be on the front page of your newspapers tomorrow. William Haggis on the left, Tom Marquand, Desert Hero, young Jack Abbey. What a moment for him in the red tie there. The King and the Queen and Bruff Scott is off his sickbed to come and witness this. How special a moment are we witnessing here for people at home, Bruff? Oh, this, is, this is historic. Uh, Frankie de Tory is fine, but he's going to have lots of swan songs. This is the first winner for the King. And what is fantastic about it is that ever the excitement of racing was inherent in a race. It was in that race, the way that horse won. And the King's, when he came in here, you could see it in his face. You can see it in Tom Marquand's face because, you know, to come through a race and nail it on the line, that's, you know that, Jason, that's the deal. And to watch your horse, a horse of the family of bread, do that here at Royal Ascot, that is everything that we hoped for at the beginning of this week. And it's happened. And it's, it's um, you know, Frankie was a wonderful, wonderful day, but this is light years ahead of it.
there's Sir Francis Brooke. I said he'd be the happiest man in the race course right now. His Majesty's representative. This is a dream come no, true. No, the happiest man is there in the middle. <laughs> That's the happiest man. I really believe that. And you can I, see it how couldn't have happened in a better manner. Absolutely fantastic. Man. Yeah, I'm in the throng down here. William Haggis, the royal trainer, is about to go up for the presentation. Zara Tyndall's just here next to me, and the Princess Royal as well, just about to enjoy this, this presentation. Zara, <laughs> a quick word, just how special for the royal family is this? I think, do you know what? It's kind of, oh, sorry. <laughs> Bittersweet, isn't it? It's, um, I think how proud and excited our grandmother would have been, the Queen would have been, but you know, to have a winner for Charles and Camilla and, you know, keep that dream alive um, was incredible. And what a race. I mean, uh, besides all of that, what a race. Um, you know, and I was stood with Sheikh Farhad and we're kind of, the horses were, you know, either side, like bullying their way up to, up to the line. And it was incredible. We will never forget those pictures of Her Majesty the Queen when she won the Gold Cup with Estima. And now we have the King with those same emotion when he's winning a race here. I think the Royal family understand how important it is for our sport and also it's great to see the king seemingly loving it yeah i think it's it's you know like a, a new excitement isn't it it's a, it's like like all those owners who come here and have a horse here you know having that dream that hope um, and actually fulfilling it is incredible and the horses you know are the, are the main are the main main game here the, like that's why we get involved and we love them and the competition and you know that adrenaline when you win is, is indescribable yeah we've loved seeing the warmth of the king grow every day here at Royal Ascot it will grow even more after today thanks for chatting to us Pleasure. and it's the Duke of Kent in charge of a presentation and a part of history as well as Jack he must be absolutely disbelieving what he's experiencing here with William Haggis, the trainer. I'm sure they're looking for Tom to come and get his prize from the Duke of Kent. Here he comes. As you can say, Jason, you could just sense his excitement. Well, well when he was talking, when the, when the King was talking to Tom as he came back in, there was that hand gesture talking about the ding dong battle. And you've told me before, Bruff, you you saw the King uh, ride winners previously, haven't you? You've seen him be in competitive action. He didn't ride a winner, but he rode a second at that load. He, he was beat by Tom at Plumpton, but he and was annoyed by. It. But he, you know, he he's actually been there. And he's ridden gallops, rode, rode a gallop of John Dunlops and his, uh, Ian Baldings. You know, he knows what it's like to ride a thoroughbred. You know, he's he's done all sorts of very high-powered skiing and skydiving like you have <laughs> <laughs> but understanding that gallop that full gallop on the thoroughbred he knows all about that he knows that and he will have got a thrill out of that you know what it's like to watch and this is a heritage thing too the family have had this horse the mare they're known as a foal to you early because you remember when it won the first time they thought it might be a derby horse and it's a very, very good bit of training. You know, not going to win the derby, let's plan it. Had a run over a mile, got to mile and a half, drop it out, whack. It's an exciting race to watch, wasn't it? I wonder who has the bragging rights in the uh, Mark One Doyle household now. She's won a Group One on the week. He's won a handicap, but in the Royal. Oh no, that one. That, that one. one right there. <laughs> that one right there. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to come here. He said he'll come. He said he'll come. Now we're just going to try and get hold of William Haggis here, the trainer. He's going to be kind enough to come over and speak to us as Tom Marquand, everyone wants a word with everyone involved. William with a huge smile on his face and no great surprise. William Haggis, huge congratulations in your training career. How big an honour is this to train a first winner for the King and Queen at Royal Ascot? It's as big as it gets. It's absolutely fantastic. Great honour for all of us and uh, thrilled that uh, they were here to see it. And what was the feeling like in the straight knowing you could be about to make history as you had the ding dong with Sheikh Farhad sauce. You don't really think like that, uh, Ed. I, I, we were discussed it and uh, I thought he was going to be more forward, uh, but he obviously thought they were going too fast and uh, they clearly did go a bit fast and he stayed on really well. It was his first time at a mile and a half. 
and uh, he's done well since Newbury and, and whilst it's obviously a surprise you only hope that things like this can happen but I'm delighted it has. <laughs> Did, you didn't say at lunch yesterday because you were in the Royal Procession yesterday at lunch at Windsor Castle you didn't say oh, a desert hero might have a chance tomorrow? No I didn't I didn't uh, touch the subject. And I know you're not allowed to say the conversations you've had with the King and Queen afterwards I think that's just not done but I, I, I sense they're absolutely thrilled. I think so I think uh, they've been looking forward to Ascot for a long time and wanting to have as many runners as possible and uh, I think they will be absolutely delighted. And would you agree with me this is huge for the sport isn't it? It's huge the cheer you were part of it yesterday the cheer they got from the crowd felt like me a real engagement with the King and Queen for them now to have a winner how important do you think it is for horse racing? I think it's obviously very important but it's important that the King and the Queen enjoy it which they clearly appear to do so long may that continue. And the Haggis is part of history many congratulations to you and Maury it's wonderful. Thanks. Congratulations and thank you coming out. I think you might have a few people wanting to speak to you so we will as long as it's not Matt Chapman, <laughs> as long as it's not Matt Chapman he says <laughs> congratulations to the Haggises desert hero is the Ascot hero the king and queen have their first Royal Ascot winner in 2021 to us the horse was unbeatable it was just a case of where you wanted to go to win is win by a good distance we had the next two years mapped out of Goodwood and Ascot and Longchamp and Saudi Arabia Dubai he was the best stayer in the world um, and it was just a case of getting him to the races and obviously since we've had that injury the, the goalposts have moved a bit and um, we're back to being being an underdog when we had the injury back in in the summer of 2021 there was a lot of discussions at the time about maybe even retiring him you know we were looking at possible stallion jobs for him and if the right offer had been on the table his career might have ended there you know that's how serious the injury was there was no guarantees that we could uh, we could get the horse back from you know, it was a it was a quite significant tendon injury that he had so he then had a period of 18 months off a real uh, a long rehab that involved a lot of water therapy and that you'll have seen some of this morning swimming and water walker he also had a whole summer out at grass and as we brought him back in you know last winter he was a bit of a different horse after that length of time off he suddenly became quite a fresh and keen horse but you know the fact that as you've seen this morning joe rides him most days he's not uh, not the easiest easiest ride in the yard quite a strong horse yeah, he's very quiet in that, you know, and he's um, just take a little bit of a grip, but he's, he is straightforward and he's well managed, you know, for a, say he is a full horse. First run this year in Saudi, he was quite keen in that and I was a little bit disappointed with him. Got him up there, but he just ran too free with me. But Dubai, he was he was, he was was back to his old self, you know. Make their way around the far turn and Subjectivist has taken the lead. The signs in Dubai were positive that the ability is still there and um, it's now getting him back to Ascot, to his home turf and yeah, as I say trying to regain the crown. I said last year when we had a joint license that when things went well I got 50% of the credit when things went badly I got 100% of the blame albeit we said all along that not a huge amount was going to change behind the scenes here at Kingsley Park and in terms of how the business was run there's certainly an added accountability and responsibility for me in terms of the results and the output on the track and you know, we've, we've made a solid start, but we now need to carry that forward into, into our flagship meetings. If you set targets that you know you can achieve, then what's the point in them? You have to set a target that is ambitious, that is going to push you and your team. So something like 200 winners is, is very ambitious, um, but we'll be doing everything we can to, to achieve it. buzz around Ascot right now. Tom Marquand has just been part of history. We've all just witnessed history. He can't believe it. Desert Hero won the King George V stakes. 
become the first Royal Ascot winner for the new monarch, for the King and Queen. And as Zara Tyndall said, how proud and how much the late Her Majesty and the Queen would have enjoyed that. And Tom Marquand's a familiar face down in Australia. As Jason said, he's known as Aussie Tom down there because he's been so successful as well. The Royal Colours, also quite familiar. They've had a few runners in Australia as well. But plenty of people will be staying up back home watching the racing tonight. What do you think they would have made of the Royal winner? Oh, they will absolutely love it. We love the Royal family and it's so great to see them enjoy it. You know, it's obviously a hobby for them. They're out here and they are relieved of their duties and they're here to just enjoy the sport. And to see that horse win in the fashion that it did oh my god it was such an exciting finish and what a ride by Tom who we have claimed as one of our own as Aussie Tom um, you're not having it <laughs> <laughs> well you might be back so <laughs> hopefully we'll see some more of uh, the King's horses come over and those colours race in Australia a lot more we're getting a lot more of that, aren't we? The kind of globalisation of the sport. Good horses travelling either to race meetings and back again or going and staying in other countries. The Aussies taking a lot of, uh, a lot of good horses from here. Um, jockeys as well, James McDonald. How do you think his week's going so far? Not great. Not um, great. Might turn around today. <laughs> well, you never know with racing. And the thing is with James, he's super dedicated. The, the reason why he is the best and leading rider in Australia is his dedication and the work that he does behind the scenes. He's an unbelievably relentless exerciser and I think that, that proves in his riding how agile he is and it sets him aside from the rest and, and why he is so successful and why he rides for all the best stables. Michelle, you're better placed than the three of us to tell us. What we've just witnessed here, I'm describing it as history over here. You said it'll resonate in Australia. Are we right to say that might be on front pages globally? Will this resonate around the world, do you think? Certainly around the, the horse racing world. I think for sure. Uh, we, we stay up in the middle of the night to watch this racing over here so I'm, I'm sure it's going to be huge in Australia. Hopefully you've got the Gold Cup winner uh, for us which is not too far away 4.20 this afternoon and Mark Johnson I suppose as a commentator you must be like you missed out a little bit lucky Richard Hoyles being able to call a bit of history I imagine that means something to a commentator. Oh no I take my hat off to Richard I was uh, stood right by him and uh, I, I, I just wanted Richard to be able to just nail that it was the Royal winner and he, he went out on a limb he went for it he could have bailed he didn't he went for it and uh, yeah it's we were all pumped up here uh, they have just by the way uh, changed the ground just as you were coming to me it is now officially good to firm on all tracks good to firm on all tracks Ribblesdale Stakes Group 2 is next. Three-year-old fillies going a mile and a half. Here are 17 of them. And one of the stars of the day, Al Sifar, is number one bidding to give the Gosdens a sixth win in the race. Jim Crowley in the Shadwell Blue and White. Number two is Blue Stocking. Frankie de Torres ridden a record eight winners of this race. He rides Blue Stocking. This time for Rafe Beckett. Number three, Climate Friendly. Dylan Brown, Matt Monagle looking for his first win at the Royal Meeting. Number four is Crown Princess, the jockey Iretz Mendisabel, four times the champion, the Cravache d'Or of France. He rides for Chantilly based Fabri Chappé. Number five, Ferrari Queen, who's the mount of James Doyle riding for Charlie Johnston. Six is Garrar, another of the Gosden runners with Andrea Azzini. Take out number seven, so we move on to number eight. This is LeMay, another of the Gosden runners, ridden by Kieran Schumacher. Take out number nine. Number ten is Lumiere Rock. Now, this is an Irish runner who's ridden by James MacDonald. Number 11 is Maman June, Kevin Stott in the first colours of Ammo Racing, for their second win of the day. 12 is Midnight Mile, the mount of Asheen or another rider looking for a first Royal Ascot success. It's been a great half hour for Tom Marcond. Can it continue on perfect profit? 125 to 1 chance here for Tom. 14 is Red Riding Hood, one of two runners in the race for Aidan O'Brien. He sent out the winner on three occasions. Wayne Lawden gets the call. Number 15 is Rocha de Leo, who is the mount of Holly Doyle, second run of the race for Jane Chapel High. 16 is Sea of Roses, the mount of Sheen Murphy, riding Frank Revolding. Ross Ryan looks for a double on the day. He rides number 17, understated. 18 is Village Voice for Jesse Harrington. Ronan Whelan is aboard. And the field's rounded out by Warm Heart. Ryan Moore has ridden the winner of this race on three occasions. And Warm Heart is trained by Ed O'Brien. Well, 
the Royal Crest, the Qu King and Queen. Really excited history here at Royal Ascot. If you just joined us, Desert Hero has won the King George, and I just met a lady who has backed. I the have. I backed Desert Hero and went. Woo -woo! How much did you win? £260. Well done you. Who are you from, Alison? I'm from Liverpool. Are you enjoying Royal Ascot? I love it. Love it. What makes it so special? Just the whole atmosphere, the crowd and the king being here and winning on the king's horse. Tell me, are you playing up your winnings or have you kept them? I've kept them at the moment. Are you going to have a bit in this race? I'm going on warm heart like myself. Is that because of the name or because of Aidan O'Brien? The name. The name. The name. Well, it was a... It's often a good choice back the names. Says, nice, to, yeah. nice to see you, Alison. Thank this gentleman, what are you backing? I'm backing Warm Hearts. Warm Hearts, you, sir? I'm backing Numeri Rock. Lumiere Rock, of course. That's trained by Joseph O'Brien, who got beaten by the King in the last race. Lumiere Rock is priced at 16 to 1. Was 20 to 1, so there's good each way support for that. Alicefa, though, the horse with the filly with a huge, huge reputation. 6 to 5 on to win the Ribblesdale. Blue Stocking, 11 to 2. Warm Heart for the Liverpool lady. Alison is 15 to 2. Crown Prince. 16 to 1 and it's a 16 to 1 Lumia Rock and Village Voice 20 to 1 bar look at that name Ferrari Queen 22 to 1 but 6 to 5 on a la Sifa We've all had to wait very patiently to see Al Asifa, the daughter of Frankel. She has very impressed us all, hasn't she, this season? And she's very impressive to look at, isn't she? She's a lot smaller than what I was expecting, to be honest with you. She's got quite a light frame, but she's got a lovely walk. Can you see, you know, horses, when they stretch their toes they can actually only stretch them as far as their nose and she stretches out nice and lovely and use, utilizes that she's got a cross nose band on that's just of course just to keep her mouth closed because horses are obligate breathers they can't breathe through the mouth they have to breathe through the nose that keeps her mouth closed so she can't of course obstruct her airways and uh, it's perfect for horses like her like her she's got just a egg butt snaffle on she's got a red hood on that's keeping her nice and calm in the prelim she looks fantastic in her coat no negatives about her at all Wangus Gold is the racing manager for the Shabwell Estate Company Limited. Our Asifar has looked magnificent in two races. In many ways, this is Didi, I guess, Angus. Well, it's a big step up, Matt, certainly. And particularly with this many runners, yes. Obviously, she hasn't met anything like this before. So, uh, you know, she's going to have to take another step. Ground is quickening up all the time. She's won both her races on good to firm. And she seems to have a devastating turn of foot. Are these conditions exactly what you want? I don't want to be clever, sound clever and say definitely. I, I don't think the ground will be a worry personally to her. I think she's going to stay. Jim certainly feels she'll stay. You know, I'm, I'm just, it's not often you see 19 runners in a Rulesdale from my memory. So I think it'll be as much about her lack of experience as anything. Uh, you know, she, she needs things to go right for her. She'll need to break well and get a good position just to be in a position to attack if she's good enough. Andrea once said to me, bigger the feel, bigger the certainty. We wish you well. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, Al Asifa, one of the most talked up horses ahead of the Royal Meeting, but look at that scene. The enclosure's absolutely packed as we uh, take a pan down the uh, straight here, the famous straight at Royal Ascot. It is an absolutely scorching afternoon. You can see many taking shade in that magnificent grandstand open back in 2006. But the Mercury risen further after that historic victory for His Majesties, the King and the Queen. But is the Ribblesdale Stakes up next? A group two for Phillies. That is Jono Boarding, who's going to be putting the rug on Sea of Roses. Jono, come have a quick word with us. Two seconds. He's uh, poor old Jono. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit sh lacking in inches. Whereas, how tall are you? I think I'm six, six, seven, six, eight. But you, you wanted, you did want to be a, a jockey, didn't you, Anse? Yeah, that that did dream, that dream died quite soon. <laughs> what, quite soon. What, when you were about three. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> Maybe even earlier. Hey, come on. So, what are you putting this rug on then? Um, she gets... Well, it's more of a precaution than anything. It's just a bit of padding. So, if she bumps around in the stall, she's not going to get sort of upset and a bit of weight. And, you know, it just relax her and give her the best opportunity of breaking well. And 
Okay. Running a good race. Actually, I, I think you're quite interesting, but I can't look it because I'm looking straight into the sun. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> good. Oh, oh, Coltrane as well? Coltrane, yeah. He runs yeah. today, Gold Cup. I mean, he's a course and distance winner, and he won the Cigaro quite convincingly last start, so fingers crossed. Good. Get that rug on then. But there he is. Six foot seven, six foot eight. That's, that's more than me and Weaver put together. And he's such a nice lad, and he's an absolute walking encyclopedia about the sport. A real chip off the old block. Likewise, his brother, really, Toby, as well. Over he goes. All part of the Balding team. Let's go back to Alasifa, Jason. I described it as a wow factor oh, yeah. at Goodwood. It, it was one moment that she jumped off the screen she went away from a listed field all right we can we can pick holes in the form and say that they weren't the the, the top draw performers but it was the manner of her victory now this is over a mile and a quarter we're in listed company look at the jockey's body language james jim crowley thank you very much off and gone now the question francesca has got to be we know she didn't beat a lot She's got tougher company today. Will she go the extra 440 yards? That's the, the key for me. Because if she does, she's going to be one of the best we've seen. That's that's where we're going to put her. But it has to be a question mark. She's got so much speed. I think the answer is in John and Thady Goldstone, we trust. Because they've taken the decision to back her up only 11 days later. They've supplemented her. They obviously have the confidence to think that she can take the step up in trip, the step up in grade as well. And, and Michelle, you and I were looking at her in the parade. Room. She, she walks around almost as if she's on springs. Yeah, she walks like she's a panther. You see her walk and she's just got this unbelievable smoothness and as you said, spring about her and that win was just remarkable. It would be very hard to see her getting beat here. We've got plenty of horses that have raced in Oaks trials. Actually, Mama and June herself ran in the Oaks. She finished fourth at 50 to 1 after coming second on debut. So that was a big run from her. She's an 18 to 1 chance here. We've got Warm Heart and Blue Stocking uh, who've got form around each other. Blue Stocking, they elected not to go for the Oaks after she was beaten by Warm Heart at Newbury and they've come here instead. Michelle Frankie de Toro taking his place in the stalls. In Australia, how, how, do, how is he received? Well, he's yet to win the Melbourne Cup. He was second, he actually finished second behind me on Max Dynamite and he's had quite a few chances. I think he might have had 26 rides in, in the race, but um, everybody loves him. How can you not love him? But um, I'm sure if he was able to take home a victory this year, it would be unbelievable. I might take it in as part of his farewell tour. You say everyone loves him. Hey, you, oh, English jockeys get absolutely hammered. Paul Will Buick went last year for the Flemington Carnival and you lot were absolutely beast to him after he got beaten on a couple of rides. The danger's here, Jason. Yeah, look, um, Blue Stocking will stay well and her form ties in closely with Warm Heart. No surprise to see those two sit second and third in the market. But um, look, Alice for five to six, bit easy, really. I think she was eight to 13 at one point. So the punters have shied away. They've latched onto a Ryan Moore and a Frankie Dutori if they are going to turn over what could be something spectacular. Blue Stocking for me, she has stamina in abundance. Looks like Red Riding Hood will be one of the last forward. Let's go to Mark. And the last couple moving in, Rucha De Leo will be the last one to move into stall number four to complete the lineup. A mile and a half for these three or fillies. They're in the gate and they're off in the group two Ribblesdale. And it was quite a level break towards the inside. Rucha De Leo wasn't that quickly away. Also understated is towards the rear of the field early. And so too is Garrar. And towards the inside it is Ferrari Queen who is away alertly. Out very wide is Sea of Roses, but he's racing forward. Lumiere Rocky is another one who is right up there in the early stages. There, there being followed by Crown Princess who's on the heels of the leaders together with Midnight Mile who's towards the inside rail. The dark blue with Warm Heart is creeping a little closer now as they make the run down the, to the steepest part of the hill and down towards Swinley Bottom. About to go into their first turn so it is Sea of Roses. Sheen Murphy has taken his time to try and get in but he hasn't managed to do so. Kept out by Warm Heart Lumiere Rocket on the inside Ferrari Queen and those are the first four. On the inside Midnight Mile is racing in fifth and now pushing up to try and take fourth Climate Friendly makes the turn in sixth. Blue Stocking is in seventh. And then Crown Princess for France is in eighth. Village Voice for Ireland is in ninth. On the inside, LeMay is racing in tenth position. Between horses next is Perfect Profit, as now they begin to make the run up the hill. After Perfect Profit is Understated, who races towards the inside. Garrar has tried to make one or two places. Maman June is one of those still towards the rear of the field. So too is Red Riding Hood and the back mark of the slow-starting Rocha Doleo. So 
they've gone through halfway. They're climbing now on towards the final five furlongs of the Ribblesdale. On the outside, Sea of Roses, who's had a tough trip. Towards the inside, Ferrari Queen, these are still the first two. Warm Heart is sitting a perfect stalking place in third. Then on the inside is Midnight Mile. On the wide outside is Climate Friendly, who's got the big white blaze. Then Lumiere Rock, followed by Blue Stocking. Frankie hugging the inside rail tight. He's going to have to have a bit of luck in the run to get a seam. Around the outside is Crown Princess and then LeMay. Uh, after LeMay, on the outside is Al Asifa, who now begins to make ground. But Jim Crowley is having to take the wide route, but he's sitting on a lot of filly. They've made the turn in. Two and a half furlongs to go. Sea of Roses has the lead. Warm Heart is in second. The eye is drawn now to Crown Princess and then Al Asifa. And now Jim Crowley is having to ride her to try and close. They race down towards the final furlong. On the inside, Warm Heart and Ryan Moore have got the lead. Crown Princess gives chase. Then Lumiere Rock down the wide outside is Al Asifa. Blue stocking from a long way back, but it's Warm Heart who is out in front to give Ryan Moore and Aidan O'Brien both fourth wins in the Ribblesdale. Warm Heart wins. Lumiere Rock got up for second. Blue stocking followed on by Crown Princess and then Sea of Roses. Al Asifa uh, capitulated late, just didn't get home, having travelled wide. 13 to 2. Warm Heart has won. She's completed her hat trick, having scored already at Leopardstown and then at Newbury, a 77th win at the Royal Meeting for Ryan Moore, and she's won by daylight. In the end, it's Lumiere Rock who's completed a 1 2 for Ireland in second place. It is desperately close for third. Blue Stocking on the near side may have just got the flared nostril. On the inside, Crown Princess have run well for France in fourth, and then Sea of Roses, and eventually the odds on favourite Alice Sifa was only next home. Therefore, it is a fourth win in the race for both Ryan Moore and Aidan O'Brien as Warm Heart wins the Ribblesdale. And having dominated on day one, a bit quieter yesterday, back in the winner's enclosure in the colours of John Magna, Michael Table, Derek Smith and the Vesterbergs, George Van Opel. Ryan Moore wins a fourth at Ribblesdale, a fourth for Aidan O'Brien. Here comes the favourite on the wide outside, Jason. She doesn't stay as Ryan now hits the front. Yeah, that was the, the question mark with the red hot favourite, wasn't it? And a big move down around the quickest part of the race as well, sort of six, seven wide. Wasn't an ideal run round for her, but she's come up short. Well, we saw it with Paddington earlier in the week, the way that maybe she had caught Aiden or he had caught Aiden unawares, gone through the grades and came up. Um, this is a similar story with her because that is by some way a career best. And Ryan goes above Frankie Dettori once again, Rishi. Yes, he has. Oh. Ryan Moore has, I think Ryan, and I, I don't want to, to damn you with fame praise, but I'll give, I thought you gave her a textbook ride here, um, the way you had the position and when you asked her to run. Yeah, um, the previous race we went real hard, and this race they didn't, and she's a, she's a straightforward filly. She's in a good spot, and it all worked out, you know, like, which it, it is, um, it's very hard here, you know, like, all the winners there, they're very hard to get, and you need the little things to work for you, like, I won the first race today, but I saw on the other side, you know? Just sometimes the ball bounces for you and sometimes it doesn't. That race it did. How much improvement did she feel that she's given you today, Ryan? So from Newbury to here? Yeah, she, she's definitely a better filly today. Obviously it was up to the mile and a half. It wasn't a strongly run race, so we haven't answered that question, but she's won a lovely prize today. Now I'd like to speak to this young lady, Hazel. You've been at uh, the Ballet Dwight for, what is it, 20 years, is that right? Uh, a bit more than 20, about that anyway. I'm not really sure. <laughs> now, a, little, a long time anyway. A little birdie tells me that you might be retiring this year? That's right, Jess, I am, yeah. How could you with all these great horses to look after? <laughs> well, you get old. <laughs> What? You move better than I do. Brian, how big a part has Hazel played in the team? Hazel led up the first winner of Rose Parade in the Jew House, yeah. So it's been there a long oh, time. Brian, and then up you. Well, poignant memories. Well done to you yeah, all today. Nice, yeah. Well, here's Aidan O'Brien. Aidan 
King Charles III has had a winner. Many believe you are the king of the trainers, though, and this is a massive improvement from this horse. Yeah, it was a great ride, gave her a lovely ride. Um, yeah, no, delighted. Uh, Jamie was very happy with her. Uh, Rachel, who, who rides her out, and uh, Ryan gave her a beautiful ride. She ran a very good race in Newbury the last day, and we weren't sure um, whether the trip was too far for her or whether she was there a little bit early. So Ryan's plan was to take his time with her today, and uh, he, he got a nice handy position and waited as long as he could, but she you know, go over the moon with her, really. Delighted for everybody, really. Aidan, Ron Moore's just coming in. He's one short of Frankie's record at the moment. We don't hear much. You talk about him, and I know you want to go and speak to him, but just how good is your stable rider? That's really brilliant, sir. What can I say? Like, uh, how long is Ryan riding for? He's an incredible fella. Um, I think he's nearly 40, but every year he's got better, and he's still getting better. It's incredible for But he gets better because he puts in so much day in, day out. He makes himself better. He, like, Ryan stays with us um, when he comes over. I think he runs six to ten miles every morning before he sits on any horse, you know, so he's so committed, so fit, so focused. Like, you just ask him a question, and everything comes out of him, all the information about the riders, the horses, the ground, everything. Um, like, he's an incredible horse, man. He's very cool, cool under pressure. Um, total professional, you know, so we're very, so lucky to have him. And finally, Aidan, before you go and ask him, I've got to ask you on that basis. If I was to run 10 to 20 miles and talk to you all over breakfast, could I come and stay as well? Yeah, pleasure, Matt, any time. Thanks very much, Aidan. Pleasure. <laughs> live to regret saying that Aiden. It's lovely to see Rachel Richardson's here. He referred to uh, Rachel and Rachel Richardson rides this horse at home, also rides the derby winner August Rodin. How lucky is she and she's also a big part of the operation. Warm Heart won at 13 to 2. Lumiere Rock 1-2 for Ireland. A 12th win for them in this race with second blue stocking in third. And wasn't that some tribute Michelle from Aiden O'Brien talking about Ryan Moore and his brilliance and the feedback he gives on everything clearly to the trainer when you watch him is his brilliance in his simplicity if you like he, he makes it look so simple I think he's just the ultimate professional you see him he drew barrier 16 there and that was just effortless for him but I think he's just so no fuss about him he you know he obviously doesn't give the most grandest interviews or anything or he's not flamboyant but he's so focused on his job and he's just the ultimate professional that he puts that all into his riding as Aidan said and he's by far my favorite jockey and for many years and um, you can see why he, he's so he's got so successful and dominating. And you spent a bit of time at Valley Doyle as well, didn't you? I did. Back 14 years ago, I spent some time with Aidan O'Brien riding track work when Johnny Murtagh was, was head rider for him. And uh, I said to Aidan earlier that I rode my first Group 1 winner when I got home from working for him, so he must have rubbed something up on me while I was there. I'm so and pleased you didn't say Johnny Murtagh was your favourite <laughs> jockey. <laughs> and then, it was Ryan. And now in your training role, you must have learned, well, picked up bits from all over the world, including a bit of a stint at Valley Doyle. Absolutely. I actually worked for your father also. So, Luca Kamani, I, I, it was the same year I, I worked for your, your father and had a few rides for him here in England and then went to work for Aiden for 10 days and had a race ride there at Cork and um, then went on to France. So, tried to pick up as much as I could from some of our best trainers all around the world and try to put that in, in my own way into my own training. And lovely to see Hazel Galloway there uh, who spoke to Rishi. Tom saying well done as well. She's clearly loving every second of this and has been part of the operation at Bally Doyle for such a long time in a race Ruby they went so quick in the previous race not so this time no completely contrasting races Ed I mean in the previous race they were breaking 11 seconds down to Swindley Bottom in this race they were all over tw all over 11 seconds almost 12 seconds even and Ryan Moore in the navy colours of Mrs John Magner slots over into a beautiful position near the front Alice Aoife got trapped wide and back Frankie's in a pocket uh, right in behind in the, on blue stocking but that's crucial when they get back up into the home straight because as Ryan is starting to quicken and go off the home turn, Frankie is all dressed up with nowhere to go on blue stocking, runs into a pocket, and as Ryan, is, Ryan was quickening, Frankie couldn't, and he's poached the same distance that he beats him off the home turn. Ryan was always in a great position. Alasifa, as you've already said, ran around the outside and appeared not to stay, but blue stocking was the unlucky one, but Ryan Moore, Aidan O'Brien praised him. How much praise can you give him? He's just in the right place so much of the time. In the last race, he was back with Tom Mark Hand. In that race, he was right up in the front end when they were going slow. He just gets so much right most of the time. So that was the Ribblesdale, the race before the Gold Cup, and they're getting ready here at Ascot as we go on a little tour across from the pre-parade and the Royal Enclosure. Come on, come on. 
to the parade ring itself. The winners still mingling it to the left there. The Coolmore team getting ready to collect their prizes. We're just below you on the right there. Heading over to the Queen Anne enclosure. And yesterday there was, what, 37,000 people here. It felt very quiet, actually, yesterday. The upside to that is lots of room for people to move. It'll be fascinating to see what the crowd is today. It does feel busier, but not as busy as some Gold Cup days here are at Ascot. A lot of people having a lot of fun. And out and about for us is Chris Hughes. Now, as mentioned earlier, there are going to be millions of people tuning in to watch the Ascot Gold Cup later this afternoon. So let's get out and about. If you're stuck for choice, let's ask some of the punters who they fancy for the big race. Well, who wins a big one? Eldar Eldroth, David Egan. You be here. Eldar Eldroth, if he's back in the St. Ledger form, he'll win. Who wins the Ascot Gold Cup? Trushan Holly Dole. Oshin Murphy and Coltrane. Oshin Murphy and Coltrane. Subjectivist, definitely. Well, ladies, you've got the golden Chardonnay. You're dressed for the occasion. You're wearing all gold. Now tell me, who wins the Ascot Gold Cup? Subjectivist. Subjectivist for you. And for you? Echoes in rain. Who do we fancy, girls? Who wins a big race? Lone Eagle. Emily Dickinson. Be cool. Aldor, Aldor. Good luck. And for you, sir, and Nate the Great. You're matching in outfits. Are you matching in Gold Cup selections? Yes. yes. Col Coltrane. Coltrane all the way. Well, girls, you look like you're enjoying yourself with the pims, but who wins the Gold Cup? Emily Dickinson. Trushan. Who do you fancy for the big race? Broom. Broom is my selection as well, so fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. And for you? Subjectivist. Emily Dickinson. Broom. Eldar Eldaroff. Oh, and I'm about to fall over and we spilled a pint, but it's all right, we're going to roll with it. Can we get the straw out for that one? Good lads, enjoy, good luck. <laughs> Oh dear, Chris Hughes, be careful wherever you go. Uh, now, in the Gold Cup coming up, we've got horses from the likes of the Gosden Stable, the Aidan O'Brien Stable, the Balding Stable, all the big ones. Yet, you've got Adam Nicholl in there, who runs his stable star, Wise Eagle, looking for a piece of glory. My name is Adam Nicholl, former jump jockey, now dual purpose trainer based in Sea Houses. Well, the last two years, I actually had quite a lot of injuries. I broke my back and I broke my femur. In racing, things happen fast, you're soon forgotten. And I just thought, I'd always had it in the back of my mind the last couple of years to think about training here. I didn't want to turn into someone that was just driving here and there for one ride and for people to start saying, oh, he's struggling. So we had the facilities here at home and we set up training. We went to Tats 2020 and we had a list of horses, maybe 30 to look at. And it was getting towards the end of the day actually and there was only a handful left. And Marcus Colley, who was a bloodstock agent, he bumped into Tom Clover and spoke to him. And Tom actually said, we've got a horse here that has got ability, but um, he needs a change of scenery. We went and looked at him. We just thought, well, it's getting to the end of the day, so we better watch this lad go through. And couldn't believe it when there was hardly any bids and that's when the hammer went down for 7,000 guineas. Hi, I'm Jenny. I'm now assistant trainer and partner of Adam Nicholl. We're incredibly lucky to have found him. Obviously, thanks to Tom Clover, Marcus Colley. Tom was so honest with us about him and knew that there was something there, but he obviously just wasn't enjoying the Newmarket way of life. For him to win his first race was a massive buzz. For him to come second over hurdles was brilliant as well. You know, we thought, oh, well, we've got something. You know, he's shown promise. But to go on and done what he's done and then to go on and be second in the Sagaro Stakes more recently, it, it's just an absolute dream. He's clearly had the ability. He'd won a race at Lingfield over a mile for Tom, so he clearly had ability. I think it was just mentally. It was, it was a mental thing with this horse. I think a combination of turnout, which you can see he's got now, gets that every day for an hour or so after he's exercised. But it, going on the beach, I think going on the beach, in the sea, it's something totally different that he'd never done in his, in his life. And on the beach, it's different. You can literally get chased by a dog or he spook at some seaweed or he's in the sea playing. I used to say I was a syndicate, six lads in the village. Some of them's never had a horse before. And they just think it's fantastic. They went to Ascot there for that last run they'd never been before. And they just they said it was amazing. Yeah. The facility is just fantastic. And they've had days out with Chester, York, Newcastle Plate Day. Since we've had him, he's won about £150,000 prize money, so the lads think it's easy. 
I'm hoping there's going to be a bigger field so they go a better gallop. It got a bit tactical the last day with only, I think it was five or six runners was then. It got a bit tactical, they didn't go that quick. Obviously, Wise Eagle, he has one turn of foot, so you've literally got a, you've got that one shot at timing it. I do think he'll stay. He's going to have to around there with two and a half in that grade. It's, you know, there's no hiding places that we know luckily we'll hopefully get Danny for the Gold Cup and I think that counts for a lot, knowing the horse, knowing him especially, because he knows that he's just got that one turn of foot and he's going to have to time it right. It would just be a great story, I think, wouldn't it? I've had a lot of people saying, you know, it's 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 a great, it's a great, it's been a great following, gone from a note to 65 at Catrick, bought for 7,000 guineas, so he's now rated 107. And here we are today, we've never looked back. It really is a great story, that, and that's what this sport does. It allows the underdogs to pitch against the big boys, if you like, and uh, in the form of Wise Eagle, I'm sure he will give the Nickel team a huge run and something to cheer. But let's see if any of you at home are siding with Wise Eagle. We asked you at the top of the programme to let us know who you're backing in the Gold Cup and why. Let's take a look at some of your tweets. Thanks to all of you who have been in touch. Sierra's going for Courage, Mon and Me, for Gosden and Frankie. Kevin Harley's going for Elder Elderov. We had a lot of the race goers with Chris tipping Elder Elderov. He's a St. Ledger winner. Subjectivist won this race two years ago. Mal Lloyd siding with Subjectivist. Frankie Lucas is going for Coltrane, who's the favourite of Sheen Murphy on board for trainer Andrew Boarding. He does like it here at Ascot. That's why Frankie's siding with Coltrane. Ian Whale is going for Wise Eagle for me, owned by a few members of a syndicate in Northumberland. Trainer Adam Nicholl only has a few horses in training, as we've just seen, and hoping to give the north of England something to cheer about in the Gold Cup. Elsewhere, Harry's gone for Broom, stepping up in trip. If he stays, he's got a big chance. And Gabby Ashton going for Trushan. Unfortunately, Trushan is a non-runner. So Gabby, um, I don't know who's going to win the Gold Cup, but I know that unfortunately, Gabby, it won't be you with Trushan. Trushan not running grounds too quick for Trushan. Did have a chance if the rain came, but unfortunately, Alan King took Trushan out earlier today. Thank you very much for all of your tweets, letting us know who you think will win the big race. And my word, what a race we've got in store. The pre-parade ring is a hive of activity and I've said numerous times it's a chance for us to see the trainers putting their finishing touches to their horses. You can just see here this is Coltrane. He's just uh, getting his saddle on at the moment. Andrew Balding just putting his number cloth on. He's a, Honestly, he looks absolutely a million dollars this lad and he's got a gorgeous attitude as well. Can you see? Look, he's trying to kiss He's trying to kiss the lady there. Bless him. He does. He looks an absolute gentleman. Let's have a little walk along, shall we, Aid? A few more, see who else we can get saddled up. Some of them have already been tacked up I've seen Broom and he looks he also looks really well as well so there'll be a few more we can have a look at I think is this is this your beer that's getting who's getting tacked up here who's this this is number one this is Big Call he's getting his uh, his tack on your beer was in here very shortly and then if we just turn to the right AD I'll join Ken Pitterson because Ken's actually had a, a chance to look at them as a bunch and I don't know about you, Ken, but it's actually a difficult one. A few of them I thought looked really well. Yes, I mean, your beer looks well. I mean, he's a big strapping lad. I mean, you can't miss him and he looks in great shape. Some get to this, looks very fit. I mean, he looks tuned up for today. I must admit, he looks well. Both of Aidan's, Broom and Emily, Emily Dickinson, I mean, they look in prime order as well. So it's hard to pick just a, a palette pick out of this lot, I must admit. What are you looking for when you look for a Stay, yeah. <laughs> just well, unlike the ones we saw yesterday, they were much more big, solider type. These are much more lengthier, which don't carry as much as um, I say, build as some of the as um the ones we saw yesterday. Yeah, they're much more athletic, aren't yes. they? Yeah, yeah. I thought it was a tricky one. I think if I was going to um, pick one, I'd probably pick Coltrane. I thought he looked really well. Yeah, I first I, first time I've seen him this season, but he's again he's he's bulked up since last year. He's put in a bit of condition, but. Condition, um, fitness-wise, he looks spot on today. Yeah, I find he's a horse that usually gets um, kind of he loses his condition as the season goes on, but he looks great today. So it's cold train for me. In what is a different sort of Gold Cup this year, but still a contest to savour. We've seen the David with Adam Nichols' horse. There are Goliaths too. We've already seen history today. Next up, a race that dates back to 1807, the Gold Cup.
course that they haven't touched on is Echoes in the Rain, who's looking to give jumps trainer Willie Mullins an historic victory. She is owned by former England cricketer Craig Keysvetter, who told me earlier how he rates the chances of the grade one winning hurdler. It's a bit of a tough one, really. You know, she's on the jumps is an incredible mare. She's she's a um, one grade ones, grade twos, grade threes, listeds. She runs at Cheltenham at Punchestown. She sort of goes around the jumping season and, and really gives us a lot of pleasure and enjoyment. So it's a it's a tricky one today. You know, she's she's a little bit unknown, I think, um, and on her rating was probably is going to be overlooked. But you know, we saw you know Willie brought for a ban yesterday. And when he brings the runner to Ascot, he's generally quite confident. So it's exciting. You know, it's the Gold Cup. It's the pinnacle. Um, we, we, we tasted success here last year. And um, to have a runner who, who the trainer and Jockey are both very excited about gives us a lot of confidence. How long has today, how long has the Gold Cup been the target? Because she's had a relatively busy winter, as you say. She's run at Cheltenham, she's run at Punchestown. How long then was this being the main aim? Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure Ascot or not the Gold Cup certainly wasn't um, in the plan. Definitely to have a flat season, one more jump season and then and then retire. So she must be doing something right um, for, for Willie to, to enter her and nominate and obviously declare her to run. And it's great to obviously have Tom Marquand back on board who, who rode Candleford last year for the victory. Um, you know, but look, if she can settle well and uh, we, we're not certainly not complaining about the trip she'll step up to that fine but if she can settle herself well and we'll, we'll expect a nice turn of foot and now was it the Keysvetter family that were very keen or was it Willie who was keen to come for the Gold Cup who was sort of the driving force behind it it's Willie Mullins you know I'm more than happy to to follow his path with, with wherever he wants to go you know his strike rate at the moment is incredible he's a phenomenal trainer obviously um, and it would be quite a cool story to be the first trainer ever to win both Gold Cups in the same sort of calendar year really so if he wants to go for it I'm going to follow you know he's uh, he's the G and, and that's that's what his role is. Uh, now, um, viewers around the world may not have even been to the UK, let alone Royal Ascot. How would you describe it, and what's it like, you know, just being here, but also being here as an owner, a winning owner? It's um, it's very addictive. You know, I, th I think this industry can pull you in. There's a lot of a lot of bad days and a lot of tough days, but but the the good days are incredible. You know, and uh, for example, last year we we only won a handicap, not even a black type race, but. The enjoyment and the, and the pride and, and the, the, the sort of fun you get out of it is incredible. And, you know, today's Ladies' Day, there's some, some incredible outfits um, around and uh, it'd be really nice if we could, um, yeah, if we could pick up, well, at least some black type would be great. And you're hot-footing it back to South Africa Monday morning. Um, you're very much based out there, you've got your stud out there. How has Ascot revered in, it, down there in South Africa? It's, it's seen as the pinnacle uh, and as the, as the main week in, in Europe and, and potentially the world in terms of... Um, class and elegance and horses and, and facilities you know it's it's one of a kind and it's it's always great to be back and you as i said you're hot footing it on monday so you're not staying around for the lord's test then the second ashes test no. uh, how are you uh, for our aussie fans who are watching um how do you think it's all going to pan out over the next four tests it's been quite interesting there's been a lot in the media obviously a lot of um sort of negative stuff about how they played or, or the chirping and, and all that sort of thing but that's that's ashes test cricket and it's australia versus england and it's going to be intense so you know, they're, they've sort of evolved the game or the test match game. They're, they're now getting it more exciting for five days. And I think if they keep playing that way, they, they should, um, should see Australia off. Well, looking forward to the Ashes next week. But before that, of course, the big run today. Good luck with Echoes in the Thank Rain. Thank you. Thank you.
supporting heaven. We'll be lifting this trophy in a few minutes time and I believe for the first time the King and Queen will be presenting the Gold Cup trophy. Let's get the details of this year's renewal with Richard. So this is the centrepiece of the week, the Gold Cup. Two and a half miles, part of the British Champion Series, £600,000 for place in history as well. One big call heads them up, Stefan Pasquier for Christophe Ferlon, beginning to give France their 16th post-war success in the race. Number two is Broome, who won the Hardwick at the Royal Meeting last year. Wayne Lorden for Aidan O'Brien, who has won this race no less than eight times. Broome successful in Dubai two starts ago. Number three is Coltrane, winner of the Ascot Stakes since a handicap 12 months ago here. Oshin Murphy running for Andrew Balding and Mick and Janice Mariscotti. Four is Lone Eagle, who is raised in trip with Ross Orion, who's had such a great week so far, looking for his third winner of the week, Rafe Beckett Trains. Number five is Nate the Great, a big ride for Harry Davis. Andrew Balding's second runner, also finished second in the Chesham all the way back in 2018 as a two-year-old. Number six is Subjectivist. Injury ruled him out of a defence of his crown. He won in 2021. He's back two years later, bidding to reclaim it for Joe Fanning and Charlie Johnston. Seven and eight are both absentees. And number nine, Wise Eagle. We saw Adam Nickel and what it means to a small yard to have a runner like this in such a big race. Danny Tutto, with his excellent Royal Ascot record, is aboard. Number 10 is Yabir bidding to give Godolphin a fifth win in this race. William Buick in the Charlie Appleby Blue Colours. Number 11 is Courage Mon Ami. A final ride in the race for Frankie Dettori for John and Thady Gosden. Unbeaten in three career starts so far. Up in grade, but was strong at the finish last time at Goodwood. Number 12, Elder Elderov, another winner at this meeting 12 months ago, winning the Queen's Vars, followed up in the St. Ledger and a satisfactory return last time. David Egan rides the four-year-old for trainer Roger Varian. The versatile mare echoes in rain, is seven years of age now, applies her trade over hurdles on occasions. Tom Marquand looking for a double on the day, bidding to cap off what would be a great afternoon after that royal winner earlier. Willie Mullins trains. And number 14, Emily Dickinson rounds them off, the second of the Aidan O'Brien runners with Ryan Moore aboard. Emily Dickinson in the dark blue colours, made famous in the race, of course, by Yates. What's the biggest surprise down here is how weak Elder Elderov is. From being 3 to 1, 7 to 2, 4 to 1. You can see here, Lars, if you'll pan to the bookmaker board, Steve Hooper, you can see Elder Elderov is 5.5 to 1. He's a complete drifter. Don't know why. 11 to 4 favourite Andrew Balding's cold train. Subjectivist previous winner, 6 to 1. Courage Monami for Frankie, 6 to 1. Yabir, 7 to 1. Emily Dickinson for Aidan O'Brien. He's already 3 under week. 4 for Ryan Moore. 17 to 2 from 10 to 1. Echoes in rain. That's the one that's been popular as well. 12 to 1, 11 to 1, 10 to 1. Now single figures, echoes in rain, and it's 10 and 12 to 1 bar. Coltrane, popular 11 to 4. Weak, weak, very weak, Elder Elderov. Well, let's start with the well fancied Elder Elderov. He was the winner of the Queen's Vase here last year. He won the St. Ledger as well. Now, there have only been two St. Ledger winners since the Second World War to come and win this. That was classic cliche and leading light so it's obviously not that easy to do he was beaten uh, at york in the yorkshire cup however things didn't really go to plan for him that day funnily enough looking at him as a type if i didn't know it was him and i didn't know this was a staying race i would have said he he wouldn't look out of place in more of a mile contest and he doesn't have a huge long loping walk either this the trip like with a few others is a little bit of a question mark with him so he's going to need to stretch out a little further but jason gave a lot of confidence about him earlier on today. Now 11 is Courage Mon Ami, who goes for the Gosden Yard. Very lightly raced, only had three starts in his whole career. Uh, he looks very progressive and he's been supported in the market, but he's literally won two or weather novices and a mile six handicap. So he's stepping up significantly in distance and stepping up significantly in grade. However, I feel like with this kind of open feel in the Gold Cup, if you fancied one at a bigger price, for example, him, I'm not sure he is a bigger price, but not one of the obvious ones, 
then I wouldn't put you off him. He looks really well here. That red hood obviously will come off, but he's quite calm and a few others are sweating up quite significantly, which is quite a negative for me because if you think about it, they've got to go down to the start. They've got to mill around there. They've got to load up. They've got two and a half miles to run. So they're going to be wanting to preserve every last bit of energy. One who's good at that is Broom because he's super experienced. He's seven years old. He won the Hardwick here last year. That race is a mile and a half. This one, uh, a good mile further than that. He has won at two miles. He won the Dubai Gold Cup. He's very versatile and a lot of us were very uh, confident about him winning the Yorkshire Cup last time out, but he was beaten that day by Javelotto. Elder Elderol finished in front of him. So I would have expected a bit more from him. And the trip is a question mark. However, the nice relaxed temperament is a big plus. Unlike this one, who is Nate the Great, number five, getting himself really quite warm. He's on his toes, he's wasting valuable energy. And he's a horse that needs to improve on the form he's shown so far second in the Henry II Stakes, which for me isn't a race that's working out all that well. By contrast, this one here, Coltrane, is the picture of serenity. Look how calm he is. He's been here before. He's won a two and a half mile race at Ascot. Not the Gold Cup, but we know he'll stay the distance. And he's just progressed through the staying ranks quite impressively to put himself right in the mix for this. He won the Cigaro Stakes last time out. He looks really, really well. Cannot knock him. And the next one is super interesting. Now, this is Yabir, who, what is it? He's won over three million pounds in prize money. He's done plenty of traveling all over the world. He's a bit of a star. He's a bit of a maverick as well he likes to sit out the back in his races and come with a late storm. However, he is stepping up significantly in distance. It's the first time beyond a mile and five furlongs. The good news is that he's quite a chiller, so he'll just hang out the back, let the race play out, and probably come with a wet sail towards the end of it. But look at the bulk of him compared to a lot of these others. He's taller, he's stronger, he's got a lot more muscle mass than plenty of these. And I want to just throw in Wise Eagle because we saw the lovely feature on him and his trainer, Adam Nichols and it would be absolutely brilliant to see them feature here. He's been a bit of a star. He's won 10 races for them. Could he add the Gold Cup? That would be some story. It really would. When well, you think the yard have only got six horses, Ruby. Tactically, how do you see this playing out? I'm not sure, Ed. I think it will be tactical. There's a mix of proven stairs and horses that trainers and owners are hoping will stay. But look, obviously the Art Gold Cup does start way down the straight at the six furlong pole, but it takes about four furlongs to get into a shape in this race. And no matter how fast they go, they'll all be tacking over to eventually end up two by two by two as they get to the bends up past the stands. Now, I do think what will happen is Nate the Great and Subjectivist will be the two horses who'll end up like the subject of his was in 21 towards the front behind them will be Emily Dickinson and Big Call and just behind them will be Coltrane and Broom Courage Mon and me and Elder are Elder up they'll be in the first group behind that then you'll have Wise Eagle and Lone Eagle and right at the very back you'll have Ye Beer and Echoes in Rain now they could be a long way back but Subjectivist is a proven stayer but there's not a massive amount of pace here and no real out and out front runner so Joe Fanning will maybe have to make it rather than get a lead like he did two years ago Well, there's no doubt one of the fairy tales of this Gold Cup will be if Coltrane can win for Mick Mariscotti and, and Janice as well. Um, Mick, for the other viewers who don't know, just tell us how this horse has managed to get to this point. Uh, it's remarkable. He, he was uh, he's very slow developing, didn't run as a two-year-old. As a three-year-old, Andrew thought he was the slowest thing on the gallop. Um, surprised us when he came out as a three-year-old, had a good three-year-old career, uh, and then sadly got an injury, which meant he missed most of his four-year-old career. Came back averagely on the all weather and he got better and better last year so you know we're here on merit we think and uh, we'll find out how he copes with, uh, with the big boys he's gone up 22 pounds since yeah. his royal ascot success a little bit like corto star back in the day is it possible do you think that that injury gave him the time to develop and it might have been one of those blessing in disguise things yeah a lot of people have said that to me i mean they're much more expert on these things than i am and they may be right i hope they are are you very nervous very nervous <laughs> very nervous but enjoying it trying to enjoy it well i think everyone would love it if you managed to win good luck thank you very much thanks mate. 
Paul Train is a three to one down here in the bettering. Some bookmakers calling eleven to four, but I can, as I look around, see three to one. It's eleven to two. Elder Elder of Subjectivist. Good support for that from eight to one into six to one. Courage one and me six to one. Yabir is eight to one. Emily Dickinson eight to one. I thought she looked particularly well. Look, Emily. Well, one just coming past me who's got very, very warm is Echoes in Rain, Willie Mullins' mare. She's sweating profusely. I can just see one of the source handlers just wiping her neck down just to make things a bit easier for, for Tom Marquand. Just waiting. Actually, look, we just see Ryan Moore coming. He's just down the course here, just leading Emily up, John, down. She, um, I think she's just stopped down there, but he's not at all bothered. He's, he's not worried about it. There's a stable mate next to him, there's Broom, who's been a fantastic horse, was third in the Yorkshire Cup. She, um, she got put behind a disappointing performance last time, but she's obviously a very, very classy mare. No sweat on her whatsoever. She's really laid back, and here's your favorite just over here. There's Coltrane and Oshi Murphy. He seemed pretty confident when I was talking to him earlier on and he looks so laid back. Look at him, look at Coltrane. He's been here and done it before. This is a big step up, step up for him, but he looks magnificent. Okay, so there's Coltrane. Jason, you're an Eldar Elderoff fan. The upside is Adele says she's never seen him looking this well before. The downside, how worried about his weakness in the market? Yeah, very, very easy out to five to one. Now, we know he's not the biggest, but he's a neat, compact type. Um, and look, Ed, we're going up over an extreme distance and sometimes that, that lighter individual can, can prove better. Um, I think he's blessed with a wonderful change of gear and if that holds out over this trip, a turn of foot over two and a half miles is a very very, very potent weapon. Okay, let me fire some others at you. Yeah. Subject to this, trying to regain his crown. How big a training feat would this be for Charlie Johnson? Well, I, I did read Charlie talking about him and he said, look, if, if he is back to the form of 2021, this will not be a competition. But if he's back, so we don't know, do we? That's a, a bit of a guess up, but it was a much better run over in Dubai. I've heard you arguing about your beer's chance this morning. Yeah, well, look, will, will he stay? Uh, I listened closely. Megan said, said definitely no. Matt said definitely yes. Uh, you know, he's a Breeders' Cup turf winner. What chance Frankie Dettori wins a ninth Gold Cup? Uh, listen, Courage Monomy is the absolute unknown in the lineup, isn't he? And probably the one who, if there's a young pretender on the block, he's got to be it. What about the Yates colours? Fade No Brown, who's also won eight Gold Cups with Emily Dickinson. Yeah, I'm, I'm a slightly concerned. These are the quickest conditions that she will have encountered so far. It's all because she's trained by an absolute master and ridden by a freak in the saddle. The other end of the scale, Wise Eagle, what a story, what a fail tale, fairy tale it might be for the Sea Houses Syndicate and Adam Nickel and his partner Jenny, who've just got, as I say, a handful of horses. Yeah, what, what, what a climb through the ratings and Metier was in second, he, he came out and won the Chester Cup, um, so look, he, he's got four and three quarter lengths, is it, to find with Coltrane? Yeah, it, it could happen. He's, uh, what is he? Uh, not even on the betting there, but he'd be a big price. Um, there are a few, I think, that have pretty much given this away in the preliminaries. The likes of Echoes in Rain, uh, Nate the Great, Lone Eagle, all got themselves very warm in the parade ring, and that's just not going to help their chances. The gamble, particularly on the exchanges, is subjectivist. Double figures this morning, being backed. Coltrane's rock solid, ice cool as well before the race, away to the right there. And are going to go off at around 11 to 4, you'd have thought, for the Gold Cup. Over two and a half miles, Group 1 action in the company of Richard Hiles. Thanks, Ed. Yes, objective is his strong 11 to 2. That exchange is probably also the overlapping of the in running market, as many I would imagine would expect subjectivists to make the running. That often gives people an angle to trade out once the horse is in a comparatively clear lead. Coltrane and Broom are the last two then for this Gold Cup Group 1 contest, part of the British Champion Series. Two and a half miles, so they start a long way up the spur. And they'll race past us there in the background. Escort United FC, they had a good season. Who's going to land the feature race? 
of the Royal Meeting. Yabir was slowing to stride. He was the one that gave him a couple of length starts. So the early stages of the Gold Cup. It's Lone Eagle who's up in trips, taking a bit of a grip out in the lead, and Subjectivist is gradually moving to the front. And Eagle's raced fiercely through the first furlong towards the inside in that headgear. Emily Dickinson and Broom, the Aiden O'Brien pair, are disputing third place at this stage. Coltrane has settled in roundabout fifth place on the outside of Wise Eagle. Echoes in Rain comes next. Eldar Eldarov just a bit scratchy through the first furlong and a half there stride out with any great purpose on the outside of Courage Mon Ami and Big Call and Jabir who was restrained on jumping out at the back markers so Subjectivist has adopted this front running role as expected and makes his way across the intersection and has the advantage by just over a length Lone Eagle is in second Emily Dickinson races in third Broom in the check colours in fourth place just ahead of Wise Eagle who races in fifth in sixth place is Coltrane just ahead of Echoes in Rain on the inside of Nate the Great then we have Courage Mon Ami alongside Eldar Eldarov and the back pair are Big Cool and Jabir. So Subjectivist has the lead from Lone Eagle who continues to race a little keenly in second despite taking the trail. As the crowd send them out on their final circuit, Subjectivist just beginning to press on slightly. There's now about six lengths between first and third and that third is Emily Dickinson with Broom, then Wise Eagle and Coltrane as they turn away from the stands. Echoes in Ray races on the inside of Nate the Great Elder Elder Rob on the outside of Courage Mon Ami, who has two behind at this stage as they make the turn. And they are Big Call and Jabir. And Jabir would now be about 15 lengths behind Subjectivist, who just scatters the pigeons as they race inside the final mile and a half. Subjectivist by two lengths. In second place is Lone Eagle, four lengths back to Emily Dickinson, a length and a half to Broom. Wise Eagle in fifth on the inside of Coltrane, then Echoes in Rain in the green and red, Nate the Great, Eldar Elderoff racing on the outside of Courage Mon Ami, Frankie Dottori currently three from the back with Big Call and Jabir. Well, this is where Subjectivist won his Gold Cup two years ago. He stole away on the descent to Swindley Bottom and he has the lead by about four lengths. He's increased the advantage over Lone Eagle, but not necessarily over the rest of the field because Lone Eagle has dropped back into uh, only a length in advance of Emily Dickinson, Broom and then Wise Eagle. Behind these Coltrane who sat mid-division throughout with Echoes in Rain, Nate's the Great, Courage Mon Ami, Elder, Elderoff, Big Call and Yabir, who for the first time has just closed up to be amongst horses, albeit right at the back. So Subjectivist now moves on by about four. In third place, Emily Dickinson. Ryan Moore's just moved Emily Dickinson off the fence, still only in third, just guaranteeing Lone Eagle's not going to end up in his lap. Broom is fourth as now they begin the turn, and this is where stamina will really begin to tell. The steady climb uphill in the Gold Cup. In fifth place is Wise Eagle. Coltrane in sixth, Echoes in Rain, Nate the Great, Eldar, Elder off Courage, Mon Ami, big call and still at the back is Yabir Subjectivist just trying to fill the tank out in front Lone Eagle closes to within about a length and a half as they climb uphill and make their way towards the final five furlongs Emily Dickinson then Broom behind these Coltrane just beginning to try and move a little bit closer on the outside of Wise Eagle behind these Eldar Elder off is beginning to make a move striped colours Courage Mon Ami tries to get on his back with Big Call and Yabir so they're well bunched now Subjectivist to the first time feeling some pressure for a rival and that rival's Lone Eagle as they begin now to make the turn. Coltrane has moved steadily through the field, is now joint third with Emily Dickinson. Then behind these Broom, Elder Elderoff is very wide round the bend as they straighten and now in the lead, a Lone Eagle kicks for glory. Coltrane and Emily Dickinson then echoes in rain. On the inside Courage Mon Ami is making ground for Frankie Dottori. It's getting messy out wider. Coltrane has the lead. Courage Mon Ami in the red cap. Subjectivist on the inside. Then Emily Emily Dickinson, Courage Mon Ami from Frankie Dottori, moves alongside Coltrane, the two fight out the Gold Cup, Courage Mon Ami, but on the inside, still fighting back Coltrane, Courage Mon Ami with the red cap, Frankie Dottori will win on his final Gold Cup ride, but John and Thady Gosden, Courage Mon Ami remains unbeaten. In second place, Coltrane, Subjectivist, Emily Dickinson fight out third, Nate the Great, Elder Elderoff never looked comfortable, Yabir was never involved, big call likewise. Courage Mon Ami in a race that hasn't been the happiest for Frankie Dottori in his last couple of years on Stradivarius. This time he stayed to the inside, the gaps opened, it became a struggle with Coltrane. We had the King of England win earlier on, the King of Ascot won the Gold Cup. Unbelievable! Frankie Dottori's farewell 
Tour is quite extraordinary. He wins a ninth Gold Cup on his final ride. And as Richard said, the Kings had a winner on the day and the King of Asker bows out in the Gold Cup with a win. Wow. All the way round we were thinking, oh, Joe Fanning's been gifted an easy time on Subjectivist and how the race changed with a whole host of them in with the chance round of a home. Detoria punch of the air. That meant a lot. And a lot of the praise will be heaped on Frankie and a lot of the attention on him. But what about this horse? That's his fourth lifetime start. He's never been beaten. It was his first time stepping up significantly in trip. Previously, he'd only run over a mile six. He settled what towards the back of the field. He came with a long, sustained run. And he has managed to win the Gold Cup on his fourth start. That is seriously impressive. Yeah, it's absolutely spectacular. And, and also, for, for John and Thady Gosden, you know, John has, has found a Gold Cup winner yet again. We had the horse yesterday also looked spectacular as a future possible Gold Cup contender as well. And these owners have spent a lot of money and they've had two winners back-to-back -back days here at Royal Ascot. They're called Wathnan uh, Racing. They are Qatari-based. The operation's been the leading racing stable in Qatar. They spent a lot of money on horses in training. And here's a crucial moment in the race, Jason. Frankie sticks on the inside where he didn't go on Stradivarius. Yeah, and, and listen, last he was just about, or the second, third last. I'm sure Ruby will have a good look at that. And he didn't get much luck on the way through in our previous contest, but is able to scythe his way through the track, up over this extreme distance, going a little bit smoother, a little bit slower. The gap's going that little bit slower as well. And this is the difference, Frankie Dottori, from 12 months ago, where his confidence was low, he goes wide on Stradivarius, this time he's retiring. He says it doesn't matter, I don't mind anymore if it goes wrong. He took the risk, he found the gaps, and there he is, punch in the air, and now he's with Rishi. Well, I don't know if there's a question that's needed. So when you've won the Gold Cup nine times, I'll just leave it to you, Frankie. Unbelievable. I never thought, I thought it was a bridge too far from handicaps to group one, but... I had the perfect race. Listen to that. That's what it's all about. It is what it's all about. But it nearly didn't happen because in fairness, Cold Train fought so hard. Did you think did you think you'd win it? No, I thought it was going to come back. In fairness, uh, he's still a baby, so when the Cold Train came back he, he picked up again. I can't hear myself talking so much, but clapping. Frankie, I'm going to let you enjoy it. We can talk to you so many times, buddy. Well done. You have to take your hat off to Coltrane as well, who ran a huge race in second for Sheen Murphy, the favourite. But here is our winner, led in by Aldea on the right there. He's going to enjoy this again, isn't he, your mate Frankie? Oh, you know, we, we often say about how much appreciation that the crowd has for him, and that is key. You can't walk through without somebody stopping him, and we are, we, we're going to miss him, Ed. We really, really are going to miss him. Yeah. Sports certainly is his agent Peter Farrell got a kiss on the lips, I think, there from Frankie. AD and our camera, I'm sure, will get a kiss from Frankie. Look at that. Here we go, then. Just enjoy this, everybody, because you're not going to see it again. And a day all about the Kings. Here's the King of Ascot winning the Gold Cup for a ninth time. the Queen and now Frankie de Tori bows out from the Gold Cup with another win. And I just sense him walking in there. You know him better than anybody, Jason. He was really taking that in, drinking that in that moment. Of course, of course. Listen, um, we, we, we know he is a uh an extremely up and down character, even though he will let you believe that he's completely on a level. We know that's not the case. Well, we heard from his sons, didn't we? Rocco and Leo yesterday said, 
right after day one after hitting the crossbar and finishing second three times the the lip was on the floor and he he was keeping himself to himself but yesterday he came out with a winner on Gregory in the same colors as this and today as only Frankie can do I mean in this farewell year he's won the guineas he's won the oaks and now he's won the gold cup I mean you couldn't get better than that and you say it was a very different story last year with um, Stradivarius and the gold cup there was a lot of pressure that day wasn't it he was going for his fourth gold cup Frankie didn't possibly make the right decisions at the right time I, and you wonder don't you how much did that contribute how much did the, the week he had the difficult week he had contribute to the to the decision for him to retire and it was interesting yesterday uh, Gosden saying oh well Frankie will have to come back next year and ride uh, Gregory in the in the gold cup because there's just been some story that's gone on between them and it's, it's going to be hard for him to retire I think he has made the decision and he's going to stick to it but wow it's hard and I think he's carefree at the minute if it goes wrong I'm retiring doesn't matter too much and he said that in an interview ahead of the meeting which I thought was a little bit odd but it, it just means he's, he's a bit more daring then isn't he he's a bit more daring with this ride than he was maybe 12 months ago I think he's found himself fit now hasn't he after the after the first day blew away the cobwebs he started to step it up a notch on day two and three and possibly Coltrane in second there's run a big race I've got to tip my hat to Charlie Johnson and his dad Mark who obviously is still massively involved in training the horses subjectivist to come back and run like he has third in a gold cup that's some effort isn't it yeah and to stay there as well because the uh, the, 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 the winner oh look at that the winner and the second have come from a different <laughs> parish, haven't they? From way, way back. Since Aldir enjoyed that. He's got quite wet for his travels there, Aldir. Uh, the winning groom as we go to Matt. John Gosden, something I imagine he said to Frankie de Tori from time to time, courage, mon ami. Well, <laughs> yes, we didn't know whether he'd stay. Obviously, you can't practice two and a half miles at home, come this way, he'll run you over. And uh, he stayed cool and rode him cool, kept him in the dark down on the inside, saved every inch. I saw he went to go outside, head of the straight, and they said, no, go back in. And luckily, he managed to wriggle through, found a great run. He's a lovely horse, bred by Mr. Oppenheimer, who's here, who, who sold him because it cost a great deal of money for... Uh, English breeders to keep their studs going and uh, he's, a, he's a gelding by Frankel but he's uh, he's unbeaten but he's gone from the all weather to, to Goodwood to here so full achievement to the horse. This is extraordinary for so many reasons but firstly the training performance of your stables to get a horse to win an Ascot Gold Cup on the fourth start I mean, don't know if it's happened before but it won't have happened many I times. I don't think I'll try it again um, you know I think Richard Brown's done a, a very clever job he was told to look for horses to come to Ascot Good. They're hard to buy, but uh, both of the horses were sold, the horse yesterday and this horse, were owner breeder horses, and the cost of keeping their studs is such they have to sell, but Mr. Oppenheimer's right here to see the horse, and obviously Mrs. Cooper yesterday of Normandy's studs. So I think you've got to realise how tough it is to, to keep a stud and pay the nominations and the whole deal. So they do have to sell, and both horses, uh, one's a colt and one's a gelding, so they keep the fillies and sell the colts. But look, great ride for Frankie. Sort of crowns his week now doesn't it? Well, He's obviously we... only good in long distance races now. <laughs> now, now, can we just, final question, because there'll be lots of married people watching this, and we know your relationship with Frankie is a little bit like a marriage, ups and downs. This time last year wasn't amazing. This is amazing. How, how, on the verge of the end of his career, how would you sum it all up? Well, it's a phenomenal career. I mean, we were 30 years we've been working together on and off, and when he was a dolphin and came back to me, we had one argument in 30 years. How many marriages can say that? And we patched it up after five days and here we all are well we were winning group ones in straight away after that in Deauville so uh, you know you have to some we had a disagreement that's fine that's professional and we kicked on with life and look at the result today enjoy the presentation well done thank you we're not going to see this too often again and how it will be missed and the king and queen have made their way onto the podium for the presentation. There is the gold cup. And how lucky to be in the royal carriage this week. Day one was Willie Mullins, who won with Vauban and Rafe Beckett, who had a 1-2 in the royal hunt cup. Day two, William Haggis, who won with De Desert Hero. And in today's royal procession, John Gosden, who's now gone and won the gold cup. And John Warren was there as well, mind you, <laughs> who won with Desert Hero too. So here come the winning owners. Wathnan Racing, who won with Gregory yesterday in the Queen's Vars, they've now won the Gold Cup. And for the first time, it will be presented by both the King and Queen.
again, just look at the interest, the photographs. And, and Jason, you're yeah, the yes. editor of a newspaper for a moment. What's your front page tomorrow, your back page? Do you go with the King's first winner at Royal Ascot? Or do you go with the King presenting a prize to the King of Ascot at the moment? I think both of those will, will, will fit on the one page, Ed. I think the front as well. Yeah, both of those. I think the King's first winner will probably be the photograph that, that will be there, the That man there, what, what a horseman. What a tremendous, tremendous trainer he is. Great feel, touch, everything about it. And um, hopefully, hopefully the apple, they're, they're a combination now, aren't they? The father and son. And hopefully the apple hasn't fallen far from the tree. Yeah, Thady to the right there. Three gold cups with Stradivarius and now one with a courageous young horse in Courage. Mon ami. Courage, my friend. Let's just enjoy this moment. Scurrilous Frankie de Tori. <laughs> I don't think he'll be beheaded for it, but he was cheeky a few years ago, I remember as well. And he's got the kids with him, which he'll treasure, absolutely treasure. Have they, have they glued the trophy together? Because he normally he normally the pretends thing. to drop it, doesn't he? <laughs> And if you're a sports editor, you're going to be spoiled with photographs. Choice for horse racing that's going to feature so heavily, hopefully on the front and back pages of the papers, which is so invaluable. And these pictures will spiral around the globe and social media. Just the dream day here at Royal Ascot. We just had a word with Andrew Balding. He said Coltrane's run absolutely excellent. They're thrilled. Weight for age was important here. Had to give the winner a pound, which he won't have to do later in the season, I'm sure they will meet again maybe a good word as Frankie holds aloft the Gold Cup for a ninth and final time oh my goodness I didn't drop it this time oh my goodness Frankie and Ruby I remember your analysis from 12 months ago with the gap that opened up that he didn't take how much more daring was he this time? Oh, way more daring, Ed. He was riding to win this time, not riding not to lose. And he gave his horse a brilliant ride. We picked him up before the turn in. Most of the field is still in front of him. And Ryan Moore is going to keep it, re or try to keep it really tight up front in the navy colours. You can see his right hand out. He's trying to keep Coltrane in behind, but he can't. But Oshie Murphy manages to get out. And then Frankie rides into the gap behind him. Now, he has to make a decision then. Where is he going to go? Where is the gap going to come? But Emily Dickinson in the navy, she drifts to her left, bumps into Echoes and Rain and as soon as she does Frankie dives over into it and gets into that gap then with Coltrane but he gets this big horse into a lovely rhythm a couple of flicks doesn't really go for his whip too much flicks him and keeps riding him in perfect rhythm Coltrane tried his heart out subjected us back in third had set a really good gallop but Frankie was just at his brilliant best this afternoon Ed And that takes Frankie to 79 Royal Ascot winners, two clear of Ryan Moore. How he'd love to hold that lead going into the final day on Saturday, retiring as the leading winner at Royal Ascot. What a special hour or so it's been. I hope you've enjoyed it at home with the King Queen's winner and then the Gold Cup. Subjective is so brave from the front. The favorite ran well in second. The Courage Mon Ami was Frankie's best friend. What a day it has been. The King getting his first victory here at Royal Ascot and then Frankie de Tori winning the feature race of the day, the Gold Cup and fresh from receiving the Gold Cup from the King. I'm delighted to introduce Thady Gosden, a co-trainer of Courage Mon Ami alongside your father, uh, Thady. I'm sure big, deep breath. Um, but what was that like, that moment up there with it, receiving the Gold Trophy, the Gold Cup from the King? Yeah, obviously it's fantastic. I mean, 
the Queen needs to come every year and it's fantastic that the team now is carrying on that tradition. Um, you know, it's brilliant for Royal Aston and of course it's brilliant for the sport of horse racing as well. And brilliant for your yard. Come on, big that up a bit. You're the, what you oh, guys yeah. have done with such an inexperienced horse. Well, like you say, he's a horse who traditionally you don't win an acid old trap on your fourth start, but he's a horse who's improved with every run. I don't know if you watched his first race, but he was detached from the field and managed to win. And he's a horse who's matured with every run and hopefully is still maturing. It's a brave decision coming here, but when in his career, after which victory did you feel like, actually, this is, could be a, not just a long distance horse, but actually a gold cup horse? Well, you know, he's always looked like he'd be a nice staying colt. Um, well, I say staying colt, now staying dealing. Um, however, you know, there's a two miles, I've been convinced, you know, put your left arm on it, he'd stay that, whereas today, the two extra half miles always a bit of a bit of an if until he tried out, and luckily he stayed it well. But classy enough also to win this, the feature race of the week, not just a, one of the, the longer distance handicaps here, we're just having a look at the replay. Um, just talk me through your feelings there, I mean, he he wasn't exactly motoring at this point. No, exactly, no, it took a little bit of time to pick up, obviously there's a wall of horses in front of him, he was tucked away near the back of the field on the rail, and he was hoping he'd get the splits. There was a moment there where it looked like he might not get out of jail but when he managed to riddle around them as frankly often does he hit the front and as I was talking about that little bit of mental maturity or immaturity earlier he hit the front and he slightly started to pull up and when the other horse came back at him he picked up again for him yeah what a, oh, what a great moment also then for, for Frankie de Tori, just how much is he going to be missed amongst the Godstone Yard how often does he come and ride out I was going to say every morning uh, far but, too often yeah, no, oh, no. he does does he I was no he does he's in, he's in two or three mornings a week um, he's always full of beans every he turns up whether it's 4.30 in the morning or 8.30 in the morning That's not what you want at 4.30 in the morning and <laughs> Excited to tally and wanted to get on with the with the riding. Um, courage, Monami. How confident was Frankie coming into today on him? Well, you know, I think we all thought we would hope he would run a nice race, but as I said, it's you know the two and a half miles is a bit of an unknown, and it's fantastic for new owners um, Al Wathnan Racing to have a winner at the feature race of the meeting and such a prestigious and traditional race. Yeah, I mean, this is um, a, a broadcast that's going around the world. Um, if you had to sort of describe that, what what is it like just being here, that winning feeling, and um, to, to people who've never even been to England, I guess. Well, I guess you know for this. Well, it depends on the horse, really. For some of them, it's a bit of a surprise. For some, it's a relief. But today, it's just a, a real joy and a pleasure. And there's a fantastic crowd here today. It's lovely weather. I mean, you know, it's, it's quite hard not to enjoy. You've been brought up coming to Royal Ascot with the King's winner and then with Frankie Lee's win. The atmosphere's really stepped up a notch, hasn't it? Yeah, very much so. You could hear the crowd buzzing as soon as Frankie came to challenge, let alone hit the front. Um, and, you know, if you ask anyone here who, who's your favourite jockey, I'm sure most of them will say Frankie de Tori. Oh. You know, he's been the zenith of our sport for a very long time. And it's fantastic to see him win what all, well, we think will be his final gold cup we'll have to see <laughs> and so come on then you've got um what three more races remain you've got some very nice runners coming up how how do you do you rate the chances especially in the penultimate race yeah exactly you know always got epitetus and torito in there torito's a horse who improved well in his last start um winning epsom you know he's obviously from handicapped a group company so hopefully he can make that jump up but he, he won a good style last time epitetus ran a good race to be fifth in the pre de jockey club obviously he's on fast ground a bit faster even today um but you know he's coming back down to, to group three so you know, he's always been a nice colt and probably he's run good race. And then in the last, we got unforgotten, the seven furlongs. So we'll have to see how he does. Well, look, congratulations then, Thady Gosden, alongside his father, training the big race, the big winner today, Courage Mon Ami, the winner of the Ascot Gold Cup. Quite a day, this. The king and queen of the country winning earlier and now the undisputed king of the track. It's always like this, Michelle. This is pretty <laughs> standard, isn't it? What an absolute privilege it is to be here to see this. Um, to, to witness Frankie, I was out on the track watching right in front of the winning post and the crowd and the atmosphere to see him win on his final year, the Gold Cup, unbelievable. And, and you're a jockey and a trainer back home. For a horse to win the Gold Cup on only its fourth start, pretty unusual, isn't it? Absolutely remarkable. I was watching him walk around the mounting yard like an absolute true professional. He was the pick of the yard in my view, but for John Gosden to prepare him over over 3,900 metres at his fourth start, we'd, that would be unheard of at, at home. And, um, you know, it's obviously compares to our Melbourne Cup and I don't think ever in our history we would, we would have seen that. So for him to be able to do that and that horse to be to win the way he did, like a, an absolute true professional, was just unbelievable. But, but, but do you compare a race like the Ascot Gold Cup to the Melbourne Cup? Because the Melbourne Cup obviously is a staying test over two miles. However, it's a handicap, so it's quite a different proposition. I think when people ask me, I compare it a little bit more to the Grand National because... 
all the horses in there have a chance if the handicap has done its job? Yeah, I think so. But I think the main thing is it's a test of stamina, both races. Obviously, um, the Melbourne Cup's not as far as the Gold Cup being 3,200 metres, but it is such a true test of the horse's stamina. And you really know if you have a horse that can stay when you get to the clock tower, which is about 300 metres from home. And that's when, if you've got a horse that stays, that, that staying power kicks in and, and you're able to, to either win or lose. Um, and I'm sure that the Gold Cup is very similar in the way that you need that horse that's, that's got that extra stamina and, and can get the job done. And it's all about also the horsemanship that comes with it. With Obviously, we saw Frankie de Tori and, and how wonderful he rode uh, that horse and the trainer to get that horse in, in the best shape and relaxed and to cope with the big occasion. Jason, didn't you run a Melbourne Cup? I once? rode in the Melbourne Cup and, um, oh, listen, it, you, know, you get introduced to the crowd. So it was new for me, you know, stand up there and I was double trigger. Number one, Jason Weaver, double trigger. And they went, yeah! I went mad. Oh, I've never seen that before. Puffed out so the I got puffed out of the chest <laughs> and I walk out the walkway and some Aussie with his VB beer or another beer leans over and he said, come on, Trigger, come on, Weaver, you can do it. So I think, oh, fantastic. I'm all pumped. I trail in nowhere. Double Trigger gets <laughs> beat. He's just about the favourite. Um, the reply as I walk I back imagine. down the walkway, <laughs> the same guy with his beer, he went... In, I'll, I'll say it nicely. Go back to England, you pommy, <laughs> and take your dog with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you later, Michelle. I want you to think about should Frankie carry on or should he go out to the top? There's one for you to think about. We'll come back to you a little bit later. With that, right now, though, let's go to Chris. Now I've collared our good friend Hayley Turner on ITV Racing. Last year we had you for a couple of days, didn't we, at Royal Ascot, when it was absolutely scorching. But yeah, you're off duties, you're riding today. Great to be back at Royal Ascot, though. It is. It's nicer to be in this cooler top than <laughs> standing over in the podium all day in the roasting heat. But, um, yeah, Ascot's just such a buzz. Everyone wants to be here. Everyone wants to have a runner here, and it's... Um, such a good atmosphere it's you know everyone says when you have a winner oh it's so nice that they had a winner they've always wanted a royal ascot winner but everybody wants a royal ascot winner so well, try and tell everybody at home our audience why is royal ascot so special i know it's the pinnacle the crowning jewel of the flat season but what what makes it so special what is unique about it i think because it's just so hard to have a winner here you know you've got the best horses from around the world you know on this track and you know now they've redone the stands and everything it's just it's just huge and it's just so hard to do and it's just a challenge for everybody and it's just one of the best theatres in, in world sport isn't it yeah from when you walk in you know and everyone's spent months planning their outfits and you know they're getting their pictures taken and then they're enjoying the racing and then you know the car park in the evening yeah, i mean it was absolutely banging in there last night so. yeah, I'm sure it was well as long as you didn't have too many drinks in you you look at good form today but we saw uh, a moment ago earlier today tom marquand coming in on a royal winner i know you've ro uh, rode winners um, in the royal colors before how special is that feeling? How would he have been feeling walking in back to this reception in the parade ring? Oh, the look on his face when he was walking back in on the horse, it just gave me goosebumps because it's just, it was just, I could just feel it for him. It's and amazing, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've had a winner, I had a winner for the King at Lingfield a couple of months ago and that was a buzz. So imagine doing it here when he's here, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing. And isn't it great for racing like as well? And, and hopefully the King will be keen to come back next year as well. Absolutely. Well, talking of, uh, of winners, you may be having one later on. The Britannia Stakes, 5 o'clock um, in due course. Talk to us about the chances. Docklands, Harry Eustace horse, he probably, you'd think, would want softer ground. It looks a bit quick out there, but how would you assess his chances? Very well-fancied runner. Yeah, he's a lovely horse. I've really enjoyed riding him um, to this stage of his career. He certainly deserves a chance in the races. He's a very straightforward horse. His form is mostly on soft ground, but he hasn't ran on the quicker ground yet. I was actually speaking to Jim Crowley in the weighing room, and he won on his father, who was Massa, and he said that he was a big horse that wanted a bit of juice in the ground as well. But I think the straight course at, at Ascot's quite forgiving with the ground because it's almost like a sand base, and um, you know they've watered it well. There's a nice cover of grass on, so um, I'm yeah, I'm not without hope. Well, good luck. We wish you all the best. It'd be great to have you back on ITV soon. And um, yeah, we wouldn't begrudge your winner. So fingers crossed you can come in that winner's enclosure in a short while. Hopefully. Thanks. Good luck. Good luck. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.
to the one. Well, even from where my vantage point was, I could hear the cheering and screaming in the royal enclosure. But here in the Windsor enclosure, they were going absolutely nuts. Let's go on the way around. Uh, Jesse, look at this. 49 quid it costs again. Right, who back Frankie then? Who put Frankie? None of you. None of you lot. Did you, did you back? Did you back him? You backed him? Yes. I could see you cheering and jumping around. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Go on, my son. Oh, yeah. Frankie the Tory! He's some boy, isn't he? He is. You... I heard his name, so that was enough for me. That was good enough. That's well, it's, it's sometimes, you know, you can look at the form, but if you get some of the enjoying yourself. Yes, thank you very much. You're looking, you. looking, you. You're looking absolutely glorious. Oh, thank you so much. That's smooth, aren't I? Yeah, yeah, you well, are. No, I'm not, you're, not, you're, not you're, Look at this line here. This is absolutely brilliant. This is what Royal Ascot's all about. Are you lost? No, oh. I'm not lost. Oh, okay, all right. Ready for the next race. Are you? What are you going to back? Docklands. I think it's got a great chance. Good luck. Thank you. Good luck. Glad to see you're not lost. So there we go. This is how to spend the day at Royal Ascot. A Frankie winner and some champagne. So this is the big handicap of the day. It's a handicap for three-year-olds over the straight mile. The Britannia Stakes, £120,000 up for grabs. And again, plenty of horses on the upgrade. I'll rattle through them. Finn's Charm in the subjectivist colours. Joe Fanning rides. Two is One Nation White Cap for William Buick. Three Panic Alarm, Ronan Wee. Doyle. Five is Starnberg. Alec Boykanski claims the five pounds. Six racing brakes rider James McDonald and seven Benneker Jamie Spencer. Eight is New Endeavour uh, David Egan. Nine Docklands Haley Turner. Ten Ramazan stripe colours Oshin Orr. Eleven the absentee. Twelve is Bless Stefan Pasquier for Bradley's Chape. Thirteen Dark Thirty Sean Levy. Fourteen Karachi Ryan Moore and fifteen Better Days Are Coming Billy Lee. Number sixteen surely not the Chester winner Holly Doyle aboard. Seventeen Forza Timau for Kevin stop 18 Saxon King Kieran Schumacher 19 Quantum Impact for Frankie de Tori and 20 Physique Mohamed Tabti claiming the seven pounds uh, 21 is good karma Daniel Muscat that's the Constitution Hill colours 22 Thunderball Billy Lockman claims three and 23 Tempered Soul Machine Murphy 24 Metal Merchant Ross Orion 25 Justin Hour Dylan Brown McMonagall 26 Urban Sprawl Andre Atzini 27 Royal Cape Tom Marquand 28 Naxos Danny Tutto 29 Fort Vega Robbie Colgan and 30 is Mustajar for Lewis Edmonds Big Field about to head down to post for the Britannia. Yes, and Harry Eustace's Docklands is favourite marginally at 11 to 2 here. Rob Waterhouse, the top Australian bookmaker. Quantum Impact, number 19. Could this be Frankie Dettori's 80 at Royal Ascot winner? That's a 13 to 2 shot. Racing Brakes Rider, number 6, is priced at 10 to 1, 11 to 1, Saxon King, 14 to 1, surely not. 14 to 1, Fort Vega for Sheila Lavery. Money for that. Also money for the French horse. Bless at 16 to 1. A quick word here. Warren Woodcock, welcome to Royal Ascot. How are you keeping? It's great to see you guys. Tell me, Rob Waterhouse, Gay Waterhouse, mentioned the Waterhouses, of course, is Australian racing dynasty. Dynasty, absolutely. Tell me, they have a horse that they bought at the Goffs London Sale, and they, they did. They bought uh, New Endeavour is about to run in this race, and then they also have Cuban Dawn that they bought that'll run Saturday. And last year they bought a horse for a million pounds at second favourite for the Cup. Tell me, how, when, when Frankie wins the Gold Cup, how bad is it for bookmakers? Well, I, I will go to therapy for about a month, but I, it'll probably only be six weeks for this one. Yes, Thank you very much. Great to see you all. Big winner! Woo! I think it's super hard to try and find a winner for the Britannia, so we'll have a look at them in the parade ring. We're going to start off with this beautiful looking chestnut. This is One Nation. Wow, doesn't he look a million dollars? Look a shiny copper penny, isn't he? You could see a face in his uh, coat. He looks that well. He's got cheap pieces on. He's got a lip chain on as well, so cheap pieces on suggest that he's um, not 100% concentrating on his job. Number four is next. This is High Bank, his uh, stable companion. He's a, a, a bay with a red hood on, so that's keeping him nice and calm in the prelims. He's going to swing out his bottom, AD, so just be careful you don't get kicked. We'll try and pick up a couple more, AD. Uh, 25 is next. This is just an hour. Do you know, a lot of people, you can see he's actually got um, a lip chain on as well. A lot of people say to me, oh, does the bit in their mouth not hurt the ho horses? And I say, well, no. I mean, they have 40 teeth. Well, Geldens have 40 teeth, males, Colts and Geldens, and then Phillies actually have 36 teeth. And where the bit is, there's actually a big gap for it to sit in, so it doesn't hurt them at all. So 
that's um, one thing you might have learnt today. Colts and Geldings have 40 teeth, Phillies and Mares have 36. We'll drop back and try and pick up a couple more AD while they're just stood here. Uh, this is 23, this is Tempered Soul. A nice strong shoulder. A lot of people say, why do you, um, why do you look at their shoulder? Well, one thing that they need, a, the reason why they need a, a good strong shoulder is because horses have no collarbone, unlike us. So they, their shoulder attaches to their body through muscles and ligaments. So hence why we say you need a good strong shoulder. Let's pick up a couple more then, AD. This is 28. This is Naxos coming here in good form. Just got a little bit warm around his body, as you can see. A lot of these horses here today are wearing the hood because this is, a, of course, a, a big day out for them. And we'll just pick up one more AD behind us. This is number 14. Um, this is Karachi of Aidan O'Brien's horse. But I'll just mention one of the ones that took my eye up in the pre parade room was actually Hayley Turner's horse. I thought he looked absolutely fantastic. She rides number nine, Docklands. He hadn't turned a hair up there. I haven't quite seen him yet now. He's coming to the main parade room, but I did think he looked really well. <laughs> Well, Charlie Hills has a huge hand in the Britannia with Racing Brakes Rider, who just keeps on winning, and Saxon King, who comes in here in tremendous form. Charlie just giving James McDonald his, his orders. Let's quickly go in. Charlie, this horse keeps winning, and now you have the New Zealand Wonder Kid, the man they say is arguably the greatest on the planet, riding your horse. I don't know about that. He was um, he was lucky for me last year, and he's we've had a bit of success in the, in the past, so it's great to have him on board. This horse keeps on winning. The, the the question clearly is how much further can he go? Well, that's what we're going to find out today. You know, when you're going to have three-year-olds who's improving as well as he is, you just don't know where it's going to where it's going to finish. So you know, it's going to be hard though. Off 97. Would you prefer a bit more juice? Uh, we're going to find out. You okay. know, um, he's at least he's won on this course, uh, which is a big help, and we'll find out today. And Saxon King gets the excellent Kieran Schumark on board. One Absolutely. line on him. Absolutely, yeah. He's uh, coming off a win on Saturday. So it's a big ask you know, to come in of a quick uh, turnaround, but he seems fresh and well in himself and hopefully should, should run a big race. Be sure the best. Good luck. Thank you. Here is Docklands going to post under Hayley Turner for Harry Eustace and the OTI Racing uh, colour. So impressive last time. I said after that, Hayley, you won by too far. And she said, no, 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 no. We'll get into Royal Ascot now. Form looks good. 11 to 2 joint favourite in a race where ideally a joint favourite doesn't win from a charity point of view because full marks once again as they have in recent years to the big bookmakers who've agreed that all profits from the Britannia stakes today will go to charity and those charities are Sports Aid, the Holocaust Educational Trust, Cystic Fibrosis Trust, SAS Regimental Association, Ascot Racecourse Supports and Together for Looked After Children. It's a really good initiative that so we want a big price winner so then there's more money won by the bookmakers for a change that then goes to charity. It's really good. Who's going to win it, Jason? How many oh, darts do you want? Can I have a couple, please? You can. Ed? A you can. And one on either with good side karma, I hope. of the track. One on either side of the track as well. For for the low numbers, um, I thought that Royal Cape ran better than his finishing position. Oh yes. He um, definitely. He was. Professional football in TNT. It's our culture. It's a community. It's a vibe. It's a skill. Simon's 
Visa. It scores. The target. Oh, oh, oh. It's the TT Premier Football League. March to July 2023. Look at this dramatic moment. A la Peter Marazzelli Savage. What a way to score in front of his home fans. Welcome back. Singers, musicians, do you have what it takes to be the next maestro? Be a part of the new, revolutionary, and not to be missed TV show, The Maestro, for a chance to win up to a million dollars in cash and prizes. Log on to thenextmaestro.com. Attach your demo and bio to register. Limited spots available. For more information, visit thenextmaestro.com or email info at thenextmaestro.com. Follow us on IG and Facebook. The Maestro, brought to you by Scene TV, Catch, Catch 2, Just Create Productions, and 360 Concept. In the summer heat, old rivalries are rehashed. New champions may emerge. The 2023 Rugby America's North Men's Under-19 and Senior Women's 15s Tournament will be a fight for dominance. See the region's top teams match skills July 12 to 16 at the Urimona Bowl in Kingston, Jamaica. Watch live on your home of champions, Sportsmax 2, Sportsmax YouTube and the Sportsmax app. Come to the game for rugby action, prizes and surprises. Admission is free. We've had to take a break for the last 10 but minutes, but we've stop. defied <laughs> our producer. The best sports show in the Caribbean. They're an approach that you have as a team leader that has worked well for you. A great magician never reveals a secret, lads. Ah! But <laughs> <laughs> Gone are the days where when you have an athlete running 21.9 and 10.8, you put them down for a medal at the global event. Get it's you, not good enough. Get your nose. Riveting and fun. I felt like those were extremely sloppy on the field because those were catches that I felt like even I could have taken on. Why did both of you go, mm. <laughs> <laughs> You should hear it for them. <laughs> I, I love that, Mario. <laughs> Watch the Sports Max Show. Weekdays, 4.30 p.m., 5.30 p.m. ECT. We've had to take a break for the last 10 but minutes, but we've stop. defied our producer. The best sports show in the Caribbean. They're an approach that you have as a team leader that has worked well for you. A great magician never reveals a secret, lads. Ah! But <laughs> <laughs> Gone are the days where when you have an athlete running 21.9 and 10.8, you put them down for a medal at the global event. Get it's you, not good enough. Get your nose Riveting enough. and fun. I felt like those were extremely sloppy on the field because those were catches that I felt like even I could have taken on. Why did both of you go, mm. <laughs> <laughs> You should hear it for them. <laughs> I, I love that, Mario. <laughs> Watch the Sports Max Zone. Weekdays, 4.30 p.m., 5.30 p.m. ECT. Every swing. Every point, every match is an opportunity to make history. No matter the location, the objective is the same. This is how champions are made. Deny the upset, earn the win, keep going. They will not quit and neither will we. The WTA lives on your home of champions.
Alô, galera de Orlando. Estamos chegando cheio de amigos e novidades. Estamos chegando, hein? Nos vemos em breve. Até lá. The new home of the beautiful game 2023. Some dreams live on through generations and through these transcending lenses we grow to appreciate the game. Millions of fans across the world, many wishing they possessed the skills to play and for others still dreaming for that moment to showcase their talents to the world. We travel from miles apart, but we are connected to the strangers celebrating among us in the stands with unbridled joy. And the 22 on the field, we all have the same dream that one day we will become champions. The UEFA Champions League returns to your home of champions this August. Our dream begins together. track is designed more or less a footprint of uh, Belmont Park in, uh, in New York. Uh, beautiful long sweeping bends and uh, over a quarter of a mile straight. Uh, the sand is in particular I think is the best in the world. You're always going to get kicked back but the sand is uh, kind of thin, it doesn't stick on the horse's face and uh, you know I've seen horses coming from the back here so it's not just speed orientated, it's, uh, it's horses, it's a race track indicators, front runners and horses uh, closers so uh, it's kind of uh, it's a unique track for the dirt. Dirt track's really nice, obviously with any, any dirt track you're going to get a certain element of kickback. I haven't ridden on American dirt surfaces but the, the kickback, you know, it does come back but it's very light and fluffy. You can win from anywhere, you can win making the running or dropping in. And I've won on plenty of horses that have performed well uh, back in the UK on, on turf and won their first, you know, first, second, third starts on the dirt over here. So certainly it's, uh, I don't think you need an out and out dirt horse to go, go on the track. History made today as well, so you know to look back on today and it's just amazing. Yeah, I can't believe you once retired. I know. I always said I probably should have just had a short break, but <laughs> anyway, I came back stronger. So oh, stronger than ever. Now this chap here, Michael. I, I hope you've you've gathered yourself in a few few tears. How are you feeling at this moment? I, I don't know. <laughs> I've been watching Royal Ascot since I was about six years old. Three years old. Hopefully, bring you one day. My first, well done, Hayley. my first Royal Ascot. Right. Could never ask for more. Well done. Many congratulations Thank to you, you and the team. Well done, Hayley. Yeah, that's Michael Vokins there. Well done to him, wearing the right coloured tie. Hayley Turner, right, her fourth Royal Ascot win. And there's some combination, because Harry Eustace is making a huge impression as a trainer. He's sort of coming under the radar this year, Francesca, because it was his brother bringing the Australian sprinter over who was getting all the headlines. And here he is in the winner's enclosure. Yeah, his brother, Dave Eustace, trains in partnership with Kieran Maher in Australia. They had Kool and Gatta. Uh, they're a massive operation down under, somewhere up to a thousand horses they train, whereas Harry would have a much smaller yard uh, started what three years ago potentially maybe even two very new on the block trains in new market um, Haley rides out for <laughs> plenty and they've got a good association here and this horse came into the race well fancied having won his previous two starts and has won like, like a really small horse and for OTI this is this is a big winner for them we've had a winner for the king we've had a winner for the king of Ascot and now one of the queens 
wings of the tub. Would that be fair? Oh, that is She's fair. an inspiration, isn't she? Super, super rider. And, um, you know, she, she paved the way and sort of smashed through with Group 1, one wins on uh, Dream Ahead and the likes. Margot did. And, uh, yeah, that, that is super. And well done. Young trainer. Getting that first Royal Ascot winner on the board is special. I'd love to know what Hayley's strike grade is at, at Ascot because she doesn't seem to get that many runners. And maybe Ruby will do the stats for us. No, we'll ask her because I guarantee she'll come over here and yeah. jump into our arms and love it. The winner was six to one favourite. Finally, a result that goes the punter's way in the Britannia. The bad news for that is with the bookmakers giving all the profits to charity, there won't be as much money going to charity if one of the other four in the places would have given. 22 to one the second, 50 to one the third, and 66 to one the fourth and fifth. Well done to anyone who found them, but plenty of people found Docklands for OTI racing. Colours you see a lot around the globe. Winning with Docklands, and a word about Harry Eustace making a big impression in Newmarket. Yeah, look, it, it is. Um, that's him, that's him. one to the left of Haley, now two to the left of Haley, now back one to the left third, of Haley. His third, all right, Ed, his <laughs> third season training, and, um, you know, you're, you're always <laughs> looking for that, <laughs> for that big horse. Ah, there we go. Not quite as Frankie de Tory grabbing the... We've got Terry Henderson on the left there and his wife, Sue. He manages OTI Racing, and they've got a, a big group of owners here. They are predominantly in Australia, but more and more they've had horses over in Ireland with Joseph O'Brien, quite a lot, and here as well. They had um, Bauer and a few others with my dad. And uh, in fact, first two horses home, Australian owned. Uh, OTI with Docklands and Gay Waterhouse and Adrian Bott with New Endeavour, who they bought on Monday. And Harry and Hayley combined. She gets a kiss <laughs> from Docklands. They had Latin Lover win at the Royal Meeting last year. <laughs> And we'll follow Hayley because she'll come and weigh in right next to us in just a second. And there's Harry, his brother. I saw his brother in the paddock, actually. I'm sure we one of the first to shake his hand. Proud dad as well. And Hayley has just got a habit over the last few years of winning these races at the Royal Meeting. Awesome. To Matt. Oh, great scenes here. James Eustace, Harry's dad, just hugging Hayley. As well, because this is very much family, really. Harry, two wins at Royal Ascot, both win and but ridden by Hayley Turner. And what a performance this was. Yeah, both jockey and horse. Matt thought it was a very cool ride. We travelled really sweet. And uh, it's always nice when a plan comes together, but it takes a lot of work. It's everyone at home that's put in a huge amount of hours. And... Um, you know, we're just here to enjoy it, like, thankfully. When you came in there, I like to say, travelling like a travelly thing, which you certainly did on this occasion, was there just a moment you were thinking, will you find? To be honest, no. Right. Uh, he's always been pretty good, and I do think he'll stay further. So once he'd travelled that well in, I thought we'd gallop really well to the line. And uh, it was just whether the horse on the far side, I think he was quite a long way ahead coming to the, far, the final furlong, it's whether we could quite run him down. We usually use phrases like I'm about to use for John and Thady Gosden and Sir Michael Stout. Is, is this a group horse masquerading as a handicapper? Uh, I've no idea, Matt, but we'll go and decide that at the party afterwards. Yeah. James, how proud are you of your boy? Uh, very, very proud, and it's great. David's here from Australia, as you know, and it's just wonderful that we're all here, and it's fantastic. And, um, yeah, no, I mean, it's just great. And the horse is, could easily be a group horse masquerading as a handicap. <laughs> no, I don't, he, he's always thought a lot of him, yeah. and he's done it on completely different ground to last time, which, for me, says it all. I think yeah. he's pretty good. Yeah. Most importantly, um, Mum wore the lucky dress today, and uh, <laughs> so all credit's got to go to her. <laughs> always give credit to Mum. Well done. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Cheers. Right, Harry. Thank you, Matt. Quite rightly, a very proud dad. One thing I can guarantee is Haley will be here imminently before that. Ruby, what did you make of the Britannia? Uh, what did I make of the Britannia? I feel sorry for New Endeavour. I'd say David Egan must have thought he was going to win all the way up. He travels as well as Docklands. Now, Docklands gave Haley Turner plenty of, not hassle, but he wasn't straightforward, Ed, by any manner of means. You can see her in the middle of the shot in the OTI colours. Her hands are up off the horse's neck. Her body is getting more upright as this horse is tanking with her early, early in the race. But she has plenty of cover, but he's traveling like a dream, Docklands is. 
But David Egan must think the very same on New Endeavour. Now, obviously, Hayley Turner can't see David Egan, and David Egan won't be able to see Hayley Turner because they're on the opposite side of the tracks. But the two of them stick out like sore thumbs, how easy they're going compared to the horses around them in the races that they're in. Doc Hayley moves over to the outside to get to, to Stan's rail on Docklands. He's cantering. David Egan is trying to deliver his challenge at the right time. We can't get side on to them, but they race pretty much side by side all the way, and they end up at the line with a short head between them. They both travelled extremely well. They were just unlucky to run into each other, but a great result for Hayley Turner and unlucky for David Egan. Yeah, and it's amazing. Either side there, despite what Sheen Murphy said earlier today, <laughs> the fastest ground was up the middle. You have to feel for the horse in the yellow cap on the near side here in the Britannia. Right, the presentation on the way. We'll speak to Haley in a couple of minutes' time as well. And we've still got two live races to come. The finale, as always, will be on ITV4. One more to come on ITV1. And it's lovely to have your company on what is the most memorable of afternoons. result then of the Britannia Stakes. It was victory for Hayley Turner on board Docklands. But let's just remind ourselves of the final closing stages of this big handicap. But Seoul also in that far side group. Uh, we have better days are coming. So not too much between the two groups as they head down towards halfway in the Britannia. Finn's Charm in company with Skarnberg coming there. Fort Vega on the near side in company with Racing Brakes Rider, Metal Merchant, then Remazan. Uh, Mustajab comes next and then One Nation. Docklands making ground in that group with Dark 30 over on the far side. Forced it to mount Thunderball making ground in that far side group. His new endeavour quite smoothly. Better days are coming as well. Quantum Impact beginning to make ground. He is right up the centre. Thunderball new endeavour. The far side urban sprawl quantum impact coming over to the near side in company with bless who's also making ground as they now make their way inside the final furlong far side it's new endeavor who has the lead from thunderball then tempered soul urban sprawl and the far side appear to have it near side docklands is the one that leads here only the fight the final furlong docklands is making inroads now into new endeavor's lead over on the far side they're wide apart new endeavor docklands running fade and true at the line docklands may on the near side have run down new endeavor urban sprawl thunderball Ball and tempered soul with extra cross the line behind these quantum impact. Yeah, great victory then for Haley Turner, another Royal Ascot victory for her. The favourite Docklands getting the better of new endeavour. Now, alongside me, then leading broadcaster Nick Luck, because Nick, you had a bit of vested interest in this Britannia Stakes because it's a it's a special race for Ascot and um, for, for a number of charities. Tell me about that. Yeah, since the COVID year 2020, the Betting and Gaming Council, which brings together uh, all the leading bookmakers in the country, have made charitable donations donations in the form of the gross profits from the Britannia handicap and in just two or three years they've donated 5.5 million pounds to, to good causes normally there's one health charity one military charity an educational charity a charity of Ascot's choice uh, and one more and uh, I did as you say Ali have a vested interest because this year one of the charities is the Cystic Fibrosis Trust and my youngest daughter who's just turned five has cystic fibrosis and obviously we know firsthand uh, just what a, a debilitating and life limiting condition it is so this will make a huge huge difference it, it guaranteed 50,000 pounds to each charity it will make a massive difference to them. I was going to say, even with the favourite winning, they w they're still going to yeah. get a decent amount. That, yeah, guaranteed 50,000. And who knows? Yeah, the, the other horses were big prices. A new endeavour and the third and the fourth were 50 and 66 to one. So I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed that the, that the bookmakers have, have made a bit. I just want to reflect, Nick, of what a day it has been. I mean, the stories, what's going to be headlined tomorrow then? The King winning or Frankie de Tory winning the big race? Well, I think yeah, front pages will be the royal winner uh, and the continuity. And uh, as Zara Tyndall said to, to our colleagues on, on ITV, a bittersweet moment because how her, her late majesty, Queen Elizabeth, would have loved that moment. Desert Hero under a brilliant ride, full of guile and patience from Tom Marquand, getting the horse right up on the line and a homebred as well for the, for the royal studs. But, but great that in their first year as the... The, uh, as the moniker and the consort here, the king and queen should, should have a winner because in their Because the colours. queen always got an amazing reception here. Mm. She got cheered around the parade when she did the uh, royal procession. Such big boots for for King Charles to fill. But he, I feel like that winner, he got it was, it was a wonderful reception. Oh. It was packed around the parade ring. So hopefully good for, not just for him, but also for, for racing and his love of the horse sport. Well, absolutely. And it, it's been lovely this week. I mean, I, I know Ascot would, would welcome any winner and they will love the, the spread of winners we've had from a variety of different sets of connections and stables and lots of syndicates getting involved and the democratization of racing but if you ask them three things they like it's an international winner check 
with the, the win yesterday in the first race in the Queen Mary for, for George Weaver and John Velasquez. Yeah, they wanted Frankie de Tori to go out on a high. He's won the Gold Cup. And then, of course, a royal winner to top it all off. Certainly. The drama, though, continues. Let's rejoin our ITV colleagues. Golden hours at various meetings. Sport, eh? I don't know what to call this one, a glorious Gold Cup down. I mean, everything has happened you could wish for. King's winner and obviously Frankie winning the Gold Cup and now Hayley in disbelief. Not that one, Hayley, you can't have that one, that's for Harry and the owners. And it's become a bit of a tradition really with Hayley having a winner on the card and then coming over to be greeted by us lot. Here we go again. Better not drop it. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, Hayley, when you won here last time, you won by too far. What were you doing? <laughs> I was making sure he was going to get in today. <laughs> I think Harry was half thinking of claiming off him. He went up that much weight. So, oh, I just can't Do you realise that we felt today being special? Because everyone watching at home and watching around the world, Michelle Payne was brilliant, what she said earlier, how this is going to resonate, resonate around the world with the king winning, Frankie winning. <laughs> now, yeah. we've been calling you the queen of the sport I winning. Do. Someday, what, hey? Yeah. What's, your, what's your strike rate like here? Because I don't know imagine you have a huge amount of rides right and you've had what four winners in the last five years from how many I think rides? it's about um, 2019 rides but it was it was actually someone put it on um, Twitter that I was actually a better strike rate than any of the other jockeys so I've retweeted yeah. it shared it <laughs> it might not last long but I'm embracing it yeah. I literally can't believe it I mean he gave me such a great ride though he made was it was a bit keen easy. early Ruby was looking at the race early on he just I thought it was too yeah, he did, but it's, I mean, he's still quite lightly raced. Um, you know, it's only his, you know, a big field today. He's not, you know, last time it was, you know, all happened a little bit easy for him. So he's just still learning the ropes. And I, I wanted cover and I got him right in amongst them. And when there's horses all around them and they're not used to it, they sometimes get a little bit lit up. But it's another another thing he'll learn from and hopefully take another step forward for it. So. How many is that now? Towards a thousand? Oh, oh, I've yeah. got 18, 9, 17 now. 17. To go? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Should have done a Royal Ascot, really. I think that counts for about 10, oh, yeah. technically. I, know, I wish. <laughs> is, this, is this one you'll enjoy more than any of the others, do you think? You um, look like you've really appreciated this one and really been able to enjoy it. Yeah, I think it's I think it's like you say, being part of this day. I mean, it's been pretty cool, hasn't it? Like, And, and with Harry Eustace, because you teamed up to win last year with Latin Lover in the yeah. Palace of Holyrood House, his strike rate here must be great, too. Well, he's had three runners and two of them have won. Wow. So there yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah, and, the, and I rode for him yesterday, and it was just, you know, we quite fancied him, and he just finished last. But it's, racing just keeps you grounded that way, you know. It's uh, you have days like this, and then disappointments the next. So. Where are all the family? Oh, actually, my dad has just had a knee operation, so he'll be watching from the hospital oh. bed. So that's, that's for you, dad. dad. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, my sister was here yesterday. She she made her mark in the car park. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we wouldn't expect anything less of a turn, <laughs> exactly, would we? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, no, it's all quiet today. Um, but it was really nice because um, Docklands is so popular in the yard. Half the yard are here. And um, Gay Ann, who rides him out every day, and um, she even did his last bit of work on him, and I had to lead her. You know, it was like she's just done such a great job. And um, so, yeah, it's nice that they're all here. How emotional, the lad who's coming in. My God. Oh, that was lovely to see wasn't it? it meant so much yeah well he's been in Harry's yard since you know he was beginning to learn to ride and it's just nice to see how much has progressed and he works so hard you know he gets up every morning does his jobs and then he goes and polishes his boots like has shiny boots every day without fail and he's Love just that. yeah he's, he's brilliant right Hayley we've done one tradition you've jumped into the arms got to do the other you've got to come and kiss the camera now you only blew a kiss earlier okay. I might have to lift you up to do it though it's quite high up can you get there <laughs> congrats <laughs> right, is that what you thought? Well, you can do a link to Mark so, and Charlotte, do your other skill. Go out to Mark and Charlotte, here you go. Okay, we're out to Mark and Charlotte. <laughs> is that okay? We are here with the fabulous Fleur East, who's a trophy presenter today at Royal Ascot. How are you enjoying the day? Oh, it is amazing. Honestly, dressing up for this event has been probably my favourite thing to do. How long did it take you? What were we thinking? How long for the entire well, outfit? I kind of left it to chance, to be honest. Well done. I managed to find this fabulous hat design 
Carolina, a Won Golding, and LK Bennett. That is, oh, nice, nice. Made it happen. Look, can, I, can we take a look? Can we just take a look? Look at that. That is amazing. That's I have it. to admit, I actually got this outfit yesterday. No, you did I not. I really left it, yeah, so <laughs> close to the wire, I know. Talk about looking into the last minute. I don't know how I did this. That's awesome. <laughs> um, I've got to say as well, massive congratulations on takes two. Oh, it is thank so you. So yeah, good. I'm so happy because I was going to have huge FOMO watching Strictly this year, yeah. not being involved. So I'm really glad that now I get to be in the thick of it, see everything behind the scenes oh. and watch the show. I can't wait. Uh, and, I mean, I know from personal experience when you've been on Strictly, it's amazing. And then you're like, what do I do now with I the know. dancing? Have you kept up with the dancing? Mm, only a little bit. I mean, I had one of my headline shows in March and I got Vito up on stage with me. And we did a little, a little salsa dance together. So I think there'll always be a time where I could just whip out a little salsa move every now and then. We always yeah. need a salsa move, yeah, do you know what I mean? I've got to say, I mean, I, I'm going to let you into a little secret <laughs> on our way over because we're like, we're going to beat Floris. <laughs> I was, I was, I'm, I'm a bit of a fan. I've got to say, <laughs> we're playing some tunes. You do some banging tunes, I tell you. I'm wanting some more music as well. We're we going to get some more music, do you yeah, think? Yeah, I released at the start of this year, but I'm hoping before the end of the year, more music because yeah. I just love it. I love it so much. Oh, and I have to say, Mark has done one of your songs as a karaoke I'm number. So I mean, oh, really? I tried to do. I well, I tried to do sax. It's really difficult. Did you? <laughs> yeah. How did it go? No, oh, no, no, dreadfully. <laughs> Thankfully, Should everyone was too drunk. Should we not ask you to recreate it now? <laughs> no, no, that's a hard no. I'm just saying that. There we go. <laughs> but we are around the bandstand a little later on. Oh, Variety okay. V. So there's a big sort of, you know, we do the dancing, we do singing. We, we haven't do, really done we've dancing. We've not done dancing, no. Swing, but we were going to get some tips. What's, what's a good tip then for, for singing and dancing in public, do you think? I always just say wrong and strong <laughs> wrong. so if you ever feel like you're failing as long as you have conviction and you smile like you're believing it everyone will smile with you oh, I've That's made a career that. on that Look, we absolutely <laughs> love that great advice <laughs> Still got two more live racers to come here today at Royal Ascot. Race number six, the Group 3 Hampton Court Stakes for three-year-olds. A mile and a quarter, 16 of them. Here's the field. Number one is Brave Emperor Luke Morris looking for only a second Royal Ascot win of his career. Number two is Drum Roll. Ryan Moore has won this race four times. So too is trainer Aidan O'Brien. Number three is Bold Act for William Buick. He's won this race on a couple of occasions. Number four is Bolster, one of three runners in the colours of this particular owner, James Doyle, in the red cap. Number five is Canberra Legend, with both trainer James Ferguson and jockey Danny Musket looking for a first Royal Ascot win. The first colours of the owner is number six, Captain Winters. Neil Callan is the rider. This horse is a half-brother to no less than three previous Royal Ascot winners. Number seven is Dancing Magic. Jim Crowley is aboard. He's looking for his second win in this race. And number eight is Dear My Friend, one of two runners trained by Charlie Johnston in this lineup. Andrea Atzini has the call on this one. Frankie de Torre's ride is Epic Titus, number nine. Frankie has won this race on three occasions. Exo Planet is number 10 for David Egan. He rides here for Roger Varian. The second of the Charlie Johnston runners is Killebeg's Warrior, number 11. Richard Kingscott will be in the saddle. Oviedo is number 12, Callum Rodriguez, another jockey and trainer at Bethel, looking for a first Royal Ascot success. Another John Gosden and uh, Fabi Gosden runner here is Tony Montana, number 13, Kevin Stott in the Ammo Racing Purple. Second runner for American owner George Strawbridge in this race is number 14, Torito, ridden by top apprentice Benoit de la Sayette. Number 15 is Waypero and Tom Marcond. And the only filly, an intriguing runner and a big player, is Carnarvon, the mount of Connor Beasley. Well, Mark Carnarvon is around the 10 to 1 shot, the Oaks third, what, 19 races so far, four winning uh, favourites, River Tiber and Vauban, Gregory Estley for Frankie Dettori and Docklands for Harry Eustace and Hayley Turner. It's been a, a truly wonderful day. The bookmakers have Aidan O'Brien, a uh, drum roll, joint favourite at 7 to 2 with Torito, of course, who we saw live at ITV winning at uh, Epsom. Uh, Epic uh, Terrace is at 7 to 1 shot with Piro 15 to 2, Bold Act 10 to 1, also 10 to 1 Carnarvon and 11 to 1 Bar. Giant, in fact, a new favourite now as we speak. Torito, it's all changing at the Ascot Stock Exchange. 7 to 2 Torito, 4 to 1 drum roll. 
it's super hot here in the parade ring, but one thing I like to see with Mark Johnson's horses is when they have a rug on because they actually dip them in cold water. I know Mark Johnson did a load of research into um, wetting their rugs and putting it on the body and how it can keep their, their body cool for longer. And uh, it certainly works with his horses because they don't turn a hair. So that's why they've got the rugs on, keeping them nice and cool. They've been dipped in cold water. Let's see who's next. This is number 10. This is Exoplanet um, for Roger Varian. He's not the biggest in the parade ring. He's one of the smallest probably, but he's all there. He's nice and strong uh, through his body, his neck all the way through his shoulder and to his quarters. This is number 16, so Carnarvon. I wanted to have a look at her AD. I know her owners are super excited for her to run today. And to be honest with you, I think if she was um, if she was another gender, if she was a boy, I think she'd be favorite today because she's the highest rated and she comes here with some decent form. She's a typical looking filly against the boys. She's quite small and obviously uh, lighter framed and quite racy, but she hasn't turned her hair. Her red hood's doing the job. She's just, and she's coming here wanting to obviously get on with the job, but she's not doing anything naughty at all. Um, so I wish the team the very best of luck with her. Let's see if we've got any more behind us, AD. Number four, this is Bolster next, who um, is quite lightly raced. Obviously taking a big step up company-wise, but he's not a bad sort at all, is he? Quite tall, carries his head quite high. Uh, a lovely walk to his stride, which is uh, something I always look for. People say, why do you look for a nice walk? Well, the walk gate is a four-beat gate, and that is the exact same gate as a gallop. A gallop's a four-beat gate, but obviously they go at a quicker pace. A trot is a two-beat gallop, a uh, two-beat and then a canter is a three B. So one thing we always look at is a nice walk because it's the same gait as a gallop, just done at a, obviously um, a slower pace. Well, here is Team Carnarvon. They finished fourth in the 1,000 guineas. They finished third in the Betfred Oaks. Now Jack Shannon, surely. A lot of people are completely surprised, actually. You're not favoured for this race. Yeah, no, I suppose on form that she, she would have to be, you know, but, uh, you know, there's some progressive colts in the race, but, um, you know, if we turn up, they could already be very progressive to beat her. You were a very brave trainer, and I think it really showed your maturity already as a trainer not to go for the Diane in France. Yeah, no, we, you know, as a team, we didn't feel it was the right option, and this felt a bit, bit, uh, feel a bit felt a bit better for us, and um, hopefully we, we pay dividends today. It's a big moment for Connor Beasley. Let's just ask Paul, how nervous is the team right now? Well, Connor seems the most relaxed person of anybody to be honest I mean, he's so laid back he's you know he's got his instructions and hold on hold on I think we'll win it three pounds advantage against the boys why not take them on ready to rock ready to rock and roll good luck thank you oh, thank you <laughs> wish you all the best good thank luck you. Cheers. Cheers. They are the loveliest bunch of owners. They were standing behind us at Epsom when the filly came third in the Oaks, ran an absolute stormer behind uh, Soul Sister and saved the last dance. Broke the decibel be... meter just behind us. Yeah, exactly. And they couldn't be more excited. And uh, this filly, she's just proved to be exceedingly tough. However, Jason, you were just saying you don't particularly like horses coming from the Oaks Derby meeting to Royal Ascot because it's, what, 19, 20 days ago? Yeah, and they, they used to be uh, sort of the, the graveyard for horses that ran well in the Oaks and then they turned up here in the Ribblesdale or, you know, I, I suppose she is coming into a, a, a group three um, and, as Adele was saying, you know, she's top rated. I don't think she had an easy time in the Oaks. It'll be a testament to young Jack's training if he can back her up that quick after a, a, a tough tough assignment it's funny to look at because of the guineas i thought oh she's a bit light she's a bit wintry and at the oak she'd improved a bit but there's not a lot of her and like the owner said to me she's fit as a butcher's dog she's there's not a spare pick on her um in amongst a field of big strong colts as well let's get luke's assessment just see frankie there on epic tetris who is despite that red hood on is is walking on nice quite just compared to there's luke morris not a bad day at the office, sir. <laughs> Another half an hour. There he is, just walking around. Smashing looking little horse, actually. Here's William Buick just in front of us. He's just like, do you know what? He's so cool, William Buick. He, he just never looked at the way. He's just got his hand rested on his hip there. He's just, he's just so relaxed. And, I, and I'm sure that's the reason why lots of his horses are are relaxed themselves so horse it's amazing how much they their intuition when 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 a rider's tense and nervous it it transfers the horse <laughs> that's why that's why everything messes around with me but he's um he's got to have a great chance here bold act's been very very consistent not a bead and i mean not a bead of sweat on him when you look at some of the others 
uh, Canberra legend going past really quietly. There's a couple of these. It's just got a little bit cooler down here. There's a little bit more air about. So the, the horses, Neil Callan is just two. All right, Neil, good luck. Neil rides Captain Winters here. He's obviously had a, a very good week, particularly in those colors. There's a few of them that need rugs and there's Ryan Moore just coming past us on drum roll. He won two of his three starts. Oh, just nearly took up Mitch, the stall handler. But uh, no, they're all they're remarkably, remarkably calm down here. It's four to one each of two down here. I'll let you speak. You can get nine to two about Torito if you shop around. Epic Tennis, six to one. Rapiro, 15 to two. Carnarvon, 17 to two. Bold Act, nine to one and 10 to one. It's 11 and 12 to one bar, but it's a pretty quiet betting market. Drum roll, slightly shading it, but uh, four to one, nine to two to nine to two Torito. And there are some smart pedigrees in here. Drumroll himself is a brother to Saxon Warrior. He's by Deep Impact out of Maybe. He brings some good form in here. Second to Paddington in the Tet Truck, the listed race. And then he was awarded a Group 3 last time out following some interference. And then we've got Captain Winters, the horse that we just saw in shot with Neil Callan on board. He's a half-brother to Triple Time, who won the Queen Anne, the opening race of the meeting for the same trainer-jockey combination. He's got two wins from seven starts, and he won a three-runner listed race at Sandown. So, arguably, drum roll's form is the better of the two. Yeah, you, you'd probably argue that. Um, I was really taken with the way that Torito managed to win on Derby Day. Um, you know, he, he did us a favour there. He's climbed a good chunk in the ratings. I think he's worthy of taking an opportunity in a up in Group 3 company now. And um, it's a real big opportunity. We've talked about a lot of different jockeys and trainers throughout the afternoon and owners. What about young Benoit de la Saya? Big opportunity. Royal Ascot, we've seen how good he can be at the Lincoln meeting and um, he's, a, he's a vital cog going forward in the John and Thady Gosden team. Yeah, they've also got a big tutus here. I think that's how I meant to say it. It was a winner of the Derby trial at Epsom, but it's funny isn't it how the form ends up working out because you think, oh, Derby trial winner. That one's never actually the best trial, is it? But then he was fifth in the Dante and fifth in the French Derby so he's a little bit exposed now. Yeah, he is. Um, however, we will always look back at that little piece of form in the back end behind August Rodin. And Canberra legend showed a lot of promise that new market let's see what we can do here Thanks very much indeed Francesca this is dear my friend and Andrea Atzini going into stall number four one of the two runners in this race trained by Charlie Johnston the red cap of bolster for the Crisfords and it will be the other Charlie Johnston runner Killybegs Warrior who moves forward into one of the outside stalls it is stall 14 to complete the line that's it, they're in the gate, and they're off in the Group 3 Hampton Court Stakes. Three-year-olds racing over a mile and a quarter, and plenty of them want to go forward on the dash down the hill. Towards the inside, Brave Emperor is right up there, being taken on by Bolster in the very early stages. Out quite wide is Oviedo, who's going to be tracked three, four wide as they go into that turn, but it is Brave Emperor against the inside rail who's got the lead to Oviedo, racing in second. Bolster is taking the turn, racing in third. Frank de Torre as Epictetus in a very close fourth, right on the inside rail. Next is Canberra Legend, who's racing between rivals, and Keane racing in fifth place, with Tony Montana on the inside out wide. After these is Captain Winters, who's trying to make ground, but he is three deep to try and do so. Next in the field, as they begin to make the climb up the hill, is Dear My Friend, who races on the inside of Drum Roll, and as they go through the halfway point towards the rear of the field is Kanafa, who at the moment has only got a couple behind one of those who's also towards the rear of the field is Killybegs Warrior who is just about the overall back marker and now they're racing on inside the final half mile and the leading duo have got a bit of a break on the field the leader is Brave Warrior he leads by three parts of a length to Oviedo who race in, in second place two and a half lengths back to Bolster who is in third around the outside Captain Winters continues to improve with Epictetus against the inside rail Canberra Legend is making the turn next but being ridden along then Tony Montana who races towards the inside. Next is Drum Roll followed by Torito, another one who has to spin wide and he has on his inside Exoplanet as they fan out now inside the final quarter of a mile and it's Oviedo who has now taken the lead. Bolster is giving chase in second. Epic Titus has every chance as Oviedo drifts into the centre of the court. He hampered Bolster down the outside. Now Exoplanet with every chance together with Wade Pirro. Wade Pirro has now taken the lead for Tom Marcon and Way Piro has gone clear by a couple of lengths. It's going to be a double for Tom Marcon and Way Piro has taken the Hampton Court in second.
meaningless exoplanet and there's a bunch involved for the miners staying on was Canarfon also drum roll was there Canberra legend was involved so to bold act who came from a long long way back and also Torito but no doubt about the winner way Piro has won what a day for Tom Marcon in second is exoplanet might just be bold act in the Godolphin blue who has got third but that's very tight with on the near side Torito involved together with on the far side Canberra legend drum roll and also the Philly Carnarfon what a day for Tom Marcond his fifth winner at Royal Ascot more significantly a huge double on the day we started winning for the King. We'll try and get Tom with us maybe for the Royal Procession tomorrow. A day to remember for him, a day to remember for the Walker team with Waipiro. Sixth in the derby, Francesca. King of Steel team will be delighted with that ahead of tomorrow's performance. Emphatic winner here. Yeah, he's had quite an interesting journey, hasn't he? Do you remember in Newmarket, he was meant to run in one of the earlier races in the season. Tom Marquand got kicked going down to the start quite badly on his uh, elbows. He couldn't run there. Ended up going to Lingfield for the trial, ran second. Uh, in good style. Derby, I think he was slow away from the stalls, settled in quite a bad position and he ran on all right. I think Ed's always had quite a lot of confidence in this horse, so it's brilliant to see him rewarded with a nice one here. And the work that's gone into him as well. I remember him going for a schooling session at Newbury, i.e. to walk him around the paddock with his hood on. There was a concertina moment oh. just there where we had one that took a... Bobby Ada who's done yeah. a huge favour. Yeah, he, he zipped across left-handed, didn't he? And Tom was able to just sort of navigate that and go back towards the inside big run from exoplanet that is the london gold cup form obviously ed of bertinelli that we saw earlier on and down the outside to Rito, nearer. never nearer there was a whole load of them in third fourth fifth sixth when they had carnarvon involved as well she ran on well from the back of the field and a, another winner on the day for tom mark what well, a day has been for tom mark one by Piero, still got a bit of energy in him, Tom. Uh, he actually was quicker than aware Just talk me through the race, first of all. Yeah, look, um, plan on being a lot closer. Uh, I just felt like in the, in the derby, I got caught too far back, but it, look, it was the way the race fell. And, um, genuinely, I got off and just thinking, he's a good horse and he just didn't stay. Um, it was as simple as that in my mind anyway, and I know it was with Ed too. And look, Ed retained faith in him. I offered to go and sit on him the other morning just to see how he was, and he said, no, don't worry, uh, I'll keep him fresh, thanks. <laughs> um, so, uh, fair play. And, and but a huge buzz to ride in it. Royal Ascot winner for Ed, because, you know, as much as I love riding for him as a trainer, you know, he's been great, and, you know, I go in for a coffee and a chat and just see how he is, and he scopes me that too. And, um, yeah, look, he's been a great mate. And, um, yeah, look, just delighted to repay him with, with a Royal Ascot winner on, on such an important occasion. Well, tell me about the day and how you would sum up your day here today, Tom. Let's <laughs> say magical. Pretty magical. Well done. Well done. I just wanted to have a word with Papa Ram, even though this horse is really making me test my fitness, because I loved your reaction when he came home. You were so happy. Describe yeah, what it was like for you. Happy, very happy. Yes, he's a long time, so he's waiting for a winner, you know. So it's very, very happy. Thank you. Well, many congratulations. Well done. Thank you very much. Well done, Tom. And Fred Walker, a second Royal winner. In 2018, he won the Sandringham. Remember, Agritera bolting up uh, that day. 151 to one double for Tom Marquand, who will be was, pinching himself later. It wasn't why Piero's fault that he got kicked on the way to post, no. but he'll feel that he owed him that one. <laughs> he'll feel that he owed him what, that one. Tom? Yeah, Tom. he will. Tom, Tom will feel that why Piero owed him that one. You know, they, they were cantering down to post. The horse bucked up in front of him, kicked him on the arm, and oh, he had a very, very, severe yeah, it was nasty. amount of stitches so he's done well to get back so quickly although he's back what three or four days later wasn't he Comes straight back in the saddle and for ed they had a, a close second yesterday with random harm this time i saw them after he was a bit gutted but brilliant to have the winner today yeah well done to ed and camilla still waiting on the third very tight for third for the official result we know the winner though why piero in the colors of uh, pk sue 
and the winner getting a well-deserved drink. It is hot. We, we always look, don't we, to say, is the derby form going to be strong? How is it going to work out? And lots of people will latch on to that. They'll be thinking, oh, King of Steel tomorrow, the good thing later on on the card. Maybe the derby isn't the graveyard coming here. The winner went off at 7-1. to one. Exoplanet confirmed in second. I think Bold Act was third. Exoplanet went off at 12 to 1. Bold Act at 9 to 1 confirmed in third. I mean, the whole line of them, isn't it? <laughs> Not just one or two for third, the whole line of them yeah, in behind Exoplanet. Exoplanet. He's always threatened to be a very, very good horse, him, and uh, he's, got a, he's got a big day in him, that is for sure, Exoplanet. Very talented. And Carnarvon, she was there, thereabouts? She was thereabouts, I want to say fourth or fifth, I think, but they did finish in a bit of a bunch. It was unlucky, wasn't it, with Oviedo taking that left uh, hand duck, even, and inconveniencing one, actually two of the Sheikh Mohammed Obeyed runners, including Exoplanet, who, who ran on well down the outside. But that's that's racing, unfortunately. London Gold Cup yet again. Exoplanet, Desert Hero, Bertinelli run well. That is the race to watch ahead of any royal meeting. In a few minutes time, we'll be welcoming ITV4 viewers. If you want the final race in the bandstand, fun and games, ITV4 is where you will need to go in a few minutes time. And then tomorrow morning, day four. Day four is a ripper. An absolute ripper uh, with the coronation stakes and the big smash up in the commonwealth cup little big bear against sakir and others shaquille too for the camachos begin your day with the opening show nine o'clock itv4 for an hour in the morning and then we'll be on air on itv1 from 1 30 once again there's ed walker on the left well done to him as we get a map yeah, this will be magical for Ed Walker, a second Royal Ascot success. Tom Marquand on fire. And Ed, congratulations. Number two at Royal Ascot Agriterra a few years ago, and you've got a proper horse on your hands here. It feels like a long time ago since she won here, but um, I've had a few crossbar moments, and uh, yeah, great to hit the back of the net with him. So he, he is a proper horse. Uh, and it takes one to come back from the derby and do that. Yeah. And it's fascinating because he looked really good against Military Order. Military Order, of course, ended up finishing last in the derby, and you're wondering about the form. But clearly this horse stays well a mile and a quarter. Do you think this is really his trip? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, I think he probably will stay a mile and a half in time, possibly as he strengthens. Um, he's still quite an unfurnished horse. Um, I think, you know, he's going to get better, which is exciting. Um, but I think at the moment, Tan is perfect. I wasn't convinced he got home at Lingfield. And I was certain he didn't get home at, at Epsom. So um, this was the perfect race. Can, can you start thinking again about, I mean, you've run in the derby. It's group one. It doesn't get any bigger than that. Can you start thinking about eclipses and things like that for this chap? I think definitely not eclipses. I think he needs more time. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll speak to Alistair Donald and, and the Sioux family and, and see what they want to do. But, you know, I think we have to aim big with him. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a very, very talented horse. He's done very little wrong in his career. And, um, and he was impressive today. So, yeah, we have to, have to aim high. Well, I know your dad passed away not long after English King ran in the derby for you. And I'm sure he's watching down right now. A very, very proud dad. Well done. No doubt, Matt. Thanks. So the winner was dominant, Waipiru, but I wonder if there are a few hard luck stories in behind, a bit of a bunch finish. Ruby, how did you say it? I didn't think there was too many, Francesca. We looked back a few times, actually, and we couldn't find anything that was unlucky. If anything, the interference that Oviedo caused opened the race up for everybody. But Tom Marquand said he wanted to be closer, but watch Waipiru out of the salts. Jumps left and jumps into Bolster, which leaves him right at the very back. Now, he does get into a nice position. He's able to ride up behind Ryan Moore in the navy colours on drum roll, and he gets in with loads of cover then but look he said he wanted to be handier but if you don't come out the stalls it's very hard to get handy now Andrea Azzini gets a fright here on the bottom bend on Dear My Friend as they're round in the bend he goes to change legs and as he changes legs he rolls to the rail but the horse doesn't want to touch the rail and he nearly trips himself up trying not to touch the rail so Andrea's heart, Andrea's heart skipped the beat Not the easiest at the beginning of the race, but he showed his talent at the end, reaffirming the confidence that Ed's felt in him. Waipiro was a good run in second at 12 to 1. Bold act uh, for Charlie Appleby and Morbjörk at 9 to 1. And Torito, the favourite, finished in the fourth. Now it is a Gold Cup day, one previous Gold Cup winner is Papineau, who's enjoying life in retirement. And recently he paid a visit to the East Anglian Children's Hospice.
East Anglian Children's Hospices, we provide support to families and care for life-threatened children across Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex and Cambridgeshire. The support we offer is a family-centred, needs-led approach to care, ensuring all the needs of our children are fully met, whether it's psychological, physical, emotional, social or spiritual. This visit means so much to our children, at their families and our staff, and we are so grateful to Godolphin for their continued support of our charity. And actually, getting Papi Papineau along to the hospice here today to meet our children and our families during Children's Hospice Week has really enabled us to highlight this event in our calendar. Today we brought Papineau to East Anglia's Children's Hospice in Norwich to meet the children that are supported by this wonderful charity. In 2004 he won the Ascot Gold Cup for Godolphin, ridden by Frankie Dottori, who by coincidence is also an ambassador for East Anglia's Children's Hospice. Papineau goes on to win it for Frankie Dottori and Godolphin. When he retired from racing, Papineau joined Godolphin's rehoming. This forms part of the charitable programme created by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed to share his passion for horses and education. Papineau now lives at Wood Ditton Stud, where he's become an ambassador for the rehoming programme. He is such a special person, and to be able to bring joy to so many people is a wonderful way to demonstrate the versatility of the thoroughbred. Today, with Godolphin coming, has been absolutely amazing watching children's faces, as you'll see and um, being able to explore and be so close to such an amazing animal is, um, has been wonderful to watch. Every family faces quite a challenge. So to have these photos, the videos, just the holding on to the memories and including the whole family, siblings, grandparents, it's just amazing to have it today. That was really lovely and um, part of what's been a great day here at Ascot. Oh, it's been amazing. That last hour, that was honeysuckle constitution. It was Frodon, it was Paisley Park. It was magic. That's what races are about. You cannot write these scripts. No other sport kind of brings us that joy. And for all different reasons, well, with obviously Frankie retiring, social media has gone crazy. I mean, Twitter's blown up. That last hour has been well, it's phenomenal, isn't it? That's why we love the sport so much. Uh, well said. And you've been watching uh, in all sorts of places throughout the course of the day. This is a lovely video actually sent in from the Injured Jockeys Fund, actually, because uh, the Peter O'Sullivan House, the Rehabilitation Centre for Injured Jockeys, uh, they're having a watch along there for beneficiaries and ex-jockeys. Fish and chips now, <laughs> ice cream later, they tweeted into the social stable. Thanks for all your um, contact with us using the hashtag ITV Racing. What a day has been here at Royal Ascot. Thank you, chaps. What a lovely scene this is. Everyone talking about the day they have had as we swoop over that winner's podium where the King gave Royal Ascot Gold Cup trophy to Frankie de Tory once again. There's the famous tunnel where the winners come through. The Royal Procession tomorrow at two o'clock will sweep through there once more. Grandstand to the right and the, the really smart Royal Enclosure marquees, if you like, and restaurants are up the left there in amongst the trees where we began the day actually with that swoop through there as Francesca passed on the baton to Mark and Charlotte. <laughs> And ITV4 are about to join us, so I suggest you go to ITV4 pretty soonish if you want to join us for the rest of the day. It'd be interesting to see, as I said earlier, what the crowd number's going to be like today. Didn't feel like a big crowd at all yesterday. Hopefully more today on Gold Cup Day. And we still have the one live race to come, which is the Buckingham Palace Stakes. And then we will all head to the bandstand for a sing-song with Michelle Payne making her debut singing with us. Welcome to all the viewers joining us on ITV4, ITV4 all the way now, so if you're on ITV1 and you want more racing, come and join us there, and there is that bandstand where Michelle Payne, I imagine, has got a beautiful voice, we're looking forward to a sing-song Michelle again is like nothing else. Can I ask you about Hayley Turner, because we love her dearly on ITV, she's often a pundit with us, is she someone you've come across on your travels before? She is, I first met Hayley when I was about 20 years old, I was in Newmarket riding track work and she came up to me at a party and she said to me, without knowing me, you're a jockey. And I said, oh, yes, I am. She said, I can tell because you've got big muscly arms like me and we can't wear dresses. <laughs> <laughs> so we're trying to hide them, but thank you for that. <laughs> she is strong, Hayley. And how much, we talked about Holly Doyle a couple of days ago, didn't we? How much of an inspiration do you sense Hayley has been over the years? Because I think we know her well enough to say she's been around for some time.
time? Oh, a huge inspiration. I've followed her career since that day. Um, we came through together. We were around the same age. I was with her in years after that, riding around England. She took me to the races, took me under her wing and followed her closely. And there's no doubt that she's definitely been an inspiration for Holly and all of the young girls coming through. There's no doubt. And what do you think, well, I was going to say, what's next for you in terms of like the riding, the training, the TV? Where, where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? Well, I'm training a small team at home. We had a really good week last week before I headed over here with four winners. So in the short term future, I'm really keen to pick up where we left off and head into our springtime, which is our obviously our main carnival and uh, do the best I can with them. I'm probably only going to race ride for one more year as a jockey. Um, so I want to make the most of that. We have a great team and can't wait to get home and to, to really get stuck into it. And you mentioned a movie earlier on. Who's playing Michelle Payne in the movie? Margot Robbie? Who, 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 do we know? Someone, someone with big muscles. <laughs> <laughs> well, funny you say that. There's already been a movie, and Teresa Palmer was uh, the actress who, who played me. Is that and, right? And uh, she did a remarkable job. Thank you so much for your company. Really enjoyed it. Are you ready for a sing-song later? Something, again, completely daft that we do in this country. Absolutely. I can't wait. I don't know whether you want to hear my voice too loudly, but um, you, I can't wait to be out there. and. You go for it. Exactly. There's not many lyrics. It's hey, dude. <laughs> there aren't too many can't words be worse than it. me. <laughs> <laughs> right, so if you're watching us on ITV1, you need to head to ITV4 for the Buckingham Palace Stakes. And then tomorrow's lineup looks like this. 9 o'clock in the morning for the opening show. And then Commonwealth Cup and other big races. Is tomorrow, Coronation Stakes Day from 1.30 on ITV1. If you're leaving us on ITV1, if you haven't enjoyed today's racing, you never will. See you on ITV4. So it's ITV4 all the way. It's lovely to have your company. And Mark Johnson, you've seen many good racing days. Where does this one rate? Oh, it's right up there. I mean, it's just it, it, all the stories. That's, you asked the question a little earlier on, what is the headline today? It'll definitely have the word king in it. Will it be kings plural? I don't know, but it really has been a right royal day at Royal Ascot. And the difficult minefield of another huge handicap still hangs over us. The Buckingham Palace Stakes, it's 17th running, and this really is a minefield. Seven furlongs, 1,400 metres for the and they are headed by Gorak, the mount of James MacDonald. Two, Witch Hunter Jamie Spencer. Three, Rhythm Master PJ MacDonald. Four is Vafortino and Benoit de la Sayette. Five is Kingdom Come and Kieran Schumacher. Number six is Montasib. Can Tom Marcond win again? Montasib may have been a bit unlucky in this race last year when only fifth. Seven is Totally Charming, Billy Lochnane. Eight is Pedro and Jason Watson. Number nine is Accidental Agent. Now, if he wins, that really will cap a brilliant day. He was the winner of the Group 1 Queen Anne here in 2018. And he's having his sixth run at Royal Ascot. He has been a standard bearer for the Eve Johnson Horton Yard. He's 33 to 1 today. Number 10 is Warrior Brave. There's never been an Irish winner of this race. Billy Lee rides. Number 11 is Spirit of Light James Doyle. 12, Documenting. Another horse who runs in this race just about every year. William Powell is aboard. 13, Silent Film Kieran Fallon. 14, Biggles and Ryan Moore. He's a front runner. Number 15 is Croupier and William Buick. 16 is Toy Me Son and Asheen Murphy. Number 17, Frankie de Tour in the Godolphin Blue for Unforgotten as Frankie bids for win number 80 at Royal Ascot. Number 18 is Leah Special and Ray Dawson. 19 19 is Baradar, Kevin Stock. 20 is Percy's Lad and Richard Kingsett. 21, Northern Express, Paul Moore Renan. 22 is Great Max and David Egan. 23 is Ropey Guest, runner-up in this race last year, Tom Creeley rides. 24 is Spangled Mac and Danny Musket. Number 25, Tylos and Holly Doyle. And there's more. 26, The Gatekeeper, Andrea Cini. 27, Spanish star, David Provert. 28 is Ross Collin, third in this race last year. And that's Danny Tudout's mind. And number 29 is Red Darner, ridden by Neil Callan, who owns the record for the number of wins by a jockey in this race. He's won this minefield of a handicap no less than three occasions. He's on a 66 to 1 chance today. 
And this is the bandstand where Ed and Jason and Cole will be singing in about 15 minutes time. People enjoying the evening sunshine here at Royal Ascot. Ladies relaxing, having a wonderful time. It's been a, a royal day at Royal Ascot. A, key, a winner for the King and Queen. Frankie the Tory winning the Ascot Gold Cup for the ninth time on Courage Mon Ami. John Hughes here betting on the finale on day three of the Buckingham Palace. Biggles, six to one for that man that can't be stopped, Ryan Moore. Seven to one, Montesib, the pilot, is in red hot form and so too is the trainer, Tom Marquand, already with 150 to one double. Croupier, seven to one. Vaffertino, 10 to one. Unforgotten, 10 to one. Kingdom Come, 11 to one. Ross Collin is 11 to one. But it's been a famous day. The Croupier says, no more bets. Kingdom Come, unforgotten. But Biggles is currently your favourite at six to one. So this is an absolutely fantastic story. Gorak getting in this race. James McDonald, the Kiwi rides. Jason Richardson is a top presenter down under. Oh, scary. Jason, before we get to how you got this horse in the race, J James, just come in a sec. Come on, yeah, world's number one rider and all. Shy, Tell us why you picked James McDonald for a start <laughs> and jocked off a horse, a, a jockey who'd been brilliant on Gorak. Well, because he's the number one rider in the world and also all of our owners, 39 owners from Australia, we love him. He's one of our heroes, so. There's a bit more to that, though, isn't there? Wasn't he quite closely associated with you at various points in your life? Well, he just got married and he was desperate for an MC. He said, you're unavailable, so he asked me. <laughs> I mean, you two are close, I aren't you? can't beat that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Have you ever had a bad interview with him down under? No, nah, never. No. He's the best. Always been kind? Yeah, very good. Hold on, he's the, he's the best? Yeah. Se second best. Second now. best. Thanks, James. <laughs> OK, next point, and we'll bring in Charlie Fellows, the trainer here, because this horse had to get to a certain rating to get in this race, Charlie. Um, most trainers want their horses to go down in the handicap. You wanted to go up, but you overdid it, I, nearly. I did overcook the pudding somewhat. So explain to our viewers who don't know. Well, he, he, we wanted, he was rated 86, wasn't he? 86, so he was a long way off getting into the race. So I said, Richard was like, surely we can get him into Royal Ascot. Like, the only way we're going to do that is by getting, running, doing something stupid and running him in a group race. So I thought, found the race up at Haydock. I thought, I'm going to be a genius here. He'll run fifth or sixth, beaten six or seven lengths. We'll go up to 96. We'll go to the Buckingham Palace. We'll run a big race. Fantastic. He got beaten two lengths, <laughs> finished fourth, and I had to beg the handicapper not to put him too much so that we could still stay in the race because the ceiling's 105. Finally, Jason, is it fair to say that really whatever happens after this now is a Brucey bonus? Oh, absolutely. I mean, for us, um, 39 Australians, and we've, at the moment we've got a big group of owners in Melbourne and in Sydney. It's lock in, it's three o'clock in the morning, and they, they love being associated with Charlie and Katie's been magnificent. We're having a lot of fun, and it's Royal Ascot, and this is simply the pinnacle. We wish the Australians all the best. They've come up with the excuses though, haven't they? They've got a British trainer and a New Zealand jockey to blame <laughs> after defeat. <laughs> Good luck to them in our finale, which Mark Johnson, I think, summed up perfectly. It has been a right royal day. break then from the racing action I've come to the bandstand lawn because in a little over an hour's time this place will be absolutely packed because one of the many traditions of Royal Ascot is the sing song which takes place around the bandstand at the end of each day the the band from the household cavalry will be up on the bandstand a little bit later blasting out some absolute classic tunes everyone has their song sheet and they have their union flags and the atmosphere here is quite unique it is an amazing way to end your Royal Ascot experience but at the moment everyone is taking a little bit of a refreshment taking shade from the scorching sun let's go have a quick chat to some of the race goers here madam come and talk to me because um you 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 look beautiful thank you so much thank you so much it's such a such a fun lovely day out i've had such a wonderful day here today thank you for commenting on my outfit so i had the privilege of meeting the designer of my hat today a1 golding is here and uh, i heard that she was here she designed this amazing hat which is
is called Pom Poms in Love. Um, so I met her today and we sort of shared a couple of photographs and, uh, and I celebrate the fact that I would love for her to uh, see that how much joy her hat's given lots of people. Because there's big race meetings around the world and people do get dressed up, but there is nothing like Ascot in terms of the millinery. You can really go for it, can't you? Oh my gosh, absolutely. And you know, Ladies' Day is the day to be here for the millinery. And also it's a celebration of everything beautiful. So you walk around and all the ladies are complimenting all the other ladies and they look so amazing. I've seen so many fantastic, wonderful hats. So if you're thinking of coming for a bit of culture, English culture, you should come to Ascot. It's a fabulous day out. Are you guys having a good time? Let's have a look. Well, you, you guys are sipping a few refreshments yeah. and who are you here with? We're having a bit of champagne. So this is my beautiful friend, Sarah, who's wearing the most a wonderful, wonderful hat. So we've got a very good friend who's taken a millinery course and she designed her hat. So Sarah, she's wearing Siobhan Agashi's hat, which is wonderful. Aren't you, Sarah? And Sarah, Sarah's come from New Zealand to come to Ascot. Oh, tell me. So obviously your first time here. My first time here, yes. And how, and how would you describe it to friends back home? Oh uh, my gosh, it's incredible. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity, I would say, to my friends back home. They should definitely do it for a, a day, especially Ladies' Day, because the fashion and just the energy here is absolutely beautiful. We've got plenty of viewers from New Zealand watching this. Uh, what, what's your big race meeting at home and how much can you dress up there? <laughs> the races in New Zealand, uh, they're, they're, not, they're not anything like this. They're completely different, I would say. Absolutely on a, in another level, basically. Now, we are on the bandstand Lovely. lawn. Are you guys, have you got your voices ready for a little bit later? Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. we love a sing-along. So one of the highlights of the day for Ascot races is actually the sing-along at the end of the day. So John Park, who will be leading the sing-along, is the most amazing person. And it's all about knees up Mother Brown, or, you know, uh, there's a long way to Tipperary. A lot of the old classic songs, everyone joins in, top of our voices, a splendid way to end a fantastic day. You guys have nailed the fashion stakes. I'm Thank sure you're going to nail the singing. Um, what about the horses? Have you backed any winners? Um, no, so sadly I've not been very successful with the winners. <laughs> uh, unfortunately no wins today. <laughs> what a day it's been with the King oh, and of course oh, with Frankie. Oh my gosh, we're so happy that the King's here. He's been fantastic and he was brilliant talking to everyone and really celebrating everything that Ascot's supposed to be. So thank you to the King and we love being at Ascot. Well enjoy your last few hours. Thank you very much for thank talking you. to me. The atmosphere here is buzzing and I'm sure it's going to continue for a good few hours. <laughs> Six down, one still to go. It's the Buckingham Palace Stakes. It's a handicap over seven furlongs and it's another big field contest. I think it's what, our 21st race of the week so far. We're well past halfway, but two cracking days still to come. All races coming your way on ITV. On they go, down to the start. That is Unforgotten, who I quite fancy here. He's won three of eight on the all weather and he brings an exciting looking profile in here. What does Luke make of them? There is Gorak. Poor old James McDonald's long trip from Australia hasn't really paid dividends yet. Uh, this horse would have a chance. So straight in front of us is number 29. That is Ross Collin, who... No, sorry, it's just Radana, sorry. Neil Ryan for Diane Sayer. Comes out of stall number two. He's had a fantastic week. Oh, there's a good old horse. They're right in the middle there. Number nine, Charlie on accidental agent, Charlie Bishop. He's a, he's a fantastic old boy. He really is, of course. A few years back, he won the Queen Anne. He always goes in last, because actually the following year after that, he, um, he ended up not coming out of the stalls. Just, there's number 20 just going through. That is 26 actually. Look, there's in the Midland Park colours. That one's going to have um, his earplugs removed. Um, the Johnson horse have been running really, really well. He looks a very laid back character. Here comes Ashin Murphy right in front of us on number 16. That's uh, Toymi's son who looks very calm. There one Spanish star very much on his toes, but it's just, it's, it's better conditions down there. It's a little bit of a breeze now and uh, these horses are settling nicely. 
Now last year it paid to be drawn low, and the year before high, and the year before that high. <laughs> Any thoughts? Oh, really? I'm, I'm, the, the, the race Haley one, they were right, well, first and There was side, nothing between them, was there? Yeah, nothing between them. It's funny that nobody has explored that centre part of the track, and we've got to go back all the way to the first race of the day, the Norfolk, where the horse ended up sort of coming down that path. I suppose that depends where the pace is, isn't it? Sure. Because if you get them spearheading from, you know, one from the high draw, one from a low draw, they like to try and get a little bit of cover in behind. Although seven furlongs, is it a fine line between cover and straight line? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want to be sort of, you know, dropping in um, too much and giving too much weight. It's that long sprint, that real awkward distance that every time, if you're trying to make the running over seven furlongs, something is always breathing down your neck. You never get that real opportunity to find that sort of middle rhythm of the race where you have a breather, fill them up, and then time to go again. But, um, you know, there are, there are plenty in here that are stepping back up in trip. I think that Ian Williams may well have played an absolute blinder with Spirit of Light, who comes from a high stall position, a bit of pace drawn around him, the gatekeeper, he can go forward. Um, you know, the, the, the few horses, Croupier, he won't be too far away, coming back down to seven for him. And he ran really well behind Bielsa. Bielsa's a good sprinter. Um, so going back up the extra 220 yards, he'll be lashing home. We've seen some of the younger trainers on the board today. Harry Eustace, Ed Walker. I think we can still call him younger. Uh, what about George Bowie? Because he's got three in the race here, two in the same ownership uh, of Adrian McAlpine, Spangled Mac and Totally Charming. And he's also got in the Amo Racing Colours Baradar. They've done a lot of winning between them, haven't they? Spangled, Spangled Mac, he, he went through the grades and probably found himself a little bit um, harshly treated if you like just climbed up Baradar's a, a, an interesting contender isn't he with Kevin Stott on board I think he's got quite a lot of natural ability if you like um, although he's not a not a young horse at all Brian can we send the punters home of the winner well Jessica the ladies down here are cheering to Frankie yes. 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 To Frankie John Hughes, unforgotten. Of course, Frankie's on unforgotten at 13 to 2. Now, co favourites with Biggles Ryan Moore, Montesip 7 to 1, Vafertino 9 to 1. Number 15 is a croupier. Number 15, William Buick and Simon Crisford croupier. They're saying no more bets. Unforgotten had a bit of a chance on paper, but you're not so sure. Well, he's got lots of ability. Um, I'm I'm not convinced about his attitude. I've seen him on a on a couple of occasions looking as if he's going to come through and and win the race, if you like, and then it just hasn't happened for him at all. You know, he's he's hung the latch. His head has gone up. He's gone left. He's gone right. So if he's going to win, I think Dittori will have to produce him as late as possible and running. I've seen him get there and then sort of down tools at Wolverhampton. Well, we've got a few still to go forward. Highlights tomorrow? Highlights tomorrow, okay. Um, I think that um, it's been a good day for Ammo Racing. One of the best looking fillies I think I've seen so far this season uh, was Persian Dreamer. And I know she got beat up at York. Yeah. Um, and they will put a bit of, I think they'll put four mils of water on the track overnight. And so she gets the best shot at slightly easier conditions tomorrow. And um, yeah, the uh, Persian and Dream is a big, big runner. And of course, we've got the Derby form represented it, haven't we, with King of Steel. Is it all about Tahira in, in the, the um, in the coronation? I have to say that Remarque, she didn't Late give her running. Late money coming for Frankie. Unforgotten. No great surprise there, the way the day has gone. Can Frankie finish a memorable day with a flourish? Eight to one now, unforgotten. 13 to two the field, wide open again Mark. It is indeed. Accidental Agent will be the last one to go in and ahead of him Northern Express. Northern Express and Paul Mulrennan going forward into gate 12. Accidental Agent running at this meeting for the sixth time goes into store number eight with Charles Bishop to complete the line for the Buckingham Palace Stakes over seven furlongs. They're in the gate and they're off. And it looked to be quite a level break, although Twammy's son was slightly hampered coming out of the starting stalls. And as they break away over on the far side, it is Great Max from stall number one, who shows the early speed and has claimed the early lead. Accidental Agent is at the moment just in that pack, but a little bit uh, off the pace. So it is in the very early stages, Great Max, who is taking them along with. Warrior Brave for Ireland, leading the second group. Leading the third group is Percy's lad. And the one who leads the fourth group towards the grandstand side 
is Rhythm Masters. So there are four groups spread right across the course and already they're coming down towards the halfway point. So it's great Max who leads Kingdom Come and Accidental Agent over on the far side. Leah Special is also over there. Leading then the next group is the Irish Raider Warrior Brave. He's giving a lead to Ropey Guest and then Montasib and after Montasib is Northern Express and then a little more towards the near side is Percy's Lad. He's racing alongside Tylos who has got every chance. Croupier has travelled well into the race. Ross Collin just in behind them. The group on the near side with Gorak in front are some way off the speed. So it's Percy's Lad and Croupier who just about have the overall advantage together with Great Max over on the far side. Montasib is still there. Northern Express another one who is picking up. So to his Spanish star. They're racing now down inside the final furlong and it's Croupier who has now taken the lead. Here comes Bo Pedro who is now throwing down challenge. Witch Hunter has come through to take the lead. Witch Hunter and Jamie Spencer awaiting ride by Spencer. It's a winning ride and Witch Hunter has taken the Buckingham Palace to Croupier, Northern Express, Bo Pedro. They were followed by Spangled Mac and uh, the rest who came over in their own time. It has been a very, very long wait for winner number 27 at the Royal Meeting for Jamie Spencer. He rode his last winner here in the Queen Alexandra of 2018. It's been a long wait, but he is the great waiting jockey. He's won on Witch Hunter. Croupier in second. Northern Express in third. Might just be Spangled Mac Thorpe. That's a photo with Spanish star. Then Bo Pedro, who came with a good run but didn't get there. Percy's lad was next. Talk about a long time between drinks. Jamie Spencer, one of the winning most jockeys at this meeting, but he's had to wait since 2018 to taste victory. Number 27. And Jamie Spencer won the title here in 2006. The brutal results keep on coming for the punters. This one at 50 to run. Right, Jason, where is he? The master there, right in the middle, out the back. Here he comes with a Spencer he has special. has an incredible knack. You know, there, there used to be a, a very, very famous American jockey called Eddie De La Husse. Um, used to ride on the Santa Anita circuit, and he was just so good from off the pace. And we talk about it. Lots of people talk about it, punters talk about it up and down the country, but there's a knack and Spencer has that ability to switch them off early. I was going to say the straight track at Ascot really suits his riding style because they tend to go quick, right? But from that last shot you got a really good idea of it. It was very much the case of his horse making up ground. It wasn't as if the front runners or there was a massive pace collapse in front. It was this horse really scything down the outside of the field in the closing stages. So yes, relaxing them early and delivering them late and timing it impeccably. I have to feel for Ed Ware, the owner of Croupier. He looked home and hosed at one point there with the red cap. He was second at 7-1. to one. Northern Express was third with Adele cheering her husband on at 16-1. to one. Then Spangled Mac, I'm pretty sure, was fourth at 25-1. to one. Witch Hunter at 50 to 1, Rishi. The pain continues for the punters, but that was a Spencer special. It was a terrific ride from Jamie. And Jamie, I couldn't quite see it all unfold on the big screen, but it appeared to be almost last to first for you. Yeah, um, look, I rode him to run well. He's, he's an outsider. Um, but he can run well on the all weather, and I often find horses that have been on the all weather can't perform here. I followed Frankie thinking I might finish fifth or sixth but then down to the two came back on the bridle and I thought oh I might run a bit better than that and then the foreign pull I thought oh, got a chance of winning and he yeah, came there in the end. Uh, Jamie this place must hold special memories for you you were of course a former champion here during one particular season your last winner came in 2018 how much does it mean to be back on the score sheet at Royal Ascot? Yeah look it's grand you know every time you get a winner here you're happy I started a week with a few bullets to fire on Mr. Gosden's filly yesterday. The ground was too dry. Light infantry ran well. Yeah, it's a hard place to win, but you got to ride every horse accordingly and go out, block, block what's happened a half an hour ago and go out positive again and see how, see how it works out. Well, it's the mark of an elite sportsman to do that. Well done, Jamie. And look, I'm saying, and of course, Tony Gorman here as well. Well done, guys. Tony. How much fun well, was that? We need it. It's been a long week, but it's here. Well, well done. Yeah. Enjoy the celebrations, pal. Yeah, we will. <laughs> okay.
50 to 1, Richard Hannon on the mark. When you've got Jamie Spencer riding for you on the straight course at Ascot, you've always got a chance, Richard. I think he's got a worse track rate than me, believe it or not. I'm delighted for, for William. You know, he, he rang me one day and said he'd like to buy a horse and go to Royal Ascot. We got here, 100 to 1. No chance, and he looked like he had no chance sitting last. And Jamie's giving him a lovely ride, and delighted for him. He's a lovely bloke, and his wife Claire. William, come in, William. He looks a bit Hello. like Dark well done. Magician. Hello. Richard Thank said you. he's got job done. You wanted a horse at Royal Ascot, and he gave you a no hoper in the that, betting, that and you've is, gone and won it. That is so emotional. That is just incredible. This is my wife Claire. So yeah, amazing. What would this mean to William? Oh, everything. Yeah, it's his dream, dream come true. Absolutely fantastic. You are a Royal Ascot winning I know, owner. I know, it's incredible. What a ride from Spencer. I know, unbelievable. You couldn't write the books, could you? It's been a bit, day a bit like that, hasn't and it? And this morning, what was it? 100 to 1 this morning? To be honest, most people didn't even know it was in the race. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't like it either? So. Well, I mean, it wasn't I like them all, but uh, it was hard to fancy on paper, wasn't it? It was, yeah, definitely. That was incredible. Oh, unbelievable. No, I can't believe it. It's just well, emotional. This is a witch we can all like. Well done. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well done. Thank you. An incredible result to round off what has been the most incredible day here at Royal Ascot. The last race goes the way of a 50 to 1 shot in the form of Witch Hunter under, under a masterful Jamie Spencer ride. It started off here at Royal Ascot with a 150 to 1 winner. It rounds off with a 50 to 1 winner. Witch Hunter wins, Croupier second, Northern Express third, Spangled Mac was fourth at 25 to 1, and fifth was Spanish Star at 28 to 1. Ruby Walsh is in the analysis hub for us. Jamie Spencer. Spencer Ruby is a master on the straight course here at Royal Ascot. He most certainly is, Ollie, but he had to be up more masterful on this fella because Witch Hunter, true, nearly true, his chance at the start. Stall 24, stall's open, he doesn't come out, everything else does. And eventually he decides to come out and follow them. Now he's a couple of lengths last, but that's the way Jamie rides. But they've gone so hard in front that they're starting to slow down and Jamie hasn't started to quicken. He waits till he gets down inside the two before he starts to quicken. There's the two marker and he says, go. The horses in front have all quickened and now he's running after horses that are slowing down. That's how he makes up the ground. He catches a good short hold here, but watch him. He puts his head down, Jamie, and this horse starts to drift to his right. Now by the time he gets over and bumps off Croupier, who bumps off the third horse, the right on top of the line. There's going going to be any change to the result but um, he does drift across and cause a bit of interference later on but let's see his head down going for everything yeah well we'll pick the bones out of day three here at Royal Ascot on the opening show tomorrow morning 9am ITV4 where we're building up to the Commonwealth Cup and the Coronation myself Meg Nichols Matt Chapman, Rishi Passat and Scott Hazelton over from America will be building up to all of the action on day four but it is going to be very hard to top what has been the most remarkable day's racing here at the Royal Meeting. Repositioned uh, to the bandstand and Tanya Stevenson, who we love dearly, she's often giving me information. She's written a lovely line about today to sum today up. She says, with a warm heart, we look upon this special Royal Ascot Thursday. By valiant force, we crowned a desert hero. Then Frankie went out on his last gold cup with the cheers. Courage, mon ami. It has been some day. The start with the Royal Procession didn't quite get a plan, if we're honest, Charlotte. But the King... Oh, listen, we'll gloss over that, Ed. I don't think anyone noticed, did they? The King having a winner today. What was it like being out and about with that historic moment? Oh, just so special. I mean, what a magical day. We always knew it was going to be a highlight. Being here, with Gold Cup Day, Ladies' Day. Already the colours were more vibrant. The hats were bigger. But for the King to get a winner, for Frankie de Tori to win as well, it was just one of those days, wasn't it? It really was, yeah, yeah. An incredible atmosphere all the crowd is cheering it's been absolutely wonderful loved every single minute out of it out there really have would it be fair to describe Ascot today as a, as a sea of, of color obviously on on what isn't Lady Day but it sort of is yeah yes it's yeah. color and smiles really it, it genuinely was I've never seen so much color would you agree I know it was yeah. just like an explosion I think everybody wanted to go for it today it was a big celebration we just saw the ante was up wasn't it when it came to the fashion it was glorious yeah. oh, what's the headline gonna be do you think Francesca I, I I actually think it'll be the king Frankie. In some, in some shape or form, it'll either be the king of racing, Frankie Dettori, or it'll be the king. Um, Do you think I, Frankie's the biggest story for... Well, I think if you were asking what's the picture, I think the picture for me would be the king and the queen presenting Frankie with his trophy after he won the Gold Cup. That was the bigger race. You've got a very well-known person in racing there, and then you've got the king 
king and the queen. Of course, them having their first winner is a massive story as well. But to have the combination of all of them together oh, would be the picture for me. Michelle, come come down a bit, come down a bit lower. <laughs> Your first experience of this absolute sleep. madness. What, what do you make of all of this? I can't believe it. It's unbelievable. <laughs> the first time I did this, we came on a my microphone used to go over the race course. They don't let me do that now. And I was so excited, I felt like Robbie Williams. I went, good evening, Royal Ascot. <laughs> the bloke down here said, hurry up, mate. We want the music, not you. <laughs> but it's a great scene, isn't it? And a great way to celebrate. And we just we think it's the best of British. Is that a good way to describe it, do you think? Oh, I think so. I, I was here to witness it two times before, and it's just remarkable. I'm so proud to be here again. What do you, make, of, what do you make of British telly? <laughs> so good. <laughs> <laughs> We're a bit mad, aren't we? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Is it like? The day at Royal Ascot a little bit different to the end of the day, say at Flemington, is a little bit more refined or not? Oh, I haven't seen anything <laughs> like this. I can't, wait. I can't wait to experience this, I tell you. <laughs> you mentioned about the, the pictures for tomorrow, you know, Frank, is it going to be the king or whatever. Um, I think it may well be Frankie kissing the queen and also about the winner. And yeah, Frankie was naughty, uh, not, not on the protocol. Uh, but uh, listen, Desert Hero coming through was something spectacular. And um, watching the king talk with Tom Marquand afterwards and discussing about the ding dong battle up the straight was absolutely key. And Bruff being there, Bruff said that he'd seen him ride as well. So he'd been on board the thoroughbred. He'd been in that situation. He'd galloped and been in competitive action. So understands what it meant. And the sort of ride that Tom did as well was great. And of course, for, for William and Maureen, they also understand what a great job they've done for the sport. Final word about the Gold Cup winner, the horse. As Francesco is at pains to say, that's some performance from a four-year-old. Oh, honestly, it certainly was. And do you know what? When you're looking at them in their pre-parade drink, because the stayers, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. So I actually didn't pick him out because physically I thought he still had a little bit more to find. So I think there could be even some more improvement in him. Well, Good day tomorrow. Quick word with Brian. Good day tomorrow. Commonwealth Cup. Coronation Stakes. You have bigger teams here as well. Little Brick Bear. You have Sakir. You have Come Aiden, Aiden O'Brien has a real good two-year-old filly as well. It's, a, it's been a fabulous day. A day from the heavens. It really has. Royal Ascot at its very best. I hope you've enjoyed it at home. Why don't you sing along with us and all the crowd here. It's over to the band and I believe Hey Jude. See you tomorrow. Take a sad song and make it better. Remember to let her into your heart. Then you can start to make it better. to end Royal Ascot. What a day it's been. It's goodbye from the ITV team and it's goodbye from me, Ali Vance. I hope you can join us tomorrow for more drama. It is day four of Royal Ascot coming up. What a day it has been on Gold Cup Day. Me are the writing fear.
Stallion, the bedroom tonic. Get a box today at gas stations island wide. Bring out the stallion in you. It's here, Jamaica's new Polymer Banknotes. Polymer Banknotes are produced from a thin, transparent, and flexible plastic film. Why the transition from paper to polymer? Polymer Banknotes stay cleaner, they're more difficult to counterfeit, and they last longer. Plus, special features on the notes, like those developed for the visually impaired, last for the entire lifespan of the notes. The introduction of polymer banknotes will increase the average circulation life of notes by at least 50%. As a result, orders for banknotes will be reduced, and Bank of Jamaica will realize savings. Look out for your new polymer banknotes! Porcelain tiles, ceramic tiles, windows, doors, and much more. We have it all. Saving, saving, saving. Home shop now. Big, Big time, time sale at Tools Hardware. So come visit us at 279 Spanish Town Road, 4 South Camp Road, 8 Red Hills Road, or online at toolsja.com. Tools. The Lion King of Welcome everyone to the gorgeous Warner Park in St. Kitts and Nevis for match number five in the women's Sky 6x60. It's the Trinbago Knight Riders taking on the Guyana Amazon Warriors. Well, this is how it's all gone so far. The Warriors, a uh, perfect competition. The Knight Riders on two, the Royals on two. Every point counts here. And if equal points and wins uh, are maintained across there, it will be the most sixes hit that will take the teams through. So it's a big hitting game. It's cricket's power game. Of course, all the stars on show. Anissa Mohammed with the thumbs up. That's the Kiwi International, Haley Jensen. And of course, the teenager, Geetika Kadali, who was the star of the show yesterday. Shamilia Connell, all smiles. Everyone excited to be here. Captain Fantastic, Stefani Taylor. And of course, uh, the Sri Lankan star, Jamari Atapatu. you lot great to see you we wish you were here but have no fear we're going to bring you all of the action it's going to be a great um, uh, matchup today between Guyana and Trinbago Knight Riders all to play for it's all very close let's join Darren Ganga who is with the captains Critical game, critical toss in bright sunshine here. I've got the captains, Deandra Dutton of the Trinbigo Knight Riders, Stefani Taylor of the Guyana Amazon Warriors, and Michael Ragunath, our match referee, is also here. Deandra with the coin. Heads was the call. Call is made. Heads it is. So we'll Stefani, you win the toss, why are you going to bat? I think the pitch looks good. Um, probably about what third game now. Um, I thought we'd been doing well um, batting, so yeah, put some runs on the board and I bat my bowlers to come and defend it. Deandra, had you won the toss, would you have bowled? No, I would have. I would have batted as well. Um, as it's um, third game pitch, you know, so I think scoreboard pressure is, is more is a lot important, but. I bat my players to get the job done. And it's a critical match for you, one win from three matches. This is your final match for you to really secure another win and press for a place in that playoff. Yeah, it is, but um, we're not under any pressure, so we're going to play positive and good cricket. Stefani, a clean slate for you, two from two. What's been crucial for you to show that type of consistency? 
think um, you know having batters performing at crucial time, um, and I think that's going to be key for us. And yeah, I think the bowl has been doing a really good job. And yeah, with you know the, the lineup of the TKR, um, I think you know we have to be on our you know best game today. Have you changed your team for today? Same team. All the very best to you. And finally, Kudali making history in the last game, getting a hat-trick. What are the key elements about her bowling that makes her so effective? Um, I think her pace is, is just right and she gets that extra bounce. So um, I guess um, the players are on the underestimate her a bit. So that, that's what made her very good. Have you changed your winning team? No, I haven't. Same All the best to you. Good luck Thank today. You. Well, the news from the middle. Guyana Amazon Warriors, they've won the toss and they will bat first. Thank you so much, Darren Ganga. Stacey Ann King, what do you make of these teams? Well, first of all, both teams unchanged. Ghana Amazon Warriors winning the toss and deciding to have a bat first. Again, they've done really well with Rashada Williams and Chamari Atapatu up at top. Stephanie Taylor has played a vital role for her team as well. Bowling wise, look out for Cherry and Fraser and Ayabonga Kaka. Trinbago Knight Riders Dutton came into that second game, that third game, sorry, and she was exceptional. Saw her team to a first victory in three games. But look out for Gitaki. Gitaki. Kodali, she was impressive with that three wickets, that hat trick, first hat trick of this tournament. Oh yeah, she was outstanding, wasn't she? But my question for you, Stacey Ann King, this afternoon really is about that big boundary to the western end. We just saw some of the guys struggle to get it to the boundary this afternoon. How are the women going to cope? I think it's it's going to be a challenge for them, and especially at this ten overs, just sixty balls, and if they are to unlock another power play over then you need to bring in those boundaries just a little bit because there are only about two or three players that can really clear that boundary which is like deandra dutton chloe tryon so it's gonna be difficult for them but an opportunity to, for them to just push into gaps and run as hard as they can to pick up runs um yeah you mentioned deandra dutton she's it's made a difference to her team her return this game is a rematch actually of the second match of the tournament from day one stefani taylor she did the damage that day Yes, she did. Uh, was really exceptional with her batting. Came in after losing a quick wicket and she scored an impressive 29 of just 18 balls. Again, showing her captaincy and leadership skill, Stephanie Taylor. And that's exactly what she will do once again. This guy on the Amazon Warriors team, they've looked really switched on. They've looked a compact unit. Let's have a look at her. Yeah, she is one of those classic players Stephanie Taylor scored that 29 as we mentioned of just 18 balls but again really really good from her and just to keep her team together really inspirational as well good to see her in the runs she is and she's such a veteran of the game but she looks in better nick than ever and seems really cool calm and control of herself yeah she actually does i think she looks much better right now as a player because she has struggled a bit previously but again this tournament just 60 balls playing and and really backing herself as well to play shots and get runs and then she has a good unit around her right okay well i mentioned to you that big boundary uh what do you make of the surface stacy i think it's a good surface this is the third game that's going to be played on the surface uh Ghana amazon warriors winning the toss and opting to have a bat first should be interesting to see how they go again that leg side dimensions again 67 meters to that right side it's gonna be a challenge for them as we mentioned earlier it just might mean that they have to push into that area and run a bit harder because sixes aren't gonna be easy for them Well, we've been talking about the batting, haven't we? But it was one of the youngest players in this tournament who humbled with the ball. She took the first track, the hat trick of this tournament, Gitika Kodali, the young American. <laughs> Sensational stuff from the U.S. player Gitika Kudali. I'm really happy that I went out there and got a hat trick. All three wickets were really big, and I'm glad that I could contribute to our team's success. All the three wickets that we got are really helped our team come up with the win at the end, and that I'm glad that I could go out there and perform for the team. Just sticking to our basics and working through the process really helped us. 
it's always good to have high energy on the field and come in and play to the best of our ability, play to our strengths, and I'm glad that it came off. It's been great both on and off the field for me. Uh, the TKR family, it's really welcoming. I got people like DMing me, telling me welcome to the family. It was great that all of us are considered one big TKR family, both the men's team and the women's team. And it feels like something that I'm really happy to be part of. I'm the under 19 USA cricket captain. I'm really happy for that opportunity to be able to lead. I feel like the experience that I got from playing on the senior women's team and playing in other franchise tournaments like Fair Break and the CPL, the 60, it's really going to help me, teach me a lot of things. I'm going to learn everything and be, I'm really glad that I can take it back to all of my teammates. Geetika Kadali, the teenage sensation, with the hat trick here at the 60 yesterday. She's so uh, in control of herself, seems quite mature for, uh, despite her years. What an opportunity for her on this stage. Yeah, good opportunity for her, as you mentioned, but would have liked to see that opportunity given to some of those young West Indies under 19 players who played against same Geetika Kudali in that inaugural tournament in the US. So good for her that she's picked up three and she's getting that experience. But as I mentioned, would have liked to see some of those West Indies under 19 players getting the same opportunity. Yeah, it's a fair point because as we know, you know, being a cricketer is a 360 degree uh, thing isn't it it's not just on the field it's learning to deal with media and all of the opportunities so maybe the next 60. Yeah, maybe. thank you so much Stacey and action live action of the women's game here after this don't move a muscle where the sky x60 it's cricket's power game in the summer heat old rivalries are rehashed new champions may emerge the 2023 Rugby America's North Men's Under-19 and Senior Women's 15s Tournament will be a fight for dominance. See the region's top teams match skills July 12 to 16 at the Urimona Bowl in Kingston, Jamaica. Watch live on your home of champions, Sportsmax 2, Sportsmax YouTube and the Sportsmax app. Come to the game for rugby action, prizes and surprises. Admission is free. Every swing. Every point. Every match is an opportunity to make history. No matter the location, the objective is the same. This is how champions are made. Deny the upset. Earn the win. Keep going. They will not quit. And neither will we. The WTA lives on your home of champions.